chapter eighteen of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter eighteen mr hammond are you ill what can be the matter edna threw down her books and put her hand on the old man's shoulder his face was concealed in his arms and his half stifled groan told that some fierce trial had overtaken him oh child i am troubled perplexed and my heart is heavy with a sorrow which i thought i had crushed he raised his head for a moment looked sadly into the girl's face and dropped his furrowed cheek on his hand has anything happened since i saw you yesterday yes i have been surprised by the arrival of some of my relatives whose presence in my house revives very painful associations connected with earlier years my niece mrs powell and her daughter gertrude came very unexpectedly last night to make me a visit of some length and to you my child i can frankly say the surprise is a painful one many years have elapsed since i received any tidings of agnes powell and i knew not until she suddenly appeared before me last night that she was a widow and bereft of a handsome fortune she claims a temporary home under my roof and though she has caused me much suffering i feel that i must endeavour to be patient and kind to her and her child i have endured many trials but this is one of the severest i have yet been called to pass through distressed by the look of anguish on his pale face edna took his hand between both hers and stroking it caressingly said my dear sir if it is your duty god will strengthen and sustain you cheer up i can't bear to see you looking so troubled a cloud on your face my dear mr hammond is to me like an eclipse of the sun pray do not keep me in shadow if i could know that no mischief would result from agnes's presence i would not regard it so earnestly i do not wish to be uncharitable or suspicious but i fear that her motives are not such as i could may i intrude uncle allen the stranger's voice was very sweet and winning and as she entered the room edna could scarcely repress an exclamation of admiration for the world sees but rarely such perfect beauty as was the portion of agnes powell she was one of those few women who seem the pets of time whose form and features catch some new grace and charm from every passing year and but for the tall lovely girl who clung to her hand and called her mother a stranger would have believed her only twenty-six or eight fair rosy with a complexion fresh as a child's and a face faultless in contour as that of a greek goddess it was impossible to resist the fascination which she exerted over all who looked upon her her waving yellow hair flashed in the morning sunshine and as she raised one hand to shade her large clear blue eyes her open sleeve fell back disclosing an arm dazzlingly white and exquisitely moulded as mr hammond introduced his pupil to his guests mrs powell smiled pleasantly and pressed the offered hand but the eyes blue and cold as the stalactites of capri scanned the orphan's countenance and when edna had seen fully into their depths she could not avoid recalling heine's poem of Lorely my daughter gertrude promises herself much pleasure in your society miss earl for uncle's praises prepare her to expect a most charming companion she is about your age but i fear you will find great disparity in her attainments as she has not been so fortunate as to receive her education from uncle allen you are i believe an adopted daughter of mrs murray no madam only a resident in her house until my education is pronounced sufficiently advanced to justify my teaching i have a friend miss harding who has recently removed to le bocage and intends making it her home how is she quite well i believe mr hammond left the study for a moment and mrs powell added 
her friends at the north tell me that she is to marry her cousin mr murray very soon i had not heard the report then you think there are no grounds for the rumour indeed madam i know nothing whatever concerning the matter estelle is handsome and brilliant edna made no reply and after waiting a few seconds mrs powell asked does mr murray go much into society now i believe not is he as handsome as ever i do not know when you saw him last but the ladies here seem rather to dread than admire him mrs powell you are dipping your sleeve in your uncle's inkstand she by no means relished this catechism and resolved to end it picking up her books she said to mr hammond who now stood in the door i presume i need not wait as you will be too much occupied to-day to attend to my lessons yes i must give you holiday until monday miss earle may i trouble you to hand this letter to miss harding it was entrusted to my care by one of her friends in new york pray be so good as to deliver it with my kindest regards as edna left the house the pastor took his hat from the rack in the hall and walked silently beside her until she reached the gate mr hammond your niece is the most beautiful woman i have ever seen he sighed heavily and answered hesitatingly yes yes she is more beautiful now than when she first grew up how long has she been a widow not quite a year the troubled expression settled once more over his placid face and when edna bade him good morning and had walked some distance she happened to look back and saw him still leaning on the little gate under the drooping honeysuckle tendrils with his grey head bent down on his hand that mrs powell was in some way connected with mr murray's estrangement from the minister edna felt sure and the curiosity which the inquiries of the former had betrayed told her that she must be guarded in her intercourse with a woman who was an object of distrust even to her own uncle very often she had been tempted to ask mr hammond why mr murray so sedulously shunned him but the shadow which fell upon his countenance whenever st elmo's name was accidentally mentioned made her shrink from alluding to the subject which she evidently avoided discussing before she had walked beyond the outskirts of the village mr lee joined her and she felt the colour rise in her cheeks as his fine eyes rested on her face and his hand pressed hers you must forgive me for telling you how bitterly i was disappointed in not seeing you two days ago why did you absent yourself from the table because i had no desire to meet mrs murray's guests and preferred to spend my time with mr hammond if he were not old enough to be your grandfather i believe i should be jealous of him edna do not be offended i am so anxious about you so pained at the change in your appearance last sunday as you sat in church i noticed how very pale and worn you looked and with what weariness you leaned your head upon your hand mrs murray says you are very well but i know better you are either sick in body or mind which is it neither mr lee i am quite well i assure you you are grieved about something which you are unwilling to confide to me edna it is keen pain that sometimes brings that quiver to your lips and if you would only tell me edna i know that i you conjure up a spectre i have nothing to confide and there is no trouble which you can relieve they walked on silently for a while and then gordon said i am going away day after to-morrow to be absent at least for several months and i have come to ask a favour which you are too generous to deny i want your ambrotype or photograph and i hope you will give it to me without hesitation i have never had a likeness of any kind taken there is a good artist here will you not go to-day and have one taken for me no mr lee oh edna why not because i do not wish you to think of remembering me the sooner you forget me entirely save as a mere friend the happier we both shall be but that is impossible if you withhold your picture it will do no good for i have your face here in my heart and you cannot take that image from me at least i will not encourage feelings which can bring only pain to me and disappointment to yourself i consider it unprincipled and contemptible in a woman to foster or promote in any degree an affection which she knows she can never reciprocate 
if i had fifty photographs i would not give you one my dear friend let the past be forgotten it saddens me whenever i think of it and is a barrier to all pleasant friendly intercourse good-bye mr lee you have my best wishes on your journey will you not allow me to see you home i think it is best i prefer that you should not mr lee promise me that you will struggle against this feeling which distresses me beyond expression she turned and put out her hand he shook his head mournfully and said as he left her god bless you it will be a dreary dreary season with me till i return and see your face again god preserve you till then walking rapidly homeward edna wondered why she could not return gordon lee's affection why his noble face never haunted her dreams instead of another's of which she dreaded to think looking rigorously into the past few weeks she felt that long before she was aware of the fact an image to which she refused homage must have stood between her heart and gordon's when she reached home she inquired for miss harding and was informed that she and mrs murray had gone visiting with mr alston had taken lunch and would not return until late in the afternoon hagar told her that mr murray had started at daylight to one of his plantations about twelve miles distant and would not be back in time for dinner and rejoiced at the prospect of a quiet day she determined to complete the chapter which she had left unfinished two nights previous needing a reference in the book which mr murray had taken from the library she went up to copy it and as she sat down and opened the volume to find the passage she required a letter slipped out and fell at her feet she glanced at the envelope as she picked it up and her heart bounded painfully as she saw mr murray's name written in mr manning's peculiar and unmistakable chirography the postmark and date corresponded exactly with the one that she had received the night mr murray gave her the roll of manuscript and the strongest temptation of her life here assailed her she would almost have given her right hand to know the contents of that letter and mr murray's confident assertion concerning the package was now fully explained he had recognized the handwriting on her letters and suspected her ambitious scheme he was not a stranger to mr manning and must have known the nature of their correspondence consequently his taunt about a lover was entirely ironical she turned the unsealed envelope over and over longing to know what it contained the house was deserted there was she knew no human being nearer than the kitchen and no eye but god's upon her she looked once more at the superscription of the letter sighed and put it back into the book without opening the envelope she copied into her notebook the reference she was seeking and replacing the volume on the window-sill where she had found it went back to her own room and tried to banish the subject of the letter from her mind after all it was not probable that mr murray had ever mentioned her name to his correspondent and as she had not alluded to le bocage or its inmates in writing to mr manning st elmo's hints concerning her manuscript were merely based on conjecture she felt as if she would rather face any other disaster sooner than have him scoffing at her daring project and more annoyed and puzzled than she chose to confess she resolutely bent her thoughts upon her work it was almost dusk before mrs murray and her guests returned and when it grew so dark that edna could not see the lines of her paper she smoothed her hair changed her dress and went down to the parlour mrs murray was resting in a corner of the sofa fanning herself vigorously and mr alston smoked on the veranda and talked to her through the open window well edna where have you been all day with my books i am tired almost to death this country visiting is an intolerable bore i am worn out with small talk and backbiting society nowadays is composed of cannibals infinitely more to be dreaded than the fijians who only devour the body and leave the character of an individual intact child let us have some music by way of variety play the symphony of beethoven that i heard you practising last week she laid her head on the arm of the sofa and shut her eyes and edna opened the piano and played the piece designated the delicacy of her touch enabled her to render it with peculiar pathos and power and she played on and on unmindful of miss harding's entrance oblivious of everything but the sublime strains of the great master the light streamed over her face and showed a gladness an exaltation of expression there as if her soul had broken from its earthly moorings and was making its way joyfully into the infancy of eternal love and blessedness at last her fingers fell from the keys and as she rose she saw mr murray standing outside of the parlour door with his fingers shading his eyes he came in soon after and his mother held out her hand saying here is the seat my son 
have you just returned no i have been here some time how are affairs at the plantation i really have no idea why i thought you went there to-day i started but found my horse so lame that i went no further than town indeed hagar told me you had not returned when i came in from visiting like some other people of my acquaintance hagar reckons without her host i have been at home ever since twelve o'clock and saw the carriage as you drove off and pray how have you employed yourself you incorrigible ignis fatuous oh my cousin you are well named on ellen must have had an intuitive insight into your character when she had you christened st elmo only she should have added the fire how have you spent the day sir most serenely and charmingly my fair cousin in the solitude of my den if my mother could give me satisfactory security that all my days would prove as quiet and happy as this has been i would enter into bonds never to quit the confines of le bocage again ah the indescribable relief of feeling that nothing was expected of me that the galling jives of hospitality and etiquette were snapped and that i was entirely free from all danger of intrusion this day shall be marked with a white stone for i entered my rooms at twelve o'clock and remained there in uninterrupted peace till five minutes ago when i put on my social shackles once more and hobbled down to entertain my fair guest edna was arranging some sheets of music that were scattered on the piano but as he mentioned the hour of his return she remembered that the clock struck one just as she went into the sitting-room where he kept his books and cabinets and she knew now that he was at that very time in the inner room beyond the arch she put her hand to her forehead and endeavoured to recollect the appearance of the apartment the silk curtains she was sure were hanging over the arch for she remembered distinctly having noticed a large and very beautiful golden butterfly which had fluttered in from the terrace and was flitting over the glowing folds that fell from the carved entrados to the marble floor but though screened from her view he must have heard and seen her as she sat before his bookcase turning his letter curiously between her fingers she dared not look up and bent down to examine the music so absorbed in her own emotions of chagrin and astonishment that she heard not one word of what miss harding was saying she felt well assured that if mr murray were cognizant of her visit to the egyptian museum he intended her to know it and she knew that his countenance would solve her painful doubt gathering up her courage she raised her eyes quickly in the direction of the sofa where he had thrown himself and met just what she most dreaded his keen gaze riveted on her face evidently he had been waiting for this eager startling questioning glance for instantly he smiled inclined his head slightly and arched his eyebrows as if much amused never before had she seen his face so bright and happy so free from bitterness if he had said yes i saw you are you not thoroughly discomfited and ashamed of your idle curiosity what interest can you possibly have in carefully studying the outside of my letters how do you propose to mend matters he could not have more fully conveyed his meaning edna's face crimsoned and she put up her hand to shield it but mr murray turned toward the window and coolly discussed the merits of a popular racehorse upon which clinton austin lavished extravagant praise estelle leaned against the window listening to the controversy and after a time when the subject seemed very effectually settled by an oath from the master of the house edna availed herself of the lull in the conversation to deliver the letter miss harding i was requested to hand you this estelle broke the seal glanced rapidly over the letter and exclaimed is it possible can she be here who gave you this letter mrs powell mr hammond's niece agnes powell yes agnes powell during the next three minutes one might have distinctly heard a pin fall for the ticking of two watches was very audible estelle glanced first at her cousin then at her aunt then back at her cousin mrs murray involuntarily laid her hand on her son's knee and watched his face with an expression of breathless anxiety and edna saw that though his lips blanched not a muscle moved not a nerve twitched and only the deadly hate that appeared to leap into his large shadowy eyes told that the name stirred some bitter memory the silence was growing intolerable and mr murray turned his gaze full on estelle and said in his usual sarcastic tone have you seen a ghost your letter must contain tidings of victor's untimely demise for if there is such a thing as retribution such a personage as nemesis i swear that poor devil of a count has crept into her garments and come to haunt you did he cut his white womanish throat with a penknife or smother himself with charcoal fumes or light a poison candle and let his poor homeopathic soul drift out dreamily into eternity if so gabriel will require a powerful microscope to find him 
notwithstanding the fact that you destined him for my cousin the little curly creature always impressed me as being a stray specimen of an otherwise extinct type of intellectual lacrimatoria is he really dead peace to his infusorial soul who had the courage to write and break the melancholy tidings to you or perhaps after all it is only the ghost of your own conscience that has brought that scared look into your face she laughed and shrugged her shoulders how insanely jealous you are of victor he is neither dead nor dreaming of suicide but enjoying himself vastly in baden-baden edna did mrs powell bring gertrude with her yes do you know how long she intends remaining at the parsonage i think her visit is of indefinite duration edna will you oblige me by inquiring whether henry intends to give us any supper to-night he forgets we have had no dinner st elmo do turn down that gas the wind makes it flare dreadfully edna left the room to obey mrs murray's command and did not return immediately but after the party seated themselves at the table she noticed that the master seemed in unusually high spirits and when the meal was concluded he challenged his cousins to a game of billiards they repaired to the rotunda and mrs murray beckoned to edna to follow her as they entered her apartment she carefully closed the door edna when did mrs powell arrive last night did you see her yes ma'am is she very pretty she is the most beautiful woman i ever met how did mr hammond receive her her visit evidently annoys him but he gave me no explanation of the matter which i confess puzzles me i should suppose her society would cheer and interest him oh pooh talk of what you understand she surely has not come here to live i think he fears she has she is very poor mrs murray set her teeth together and muttered something which her companion did not understand edna is she handsomer than estelle infinitely handsomer i think indeed they are so totally unlike it would be impossible to compare them your niece is very fine-looking very commanding mrs powell is beautiful but she is no longer young she has a grown daughter true but in looking at her you do not realize it did you never see her no and i trust i never may i am astonished that mr hammond can endure the sight of her you say he has told you nothing about her nothing which explains the chagrin her presence seems to cause he is very wise but edna avoid her society as much as possible she is doubtless very fascinating but i do not like what i have heard of her and prefer that you should have little conversation or intercourse with her on the whole you might as well stay at home now it is very warm and you can study without mr hammond's assistance you do not mean that my visits must cease altogether oh no go occasionally once or twice a week but certainly not every day as formerly and edna be careful not to mention that woman's name again i dislike her exceedingly the orphan longed to ask for an explanation but was too proud to solicit confidence so studiously withheld mrs murray leaned back in her large rocking chair and fell into a reverie edna waited patiently for some time and finally rose mrs murray have you anything more to say to me to-night you look very much fatigued nothing i believe good-night child send hagar to me edna went back to her desk and resolutely turned to her work for it was one of the peculiar traits of her character that she could at will fasten her thoughts upon whatever subject she desired to master all irrelevant ideas were sternly banished until such season as she chose to give them audience and to-night she tore her mind from the events of the day and diligently toiled among the fragments of scandinavian lore for the missing links in her mythologic chain now and then peals of laughter from the billiard-room startled her and more than once mr murray's clear cold voice rose above the subdued chatter of estelle and clinton after a while the game ended good-nights were exchanged the party dispersed doors were closed and all grew silent while edna rode on an unexpected sound arrested her pen she listened and heard the slow walk of a horse beneath her window as it passed she rose and looked out the moon was up and mr murray was riding down the avenue the girl returned to her manuscript and worked on without intermission for another hour then the last paragraph was carefully punctuated the long and difficult chapter was finished she laid aside her pen and locked her desk shaking down the mass of hair that had been tightly coiled at the back of her head she extinguished the light and drawing a chair to the window seated herself silence and peace brooded over the world not a sound broke the solemn repose of nature the summer breeze had rocked itself to rest in the elm boughs and only the waning moon seemed alive and toiling as it climbed slowly up a cloudless sky passing starry sentinels whose mighty challenge was lost in vast vortices of blue as they paced their ceaseless round in the mighty camp of constellations with her eyes fixed on the gloomy groined archway of elms where an occasional slip of moonshine silvered the ground edna watched and waited the blood beat heavily in her temples and throbbed sullenly at her heart 
but she sat mute and motionless as the summer night reviewing all that had occurred during the day presently the distant sound of hoofs on the rocky road leading to town fell upon her strained ear the hard quick gallop ceased at the gate and very slowly mr murray walked his horse up the dusky avenue and on toward the stable from the shadow of her muslin curtain edna looked down on the walk beneath and after a few moments saw him coming to the house he paused on the terrace took off his hat swept back the thick hair from his forehead and stood looking out over the quiet lawn then a heavy heavy sigh almost a moan seemed to burst from the depths of his heart and he turned and went into the house the night was far spent and the moon had cradled herself on the tree-tops when edna raised her face all blistered with tears stretching out her arms she fell on her knees while a passionate sobbing prayer struggled brokenly across her trembling lips oh my god have mercy upon him save his wretched soul from eternal death help me so to live and govern myself that i bring no shame on the cause of christ and if it be thy will o my god grant that i may be instrumental in winning this precious but wandering sinful soul back to the faith as it is in jesus ah verily more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of wherefore let thy voice rise like a fountain for him night and day for what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain if knowing god they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and those who call them friend End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter nineteen where are you going st elmo i know it is one of your amiable decrees that your movements are not to be questioned but i dare to brave your ire i am going to that blessed retreat familiarly known as murray's den where secure from feminine intrusion as if in the cool cloisters of i surrender my happy soul to science and cigars and revel in complete forgetfulness of that awful curse which jove hurled against all mankind because of prometheus's robbery there are asylums for lunatics and inebriates and i wonder it has never occurred to some benevolent millionaire to found one for such abominable cynics as you my most angelic cousin where the snarling brutes can only snap at and worry one another an admirable idea estelle which i fondly imagined i had successfully carried out when i built those rooms of mine you are as hateful as momus minus his wit he was kicked out of heaven for grumbling and you richly deserve his fate i have a vague recollection that the goddess discord shared the fate of the celestial growler i certainly plead guilty to an earnest sympathy with momus's dissatisfaction with the house that minerva built and only wish that mine was movable as he recommended in order to escape bad neighbourhoods and tiresome companions hospitable upon my word you spin some spiteful idea out of every sentence i utter and are not even entitled to the compliment which chesterfield paid to old samuel johnson the utmost i can do for him is to consider him a respectable hottentot if i did not know that instead of proving a punishment it would gratify you beyond measure i would take a vow not to speak to you again for a month but the consciousness of the happiness i should thereby bestow upon you vetoes the resolution do you know that even a comanche chief or a bakwana of the desert shames your inhospitality i assure you i am the victim of hopeless ennui am driven to the verge of desperation for mr alston will probably not return until to-morrow and it is raining so hard that i cannot wander out of doors here i am shut up in this dreary house which reminds me of the descriptions of that doleful retreat for sinners in normandy 
where the inmates pray eleven hours a day dig their own graves every evening and if they chance to meet one another salute each other with memento mori ugh if there remains one latent spark of chivalry in your soul i beseech you be merciful do not go off to your den but stay here and entertain me it is said that you read bewitchingly and with unrivalled effect pray favour me this morning i will promise to lay my hand on my lips it is not white enough for a flag of truce i will be meek amiable docile absolutely silent estelle swept aside a mass of papers from the corner of the sofa and taking mr murray's hand drew him to a seat beside her your amiable silence my fair cousin is but a cunningly fashioned wooden horse timco deneos et dona ferentis i am to understand that you actually offer me your hand as a flag of truce it is wonderfully white and pretty but excuse me c'est une main de fer gantie de velure your countenance so serenely radiant reminds me of what madame noblet said of m de vitry his face looked just like a stratagem reading aloud is a practice in which i never indulge simply because i cordially detest it and knowing this fact it is a truly feminine refinement of cruelty on your part to select this mode of penance nevertheless your appeal to my chivalry which always springs up armed cap a pie, to do or die and since read i must i only stipulate that i may be allowed to select my book just now i am profoundly interested in a french work on infusoria by du jardin and as you have probably not studied it i will select those portions which treat of the animalcula that inhabit grains of sugar and salt and drops of water so that by the time lunch is ready your appetite will be whetted by a knowledge of the nature of your repast according to lewenhoek muller glycan and others the campaigns of zenzis khan alexander attila were not half so murderous as a single fashionable dinner and the battle of marengo was a farce in comparison with the swallowing of a cup of tea which contains for shame you tormentor when you know that i love tea as well as did your model of politeness dr johnson not one line of all that nauseating scientific stuff shall you read to me here is a volume of poems of the female poets do be agreeable for once in your life and select me some sweet little rhythmic gem of mrs browning or mrs norton or eliel estelle did you ever hear of the Paishwa of the Mahrattas. I most assuredly never had even a hint of a syllable on the subject. What of him or her or it? Enough that though you are evidently ambitious of playing his despotic role at Le Bocage, you will never succeed in reducing me to that condition of abject subjugation necessary to make me endure the perusal of female poetry i have always desired an opportunity of voting my cordial thanks to the wit who expressed so felicitously my own thorough conviction that pegasus had an unconquerable repugnance hatred to side saddles you vow you will not listen to science and i swear i won't read poetry suppose we compromise on this new number of the magazine it is the ablest periodical published in this country let me see the contents of this number it was a dark rainy morning in july mrs murray was winding a quantity of zephyr wool of various bright colours which she had requested edna to hold on her wrists and at the mention of the magazine the latter looked up suddenly at the master of the house holding his cigar between his thumb and third finger his eye ran over the table of contents who smote the marble gods of greece hm. rather a difficult question to answer after the lapse of twenty-two centuries but doubtless our archaeologists are so much wiser than the athenian senate of five hundred 
who investigated the affair of the day after it happened that a perusal will be exceedingly edifying now then for a solution of this classic mystery of the nocturnal iconoclasm which in my humble opinion only the brazen lips of minerva promachus could satisfactorily explain turning to the article he read it aloud without pausing to comment while edna's heart bounded so rapidly that she could scarcely conceal her agitation it was indeed a treat to listen to him and as his musical voice filled the room she thought of jean paul richter's description of goethe's reading there is nothing comparable to it it is like deep toned thunder blended with whispering raindrops but the orphan's pleasure was of short duration and as mr murray concluded the perusal he tossed the magazine contemptuously across the room and exclaimed pretentious and shallow a tissue of pedantry and error from beginning to end written i will wager my head by some scribbler who never saw athens moreover the whole article is based upon a glaring blunder for according to plutarch and diodorus on the memorable night in question there was a new moon pshaw it is a tasteless insipid plagiarism from grote and if i am to be bored with such insufferable twaddle i will stop my subscription for some time i have noticed symptoms of deterioration but this is altogether intolerable and i shall write to manning that if he cannot do better it would be advisable for him to suspend at once before his magazine loses its reputation if i were not aware that his low estimate of female intellect coincides fully with my own i should be tempted to suppose that some silly but ambitious woman wrote that stuff which sounds learned and is simply stupid he did not even glance toward edna but the peculiar emphasis of his words left no doubt in her mind that he suspected nay felt assured that she was the luckless author raising her head which had been drooped over the woollen skeins she said firmly yet very quietly if you will permit me to differ with you mr murray i will say that it seems to me all the testimony is in favour of the full moon theory beside grote is the latest and best authority he has carefully collected and sifted the evidence and certainly sanctions the position taken by the author of the article which you condemn ah how long since you investigated the matter the affair is so essentially paganish that i should imagine that it possessed no charm for so orthodox a christian as yourself estelle what say you concerning this historic sphinx but i am blissfully ignorant of the whole question and have a vague impression that it is not worth the paper it is written on much less a quarrel with you monsieur le houtin that it is the merest matter of moonshine new moon versus full moon and must have been written by a lunatic but my chevalier bayard one thing i do intend to say most decidedly and that is that your lunge at female intellect was as unnecessary and ill-timed and ill-bred as it was ill-natured the mental quality of the sexes is now as unquestioned as universally admitted as any other well-established fact in science or history and the sooner you men gracefully concede us our rights the sooner we shall cease wrangling and settle back into our traditional amiability the universality of the admission i should certainly deny were the subject of sufficient importance to justify a discussion however i have been absent so long from america that i confess my ignorance of the last social advance in the striding enlightenment of this most progressive people according to moleshot's celebrated dictum without phosphorus no thought and if there be any truth in physiology and phrenology you women have been stinted by nature in the supply of phosphorus peacock's measurements prove that in the average weight of male and female brains you fall below our standard by not less than six ounces i should conjecture that in the scales of equality six ounces of ideas would turn the balance in favour of our superiority if you reduce it to a mere question of avoir du poids please be so good as to remember that even greater differences exist among men 
for instance your brain which is certainly not considered over average weighs from three to three and a half pounds while cuvier's brain weighed over four pounds giving him the advantage of more than eight ounces over our household oracle accidental difference in brain weight proves nothing for you will not admit your mental inferiority to any man simply because his head requires a larger hat than yours pardon me i always bow before facts no matter how unflattering and i consider one of cuvier's ideas worthy of just exactly eight degrees more of reverence than any phosphorescent sparkle which i might choose to hold up for public acceptance and guidance without doubt the most thoroughly ludicrous scene i ever witnessed was furnished by a woman's rights meeting which i looked in upon one night in new york as i returned from europe the speaker was a raw-boned wiry angular short-haired lemon-visaged female of very certain age with a hand like a bronze gauntlet and a voice as distracting as the shrill shriek of a cracked cornet a piston over the wrongs and grievances of her downtrodden writhing sisterhood she ranted and raved and howled gesticulating the while with a marvellous grace which i can compare only to the antics of those inspired goats who strayed too near the pythian cave and were thrown into convulsions though i pulled my hat over my eyes and clapped both hands to my ears as i rushed out of the hall after a stay of five minutes the vision of horror followed me and for the first and only time in my life i had such a hideous nightmare that night that the man who slept in the next room broke open my door to ascertain who was strangling me of all my pet aversions my most extreme abhorrence is of what are denominated gifted women strong-minded that is weak-brained but loud-tongued would be literary females who puffed up with insufferable conceit imagined they rise to the dignity and height of man's intellect proclaimed that their mission is to write or lecture and set themselves up as shining female lights each aspiring to the rank of proto-martyr of reform heaven grant us a bellerophon to relieve the age of these noisy amazons i should really enjoy seeing them tied down to their spinning wheels and gagged with their own books magazines and lectures when i was abroad and contrasted the land of my birth with those i visited the only thing for which as an american i felt myself called on to blush was my country women an insolent young count who had travelled through the eastern and northern states of america asked me one day in berlin if it were really true that the male editors lawyers doctors and lecturers in the united states were contemplating a hagira in consequence of the rough elbowing by the women and if i could inform him at what age the new england girls generally commenced writing learned articles and affixing l l d f e s f s a and m m s s to their signature lay on macduff i wish you distinctly to understand that my toes are not bruised in the slightest degree for i am entirely innocent of any attempt at erudition or authorship and the sole literary dream of my life is to improve the present popular recipe for biscuit glace but mark you sir oracle i must ope my lips and bark a little under my breath at your inconsistency now if there are two living men whom above all others you swear by they are john stuart mill and john ruskin well do i recollect your eulogy of both on that ever memorable day in paris when we dined with that french encyclopedia count w blank and the leading lettered men of the day were discussed i was frightened out of my wits and dare not raise my eyes higher than the top of my wine-glass lest i should be asked my opinion of some book or subject of which i had never even heard and in trying to appear well educated make as horrible a blunder as poor madame talleyrand had committed when she talked to denon about his man friday believing that he wrote robinson crusoe at that time i had never read either mill or ruskin but my profound reverence for the wisdom of your opinions taught me how shamefully ignorant i was and thus to fit myself for your companionship i immediately bought their books slow to my indescribable amazement i found that mill claimed for women what i never once dreamed we were worthy of not only equality but the right of suffrage he the foremost dialectician of england and the most learned of political economists demands that for the sake of equity and social improvement we women minus the required six ounces of brains should be allowed to vote behold the corypheus of the women's rights school were i to follow his teachings i should certainly begin to clamour for my right of suffrage for the ladylike privilege of elbowing you away from the ballot-box at the next election 
i am quite as far from admitting the infallibility of man as the equality of the sexes the clearest thinkers of the world have had soft spots in their brains for instance the daemon belief of socrates and the ludicrous superstitions of pythagoras and you have laid your finger on the softened spot in mill's skull suffrage that is a jaded spavined hobby of his and he is too shrewd a logician to involve himself in the inconsistency of extended suffrage which excludes women when i read his representative government i saw that his reason had dragged anchor the prestige of his great name vanished and i threw the book into the fire and eschewed him henceforth sick transit here mrs murray looked up and said john stuart mill let me see edna is he not the man who wrote that touching dedication of one of his books to his wife's memory you quoted it for me a few days ago and said that you had committed it to memory because it was such a glowing tribute to the intellectual capacity of woman my dear i wish you would repeat it now i should like to hear it again with her fingers full of purple woollen skeins and her eyes bent down edna recited in a low sweet voice the most eloquent panegyric which man's heart ever pronounced on woman's intellect to the beloved and deplored memory of her who was the inspirer and in part the author of all that is best in my writings the friend and wife whose exalted sense of truth and right was my strongest incitement and whose approbation was my chief reward i dedicate this volume like all that i have written for many years it belongs as much to her as to me but the work as it stands has had in a very insufficient degree the inestimable advantage of her revision some of the most important portions having been reserved for a more careful re-examination which they are now never destined to receive were i but capable of interpreting to the world one half the great thoughts and noble feelings which are buried in her grave i should be the medium of a greater benefit to it than is ever likely to arise from anything that i can write unprompted and unassisted by her all but unrivalled wisdom where did you find that dedication asked mr murray in mill's book on liberty it is not in my library i borrowed it from mr hammond strange that a plant so noxious should be permitted in such a sanctified atmosphere do you happen to recollect the following sentences i regard utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions there is a greek ideal of self-development which the platonic and christian ideal of self-government blends with but does not supersede it may be better to be a john knox than an alcibiades but it is better to be a pericles than either yes sir they occur in the same book but mr murray i have been advised by my teacher to bear always in mind that noble maxim i can tolerate everything else but every other man's intolerance and it is with his consent and by his instructions that i go like ruth gleaning in the great fields of literature take care you don't find boaz instead of barley after all the universal mania for match-making schemes and manoeuvres which continually stir society from its dregs to the painted foam bubble dancing on its crested wave is peculiar to no age or condition but is an immemorial and hereditary female proclivity for i defy paris or london to furnish a more perfectly developed specimen of a manoeuvring mamma than was crafty naomi when she sent that pretty little moabadish widow out husband hunting i hardly wish she was only here to outwit you laughed his cousin nestling her head against his arm as they sat together on the sofa who the widow or the matchmaker oh the matchmaker of course there is more than one ruth already in the field the last clause was whispered so low that only st elmo heard it and any other woman but estelle harding would have shrunk away in utter humiliation from the eye and the voice that answered yourself and mrs powell eat boaz's barley as long as you like nay divide boaz's broad fields between you and you love your lives keep out of boaz's way you ought both to be ashamed of yourselves i am surprised at you estelle to encourage st elmo's irreverence said mrs murray severely i am sure aunt ellen i am just as much shocked as you are but when he does not respect even your opinions how dare i presume to hope he will show any deference to mine st elmo what think you of the last sibylline leaves of your favourite ruskin 
in looking over his new book i was surprised to find this strong assertion here is the volume now listen to this will you shakespeare has no heroes he has only heroines in his laboured and perfect plays you find no hero but almost always a perfect woman steadfast in grave hope and errorless purpose the catastrophe of every play is caused always by the folly or fault of a man the redemption if there be any is by the wisdom and virtue of a woman and failing that there is none for instance lady macbeth ophelia reagan goneril and last but not least petruchio sweet and gentle kate de gustibus answered mr murray those are the exceptions and of course you pounce upon them ruskin continues in all cases with scott as with shakespeare it is the woman who watches over teaches and guides the youth it is never by any chance the man who watches over or educates her and thus mag Marillis, madge wildfire maws hedrig effie deans and rob roy's freckle-faced red-haired angelic helen interrupted her cousin don't be rude st elmo you fly in my face like an exasperated wasp i resume dante's great poem is a song of praise for beatrice's watch over his soul she saves him from hell and leads him star by star up into heaven permit me to suggest that conjugal devotion should have led him to apostrophize the superlative charms of his own wife gemma from whom he was forced to separate and that his vision of hell was a faint reflex of his domestic felicity mask your battery sir till i finish this page which i am resolved you shall hear greek literature proves the same thing as witness the devoted tenderness of the wisdom of cassandra the domestic excellence of penelope the love of antigone the resignation of iphigenia the faithfulness of allow me to assist him in completing the list the world-renowned constancy of helen to menelaus the devotion of clytemnestra to her agamemnon the sublime filial affection of medea and the bewitching hush sir aunt ellen do call him to order i will have a hearing and i close the argument by the unanswerable assertion of ruskin that the egyptians and greeks the most civilized of the ancients both gave to their spirit of wisdom the form of a woman and for symbols the weaver's shuttle and the olive an inevitable consequence of the fact that they considered wisdom as synonymous with sleepless and unscrupulous cunning schiller declares that man depicts himself in his gods and even a cursory inspection of the classics proves that all the abhorred and hideous ideas of the ancients were personified by woman pluto was affable and beneficent and gentlemanly in comparison with brimo ditto might be said of loki and hella and the most appalling idea that ever attacked the brain of mankind found incarnation in the fates and furies who are always women unfortunately the mythologies of the world crystallized before the age of chivalry and a little research will establish the unflattering fact that human sins and woes are traced primarily to female agency while it is patent that all the rows and squabbles that disgraced olympus were stirred up by scheming goddesses thank heaven here comes mr alston i can smooth the ruffled plumes of my self-love in his sunny smiles and forget your growls good morning mr alston what happy accident brought you again so soon to le bocage and its disconsolate inmates edna picked up the magazine which lay in one corner and made her escape the gratification arising from the acceptance and prompt publication of her essay was marred by mr murray's sneering comments but still her heart was happier than it had been for many weeks and as she turned to the editor's table and read a few lines complimenting the article of a new contributor and promising another from the same pen for the ensuing month her face flushed joyfully while she felt it difficult to realize that her writings had found favor in mr manning's critical eyes she thanked god that she was considered worthy of communicating 
with her race through the medium of a magazine so influential and celebrated she thought it probable that mr manning had written her a few lines and wondered whether at that moment a letter was not hidden in st elmo's pocket taking the magazine she went into mrs murray's room and found her resting on a lounge her face wore a troubled expression and edna saw traces of tears on the pillow come in child i was just thinking of you she put out her hand drew the girl to a seat near the lounge and sighed heavily dear mrs murray i am very very happy and i have come to make a confession and ask your congratulations she knelt down beside her and taking the white fingers of her benefactress pressed her forehead against them a confession edna what have you done mrs murray started up and lifted the blushing face some time ago you questioned me concerning some letters which excited your suspicion and which i promised to explain at some future day i dare say you will think me very presumptuous when i tell you that i have been aspiring to authorship that i was corresponding with mr manning on the subject of a manuscript which i had sent for his examination and now i have come to show you what i have been doing you heard mr murray read an essay this morning from the magazine which he ridiculed very bitterly but which mr manning at least thought worthy of a place in his pages mrs murray i wrote that article is it possible who assisted you who revised it mr hammond i did not suppose that you my child could ever write so elegantly so gracefully no one saw the manuscript until mr manning gave it to the printers i wished to surprise mr hammond and therefore told him nothing of my ambitious scheme i was very apprehensive that i should fail and for that reason was unwilling to acquaint you with the precise subject of the correspondence until i was sure of success oh mrs murray i have no mother and feeling that i owe everything to you that without your generous aid and protection i should never have been able to accomplish this one hope of my life i come to you to share my triumph for i know you will fully sympathize with me here is the magazine containing mr manning's praise of my work and here are the letters which i was once so reluctant to put into your hands when i asked you to trust me you did so nobly and freely and thanking you more than my feeble words can express i want to show you that i was not unworthy of your confidence she laid the magazine and letters on mrs murray's lap and in silence the proud reserved woman wound her arms tightly around the orphan pressing the bright young face against her shoulder and resting her own cheek on the girl's fair forehead the door was partly ajar and at that instant st elmo entered he stopped looked at the kneeling figure locked so closely in his mother's arms and over his stern face broke a light that transformed it into such beauty as lucifer's might have worn before his sin and banishment when god lucifer kindly said as gabriel lucifer soft as michael while serene he standing in the glory of the lamps answered my father innocent of shame and of the sense of thunder yearningly he extended his arms toward the two who absorbed in their low talk were unconscious of his presence then the hands fell heavily to his side the brief smile was swallowed up by scowling shadows and he turned silently away and went to his own gloomy rooms End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty mrs powell and her daughter to see miss estelle and miss edna 
why did you not say we were at dinner cried mrs murray impatiently darting an angry glance at the servant i did ma'am but they said they would wait as estelle folded up her napkin and slipped it into the silver ring she looked furtively at st elmo who holding up a bunch of purple grapes said in an indifferent tone to his mother the vineyards of axarchia show nothing more perfect this cluster might challenge comparison with those from which red hermitage is made and the seeds of which are said to have been brought from shiraz even on the sunny slopes of cyprus and naxos i found no finer grapes than these apropos i want a basket full this afternoon henry tell old simon to gather them immediately pray what use have you for them i am sure the courteous idea of sending them as a present never could have forced an entrance into your mind much less have carried the outworks of your heart as his cousin spoke she came to the back of his chair and leaned over his shoulder i should go out on the terrace and renew the obsolete dionysia shouting evo elias i shall crown and pelt my marble back is yonder with the grapes till his dainty sculptured limbs are bathed in their purple sacrificial blood what other use could i possibly have for them he threw his head back and added something in a lower tone at which estelle laughed and put up her red full lip mrs murray frowned and said sternly if you intend to see those persons i advise you to do so promptly her niece moved toward the door but glanced over her shoulder i presume gertrude expects to see edna as she asked for her the orphan had been watching mr murray's face but could detect no alteration in its expression save a brief gleam as of triumph when the visitors were announced rising she approached mrs murray whose clouded brow betokened more than ordinary displeasure and whispered gertrude is exceedingly anxious to see the house and grounds have i your permission to show her over the place she is particularly anxious to see the deer of course if she requests it but their effrontery in coming here caps the climax of all the impudence i ever heard of have as little to say as possible edna went to the parlour leaving mother and son together mrs powell had laid aside her mourning garments and wore a dress of blue muslin which heightened her beauty and as the orphan looked from her to gertrude she found it difficult to decide who was the loveliest after a few desultory remarks she rose saying as you have repeatedly expressed a desire to examine the park and hothouses i will show you the way this afternoon take care my love that you do not fatigue yourself were mrs powell's low tenderly spoken words as her daughter rose to leave the room edna went first to the greenhouse and though her companion chattered ceaselessly she took little interest in her exclamations of delight and was conjecturing the probable cause of mrs murray's great indignation for some weeks she had been thrown frequently into the society of mr hammond's guests and while her distrust of mrs powell her aversion to her melting musical voice increased at every interview a genuine affection for gertrude had taken root in her heart they were the same age but one was an earnest woman the other a fragile careless gleeful enthusiastic child although the orphan found it impossible to make a companion of this beautiful warm-hearted girl who hated books and turned pale at the mention of study still edna liked to watch the lovely radiant face with its cheeks tinted like sea-shells its soft childish blue eyes sparkling with joyousness and she began to caress and to love her as she would have petted a canary or one of the spotted fawns gambling over the lawn as they stood hand in hand admiring some goldfish in a small aquarium in the centre of the greenhouse gertrude exclaimed the place is as fascinating as its master do tell me something about him i wonder very often why you never mention him 
i know i ought not to say it but really after he has talked to me for a few minutes i forget everything else and think only of what he says for days and days after you certainly do not allude to mr murray said edna i certainly do what makes you look so astonished i was not aware that you knew him oh i have known him since the week after our arrival here mamma and i met him at mrs inge's mr inge had some gentlemen to dinner and they came into the parlour while we were calling mr murray sat down and talked to me then for some time and i frequently met him since for it seems he loves to stroll about the woods almost as well as i do and sometimes we walk together you know he and my uncle are not friendly and i believe mamma does not like him so he never comes to the parsonage and never seems to see me if i am with her or uncle allen but is he not very fascinating if he were not a little too old for me i believe i should really be very much in love with him an expression of disgust passed swiftly over edna's pale face she dropped her companion's hand and asked coldly does your mother approve of your walks with mr murray for heaven's sake don't look so solemn i she really i don't know i never told her a word about it once i mentioned having met him and showed her some flowers he gave me and she took very little notice of the matter several times since he has sent me bouquets and though i kept them out of uncle's sight she saw them in my room and must have suspected where they came from of course he cannot come to the parsonage to see me when he does not speak to my uncle or to mamma but i do not see any harm in his walking and talking with me when i happen to meet him oh how lovely those lilies are leaning over the edge of the aquarium mr murray said that some day he would show me all the beautiful things at le bocage but he has forgotten his promise i am afraid and i ah miss gertrude how could you doubt me i am here to fulfil my promise he pushed aside the boughs of a guava which stood between them and coming forward took gertrude's hand drew it under his arm and looked down eagerly admiringly into her blushing face oh mr murray i had no idea you were anywhere near me i am sure i could did you imagine you could escape my eyes which are always seeking you permit me to be your cicerone over le bocage instead of miss edna here who looks as if she had been scolding you perhaps she will be so good as to wait for us and i will bring you back in a half hour at least edna will you wait here for me asked gertrude why cannot mr murray bring you to the house there is nothing more to see here allow us to judge for ourselves if you please there is a late paris paper which will amuse you till we return st elmo threw a newspaper at her feet and led gertrude away through one of the glass doors into the park edna sat down on the edge of the aquarium and the hungry little fish crowded close to her looking up wistfully for the crumbs she was wont to scatter there daily but now their mute appeal was unheeded her colourless face and clasped hands grew cold as the marble basin on which they rested and the great hopeless agony that seized her heart came to her large eyes and looked out drearily it was in vain that she said to herself st elmo murray is nothing to me why should i care if he loves gertrude she is so beautiful and confiding and winning of course if he knows her well he must love her it is no business of mine we are not even friends we are worse than strangers and it cannot concern me whom he loves or whom he hates her own heart laughed her words to scorn and answered defiantly he is my king my king i have crowned and sceptred him and right royally he rules in pitiable humiliation she acknowledged that she had found it impossible to tear her thoughts from him that his dark face followed haunted her sleeping and waking while she shrank from his presence and dreaded his character she could not witness his fond manner to gertrude without a pang of the keenest pain she had ever endured the suddenness of the discovery shocked her into a thorough understanding of her own feelings the grinning fiend of jealousy had swept aside the flimsy veil which she had never before fully lifted 
and looking sorrowfully down into the bared holy of holies she saw standing between the hovering wings of golden cherubim an idol of clay demanding homage daring the wrath of conscience the high priest she saw all now and saw too at the same instant whither her line of duty led the atmosphere was sultry but she shivered and if a mirror could have been held before her eyes she would have started back from the grey stony face so unlike hers it seemed so strange that the heart of the accomplished misanthrope the man of letters and science who had ransacked the world for information and amusement should surrender itself to the prattle of a pretty young thing who could sympathize in no degree with his pursuits and was as utterly incapable of understanding his nature as his tartar horse or his pet bloodhound she had often heard mrs murray say if there is one thing more uncertain even than the verdict of a jury if there is one thing which is known neither in heaven earth or hell and which angels and demons alike waste time in guessing at it is what style of woman any man will fancy and select for his wife it is utterly impossible to predict what matrimonial caprice may or may not seize even the wisest most experienced most practical and reasonable of men and i would sooner undertake to conjecture how high the thermometer stands at this instant on the crest of mount copernicus up yonder in the moon than attempt to guess what freak will decide a man's choice of a bride sternly edna faced the future and pictured gertrude as mr murray's wife for if he loved her and did not his eyes declare it of course he would sweep every objection every obstacle to the winds and marry her speedily she tried to think of him the cold harsh scoffer as the fond husband of that laughing child and though the vision was indescribably painful she forced herself to dwell upon it the idea that he would ever love any one or anything had never until this hour occurred to her and while she could neither tolerate his opinions or respect his character she found herself smitten with a great voiceless anguish at the thought of his giving his sinful bitter heart to any woman why did she love him curious fool be still is human love the growth of human will pressing her hand to her eyes she murmured gertrude is right he is fascinating but it is the fascination of a tempting demon ah if i had never come here if i had never been cursed with the sight of his face but i am no weak silly child like gertrude powell i know what my duty is and i am strong enough to conquer and if necessary to crush my foolish heart oh i know you mr murray and i can defy you to-day short-sighted as i have been i look down on you you are beneath me and the time will come when i shall look back to this hour and wonder if i were temporarily bewitched or insane wake up wake up come to your senses edna earl put an end to this sinful folly blush for your unwomanly weakness as gertrude's merry laugh floated up through the trees the orphan lifted her head and the blood came back to her cheeks while she watched the two figures sauntering across the smooth lawn gertrude leaned on mr murray's arm and as he talked to her his head was bent down so that he could see the flushed face shaded by her straw hat she drew her hand from his arm when they reached the greenhouse and looking much embarrassed said hurriedly i am afraid i have kept you waiting an unconscionable time but mr murray had so many beautiful things to show me that i quite forgot we had left you here alone i dare say your mother thinks i have run away with you and as i have an engagement i must either bid you good-bye and leave you here with mr murray or go back at once with you to the house the orphan's voice was firm and quiet and as she handed the french paper to st elmo she turned her eyes full on his face have you read it already he asked giving her one of his steely probing glances no sir i did not open it as i take little interest in continental politics gertrude will you go or stay mr murray put out his hand to gertrude's and said good-bye till to-morrow do not forget your promise turning away he went in the direction of the stables in silence edna walked on to the house and presently gertrude's soft fingers grasped hers edna i hope you are not mad with me do you really think it is wrong for me to talk to mr murray and to like him so much gertrude you must judge for yourself concerning the propriety of your conduct i shall not presume to advise you but the fact that you are unwilling to acquaint your mother with your course ought to make you look closely at your own heart when a girl is afraid to trust her mother i should think there were grounds for uneasiness 
they had reached the steps and mrs powell came out to meet them where have you two runaways been i have waited a half hour for you estelle do come and see me it is very dreary at the parsonage and your visits are cheering and precious come gertrude when gertrude kissed her friend she whispered don't be mad with me dearie i will remember what you said and talk to mamma this very evening edna saw mother and daughter descend the long avenue and then running up to her room she tied on her hat and walked rapidly across the park in an opposite direction about a mile and a half from le bocage on a winding and unfrequented road leading to a sawmill stood a small log-house containing only two rooms the yard was neglected full of rank weeds and the gate was falling from its rusty hinges edna walked up the decaying steps and without pausing to knock entered one of the comfortless-looking rooms on a cot in one corner lay an elderly man in the last stage of consumption and by his side busily engaged in knitting sat a child about ten years old whose pretty white face wore that touching look of patient placidity peculiar to the blind huldah reed had never seen the light but a marvellous change came over her countenance when edna's light step and clear sweet voice fell on her ear huldah how is your father to-day not as well as he was yesterday but he is asleep now and will be better when he wakes has the doctor been here to-day no he has not been here since sunday edna stood for a while watching the laboured breathing of the sleeper and putting her hand on huldah's head she whispered do you want me to read to you this evening it is late but i shall have time for a short chapter oh please do if it is only a few lines it will not wake him the child rose spread out her hands and groped her way across the room to a small table whence she took an old bible the two sat down together by the western window and edna asked is there any particular chapter you would like to hear please read about blind bartimaeus sitting by the roadside waiting for jesus edna turned to the verses and read in a subdued tone for some moments and her eager interest hulda slid down on her knees rested her thin hands on her companion's lap and raised her sweet face with its wide vacant sad hazel eyes when edna read the twenty-fourth verse of the next chapter the small hands were laid upon the page to arrest her attention edna do you believe that what things soever you desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them jesus said that and if i pray that my eyes may be opened do you believe i shall see they tell me that that paul will not live oh do you think i pray day and night and if i believe and oh i do believe i will believe do you think jesus will let me see him my father before he dies if i could only see his dear face once i would be willing to be blind afterward all my life i have felt his face and i knew it by my fingers but oh i can't feel it in the grave i've been praying so hard ever since the doctor said he must die praying that jesus would have mercy on me and let me see him just once last night i dreamed christ came and put his hands on my eyes and said to me too thy faith hath made thee whole and i waked up crying and my own fingers were pulling my eyes open but it was all dark dark edna won't you help me pray and do you believe i shall see him edna took the quivering face in her soft palms and tenderly kissed the lips several times my dear hulda you know the days of miracles are over and jesus is not walking in the world now to cure the suffering and the blind and the dumb but he is sitting close to the throne of god and he could send some angel down to touch my eyes and let me see my dear dear pa once ah just once oh he is the same jesus now as when he felt sorry for bartimaeus and why won't he pity me too i pray and believe and that is what he said i must do i think that the promise relates to spiritual things and means that when we pray for strength to resist temptation and sin jesus sends the holy spirit to assist all who earnestly strive to do their duty but dear hulda one thing is very certain even if you are blind in this world there will come a day when god will open your eyes and you shall see those you love face to face for there shall be no night there in that city of rest no need of sun or moon for the lamb is the light thereof hulda daughter the child glided swiftly to the cot and looking round edna doubted the evidence of her senses for by the side of the sufferer stood a figure so like mr murray that her heart began to throb painfully the corner of the room was dim and shadowy but a strong deep voice soon dispelled all doubt i hope you are better to-day reed here are some grapes which will refresh you and you can eat them as freely as your appetite prompts mr murray placed a luscious cluster in the emaciated hands and put the basket down on the floor near the cot 
as he drew a chair from the wall and seated himself edna crossed the room stealthily and laying her hand on halda's shoulder led her out to the front steps halda has mrs de murray ever been here before oh yes often and often but he generally comes later than this he brings all the wine poor pa drinks and very often peaches and grapes oh he is so good to us i love to hear him come up the steps and many a time when pa is asleep i see her at night listening for the gallop of mr murray's horse somehow i feel so safe as if nothing could go wrong when he is in the house why did you never tell me this before why have you not spoken of him because he charged me not to speak to any one about it said he did not choose to have it known that he ever came here there pa is calling me won't you come in and speak to him not this evening good-bye i will come again soon edna stooped kissed the child hastily and walked away she had only reached the gate where tamerlane was fastened when mr murray came out of the house edna reluctantly she stopped and waited for him are you not afraid to walk home alone no sir i am out frequently even later than this it is not exactly prudent for you to go home now alone for it will be quite dark before you can possibly reach the park gate he passed his horse's reins over his arm and led him along the road i am not going that way sir there is a path through the woods that is much shorter than the road and i can get through an opening in the orchard fence good evening she turned abruptly from the beaten road but he caught her dress and detained her i told you some time ago that i never permitted espionage in my affairs and now with reference to what occurred at the greenhouse i advise you to keep silent do you understand me in the first place sir i could not condescend to play spy on the actions of any one and in the second you may rest assured i shall not trouble myself to comment upon your affairs in which i certainly have no interest your estimate of me must be contemptible indeed if you imagine that i can only employ myself in watching your career dismiss your apprehensions and rest in the assurance that i consider it no business of mine where you go or what you may choose to do my only desire is to shield my pretty gertrude's head from the wrath that may be bottled up for her edna looked up fixedly into the deep glittering eyes that watched hers and answered quietly mr murray if you love her half as well as i do you will be more careful in the future not to subject her to the opening of the vials of wrath he laughed contemptuously and exclaimed you are doubtless experienced in such matters and fully competent to advise me no sir it does not concern me and i presume neither to criticise nor to advise please be so good as to detain me no longer and believe me when i repeat that i have no intention whatever of meddling with any of your affairs or reporting your actions putting his hands suddenly on her shoulders he stooped looked keenly at her and she heard him mutter an oath when he spoke again it was through set teeth you will be wise if you adhere to that decision tell them at home not to wait supper for me he sprang to his saddle and rode toward the village and edna hurried homeward asking herself what first took mr murray to the blacksmith's hovel why is he so anxious that his visits should remain undiscovered after all is there some latent nobility in his character is he so much better or worse than i have thought him perhaps his love for gertrude has softened his heart perhaps that love may be his salvation god grant it god grant it the evening breeze rose and sang solemnly through the pine trees but to her it seemed only to chant the melancholy refrain my pretty gertrude my pretty gertrude the chill light of stars fell on the orphan's pathway and over her pale features where dwelt the reflection of a loneliness a silent desolation such as she had never realized even when her grandfather was snatched from her clinging arms she passed through the orchards startling a covey of partridges that nestled in the long grass and a rabbit that had stolen out under cover of dusk and when she came to the fountain she paused and looked out over the dark quiet grounds hitherto duty had worn a smiling loving countenance and walked gently by her side as she crossed the flowery vales of girlhood now the guide was transformed into an angel of wrath pointing with drawn sword to the gate of eden as the girl's light fingers locked themselves tightly her beautiful lips uttered mournfully what hast thou done o soul of mine that thou tremblest so hast thou wrought his task and kept the line he bade thee go ah the cloud is dark and day by day i am moving thither i must pass beneath it on my way god pity me whither when mrs murray went to her own room later than usual that night she found edna sitting by the table with her bible lying open on her lap and her eyes fixed on the floor 
i thought you were fast asleep before this i sat up waiting for st elmo as i wished to speak to him about some engagements for to-morrow the lady of the house threw herself wearily upon the lounge and sighed as she unclasped her bracelets and took off the diamond cross that fastened her collar edna ring for hagar will you not let me take her place to-night i want to talk to you before i go to sleep well then unlace my gaiters and take down my hair child what makes you look so very serious because what i am about to say saddens me very much my dear mrs murray i have been in this house five peaceful happy blessed years i have become warmly attached to everything about the home where i have been so kindly sheltered during my girlhood and the thought of leaving it is exceedingly painful to me what do you mean edna have you come to your senses at last and consented to make gordon happy no no i am going to new york to try to make my bread you are going to a lunatic asylum stuff nonsense what can you do in new york it is already overstocked with poor men and women who are on the verge of starvation pooh pooh you look like making your bread don't be silly i know that i am competent now to take a situation as teacher in a school or family and i am determined to make the experiment immediately i want to go to new york because i can command advantages there which no poor girl can obtain in any southern city and the magazine for which i expect to write is published there mr manning says he will pay me liberally for such articles as he accepts and if i can only get a situation which i hear is now vacant i can easily support myself mrs powell received a letter yesterday from a wealthy friend in new york who desires to secure a governess for her young children one of whom is deformed she said she was excessively particular as to the character of the woman to whose care she committed her crippled boy and that she had advertised for one who could teach him greek i shall ask mrs powell and mr hammond to telegraph to her to-morrow and request her not to engage any one till a letter can reach her from mr hammond and myself i believe he knows the lady who is very distantly related to mrs powell still before i took this step i felt that i owed it to you to acquaint you with my intention it is a step which i cannot sanction i detest that mrs powell i utterly loathe the sound of her name and i should be altogether unwilling to see you domesticated with any of her friends i am surprised that mr hammond could encourage any such foolish scheme on your part as yet he is entirely ignorant of my plan for i have mentioned it to no one except yourself but i do not think he will oppose it dear mrs murray much as i love you i cannot remain here any longer for i could not continue to owe my bread even to your kind and tender charity you have educated me and only god knows how inexpressibly grateful i am for all your goodness but now i could no longer preserve my self-respect or be happy as a dependent on your bounty she had taken mrs murray's hand and while tears gathered in her eyes she kissed the fingers and pressed them against her cheek if you are too proud to remain here as you have done for so many years how do you suppose you can endure the humiliations and affronts which will certainly be your portion when you accept a hireling's position in the family of a stranger don't you know that of all drudgery that required of governesses is most fraught with vexation and bitterness of spirit i have never treated you as an upper servant but loved you and shielded you from slights and insults as if you were my niece or my daughter edna you could not endure the lot you have selected your proud sensitive nature would be galled to desperation stay here and help me keep house write and study as much as you like and do as you please only don't leave me she drew the girl to her bosom while she kissed her tears fell on the pale face oh mrs murray it is hard to leave you for indeed i love you more than you will ever believe or realize but i must go i feel it is my duty and you would not wish me to stay here and be unhappy unhappy here why so something is wrong and i must know just what it is somebody has been meddling taunting you edna i ask a plain question and i want the whole truth you and estelle do not like each other is her presence here the cause of your determination to quit my house no mrs murray if she were not here i should still feel it my duty to go out and earn my living you are correct in saying we do not particularly like each other there is little sympathy between us but no bad feeling that i am aware of and she is not the cause of my departure mrs murray was silent a moment scrutinizing the face on her shoulder edna can it be my son has some harsh speech of st elmo's peaked and wounded you oh no his manner toward me is quite as polite nay rather more considerate than when i first came here beside you know we are almost strangers sometimes weeks elapse without our exchanging a word 
are you sure you have not had a quarrel with him i know you dislike him i know how exceedingly provoking he frequently is but child he is unfortunately constituted he is bitterly rude to everybody and does not mean to wound you particularly i have no complaint to make of mr murray's manner to me i do not expect or desire that it should be other than it is why do you doubt the sincerity of the reason i gave for quitting dear old bocage i have never expected to live here longer than was necessary to qualify myself for the work i have chosen i doubt it because it is so incomprehensible that a young girl who might be gordon lee's happy wife and mistress of his elegant home surrounded by every luxury and idolized by one of the noblest handsomest men i ever knew should prefer to go among strangers and toil for a scanty livelihood now i know something of human nature and i know that your course is very singular very unnatural edna my child my dear little girl i can't let you go i want you i can't spare you i find i love you too well my sweet comforter in all my troubles my only real companion she clasped the orphan closer and wept oh you don't know how precious your love is to my heart dear dear mrs murray in all this wide world whom i have to love me but you and mr hammond even in the great sorrow of leaving you it will gladden me to feel that i possess so fully your confidence and affection but i must go away and after a little while you will not miss me for estelle will be with you and you will not need me oh it is hard to leave you it is a bitter trial but i know what my duty is and were it even more difficult i would not hesitate i hope you will not think me unduly obstinate when i tell you that i have fully determined to apply for that situation in new york mrs murray pushed the girl from her and with a sob buried her face in her arms edna waited in vain for her to speak and finally she stooped and kissed one of the hands and said brokenly as she left the room good night my dearest my best friend if you could only look into my heart and see how it aches at the thought of separation you would not add the pain of your displeasure to that which i already suffer when the orphan opened her eyes on the following morning she found a note pinned to her pillow my dear edna i could not sleep last night in consequence of your unfortunate resolution and i write to beg you for my sake if not for your own to reconsider the matter i will gladly pay you the same salary that you expect to receive as governess if you will remain as my companion and assist at le bocage i cannot consent to give you up i love you too well my child to see you quit my house i shall soon be an old woman and then what should i do without my little orphan girl stay with me always and you shall never know what want and toil and hardship mean as soon as you are awake come and kiss me good morning and i shall know that you are my own dear little edna affectionately yours ellen murray edna knelt and prayed for strength to do what she felt duty sternly dictated but though her will did not falter her heart bled as she wrote a few lines thanking her benefactors for the affection that had brightened and warmed her whole lonely life and assuring her that the reasons which induced her to leave le bocage were imperative and unanswerable an hour later she entered the breakfast-room and found the members of the family already assembled while mrs murray was cold and haughty taking no notice of edna's salutation estelle talked gaily with mr alston concerning a horseback ride they intended to take that morning and mr murray leaning back in his chair seemed engrossed in the columns of the london times which contained a recent speech of gladstone's presently he threw down the paper looked at his watch and ordered his horse st elmo where are you going do allow yourself to be prevailed on to wait and ride with us estelle's tone was musical and coaxing as she approached her cousin and put one of her fingers through the buttonhole of his coat not for all the kingdoms that satan pointed out from the pinnacle of mount carantina i have as insuperable an objection to constituting one of a trio as some superstitious people have to forming part of a dinner-party of thirteen where am i going to that sea of serenity which astronomers tell us is located in the left eye of the face known in common parlance as the man in the moon where am i going to western rosher to pitch my tent and smoke my cigar in peace on the brink of that blessed loch marie whereof pennant wrote he shook off estelle's touch walked to the mantelpiece and taking a match from the johnny case drew it across the heel of his boot where is loch marie i do not remember ever to have seen the name said mrs murray pushing aside her coffee-cup oh pardon me mother if i decline to undertake your geographical education ask that incipient isota nagarol sitting there at your right hand doubtless she will find it a pleasing task to instruct you in scottish topography while i have an engagement that forces me most reluctantly and respectfully to decline the honour of enlightening you confound these matches they are all damp involuntarily mrs murray's 
eyes turned to edna who had not even glanced at st omo since her entrance now she looked up and though she had not read pennant she remembered the lines written on the old druidic well by an american poet yielding to some inexplicable impulse she slowly and gently repeated two verses o restless heart and fevered brain unquiet and unstable that holy well of loch marie is more than idle fable the shadows of a humble will and contrite heart are o'er it go read its legend trust in god on faith's white stones before it end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty one well your decision is very painful to me i shall not attempt to dissuade you from a resolution which i know has not been lightly or hastily taken but ah my child what shall i do without you mr hammond's eyes filled with tears as he looked at his pupil and his hand trembled when he stroked her bowed head i dread the separation from you and mrs murray but i know i ought to go and i feel that when duty commands me to follow a path lonely and dreary though it may seem a light will be shed before my feet and a staff will be put into my hands i have often wondered what the etrurians intended to personify in their dei in voluti before whose awful decrees all other gods bowed now i feel assured that the chief of the shrouded gods is duty veiling her features with a silver-lined cloud scorning to parley but whose unbending figure signs our way an unerring pillar of cloud by day of fire by night mr hammond i shall follow that stern finger till the clods on my coffin shut it from my sight the august sun shining through the lilac and myrtle boughs that rustled close to the study window glinted over the pure pale face of the orphan and showed a calm mournfulness in the eyes which looked out at the quiet parsonage garden and far away to the waving lines against the sky where a golden lustre slept upon the hills just beyond the low ivy-wreathed stone wall that marked the boundary of the garden ran a little stream overhung with alders and willows under whose tremendous shadows rested contented cattle some knee-deep in water some browsing leisurely on purple tufted clover from the wide hot field stretching away on the opposite side came the clear metallic ring of the scythes as the mowers sharpened them the mellow whistle of the driver lying on top of the huge hay mass beneath which the oxen crawled toward the lowered bars and the sweet gurgling laughter of two romping sunburned children who swung on at the back of the wagon edna pointed to the peaceful picture and said if rosa bonheur could only put that on canvas for me i would hang it upon my walls in the great city whither i am going and when my weary days of work ended i could sit down before it and fold my tired hands and look at it through the mist of tears till its blessed calm stole into my heart and i believed myself once more with you gazing out of the study window ah blessed among all gifted women is rosa bonheur accounted worthy to wear what other women may not aspire to the cross of the legion of honour yesterday when i read the description of the visit of the empress to the studio i think i was almost as proud and happy as that patient worker at the easel when over her shoulders was hung the ribbon which france decrees only to the mighty souls who increase her glory and before whom she bows in reverent gratitude 
i am glad that a woman's hand laid that badge of immortality on womanly shoulders a crowned head crowning the queen of artists i wonder if when obscure and in disguise she haunted the abattoir du roux and worked on amid the lowing and bleeding of the victims i wonder if faith prophesied of that distant day of glorious recompense when the ribbon of the legion fluttered from eugenie's white fingers and she was exalted above all thrones ah mr hammond we all wear our crosses but they do not belong to the order of the legion of honour the minister enclosed in his own the hand which she had laid on his knee and said gently but gravely my child your ambition is your besetting sin it is satan pointing to the tree of knowledge tempting you to eat and become as gods search your heart and i fear you will find that while you believe you are dedicating your talent entirely to the service of god there is a spring of selfishness underlying all you are too proud too ambitious of distinction too eager to climb to some lofty niche in the temple of fame where your name now unknown shall shine in the annals of literature and serve as a beacon to encourage others equally as anxious for celebrity i was not surprised to see you in print for long long ago before you realized the extent of your mental dowry i saw the kindling of that ambitious spark whose flame generally consumes the women in whose hearts it burns the history of literary females is not calculated to allay the apprehension that oppresses me as i watch you just setting out on a career so fraught with trials of which you have never dreamed as a class they are martyrs uncrowned and uncanonized jeered at by the masses sincerely pitied by a few earnest souls and whipped over by the relatives who really love them thousands of women have toiled over books that proved millstones and drowned them in the sea of letters how many of the hundreds of female writers scattered through the world in this century will be remembered six months after the coffin closes over their weary haggard faces you may answer they made their bread ah child it would have been sweeter if earned at the wash-tub or in the dairy or by their needles it is the rough handling the jars the tension of the heart-strings that sap the foundations of a woman's life and consign her to an early grave and a cherokee rose hedge is not more thickly set with thorns than a literary career with grievous vexatious tormenting disappointments if you succeed after years of labour and anxiety and harassing fears you will become a target for envy and malice and possibly for slander your own sex will be jealous of your eminence considering your superiority an insult to their mediocrity and mine will either ridicule or barely tolerate you for men detest female competitors in the olympian game of literature if you fail you will be sneered down till you become embittered soured misanthropic a curse to yourself a burden to the friends who sympathize with your blasted hopes edna you have talent you write well you are conscientious but you are not de Stahl, or hannah moore or charlotte bronte or elizabeth browning and i shudder when i think of the disappointment that may overtake all your eager aspirations if i could be always near you i should indulge less apprehension for your future for i believe that i could help you to bear patiently whatever is in store for you but far away among strangers you must struggle alone mr hammond i do not rely upon myself my hope is in god my child the days of miraculous inspiration are ended ah do not discourage me when the bishop of noyen hesitated to consecrate st radegund she said to him thou wilt have to render thy account and the shepherd will require of thee the souls of his sheep my dear sir your approbation is the consecration that i desire upon my purpose god will not forsake me he will strengthen and guide me and bless my writing even as he blesses your preaching because he gave you five talents and to me only one do you think that in the great day of reckoning mine will not be required of me i do not expect to enter into the joy of my lord as you will be worthy to do but with the blessing of god i trust the doom of the altogether unprofitable servant will not be pronounced against me 
she had bowed her head till it rested on his knee and presently the old man put his hands upon the glossy hair and murmured solemnly and the peace of god which passeth all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through christ jesus a brief silence reigned in the study broken first by the shout of the haymakers and the rippling laugh of the children in the adjacent field and then by the calm voice of the pastor i have offered you a home with me as long as i have a roof that i can call my own but you prefer to go to new york and henceforth i shall never cease to pray that your resolution may prove fortunate in all respects you no longer require my direction in your studies but i will suggest that it might be expedient for you to give more attention to positive and less to abstract science remember those noble words of sir david brewster to which i believe i have already called your attention if the god of love is most appropriately worshipped in the christian temple the god of nature may be equally honoured in the temple of science even from its lofty minarets the philosopher may summon the faithful to prayer and the priest and the sage may exchange altars without the compromise of faith or of knowledge infidelity has shifted the battlefield from metaphysics to physics from idealism and rationalism to positivism or rank materialism and in order to combat it successfully in order to build up an imperishable system of christian teleology it is necessary that you should thoroughly acquaint yourself with the natural sciences with dynamics and all the so-called inherent forces of nature or what humboldt terms primordial necessity this apotheosis of dirt by such men as moleschot buchner and vogt is the real antaeus which though continually overthrown springs from mother earth with renewed vigour and after a little while some hercules of science will lift the boaster in his inexorable arms and crush him here mrs powell entered the room and edna rose and tied on her hat mr hammond will you go over to see hulda this afternoon poor little thing she is in great distress about her father i fear he cannot live many days i went to see him yesterday morning and would go again with you now but have promised to baptize two children this evening edna was opening the gate when gertrude called to her from a shaded corner of the yard and turning she saw her playing with a fawn about whose neck she had twined a long spray of honeysuckle do come and see the beautiful present mr murray sent me several days ago it is as gentle and playful as a kitten and seems to know me already gertrude patted the head of her pretty pet and continued i have often read about gazelle's eyes and i wonder if these are not quite as lovely very often when i look at them they remind me of yours there is such a soft sad patient expression as if she knew perfectly well that some day the hunters would be sure to catch and kill her and she was meekly biding her time to be turned into venison steak i never will eat another piece the dear little thing edna do you know that you have the most beautiful eyes in the world except mr murray's his glitter like great stars under a long long black silk fringe by the way how is he have not seen him for some days and you can have no idea how i do want to look into his face and hear his voice which is so wonderfully sweet and low i wrote him a note thanking him for this little spotted darling but he has not answered it has not come near me and i was afraid he might be sick gertrude stole one arm around her companion's neck and nestled her golden head against the orphan's shoulder mr murray is very well at least appears so i saw him at breakfast does he ever talk about me no i never heard him mention your name but once and then it occurred incidentally oh edna is it wrong for me to think about him so constantly don't press your lips together in that stern hard way dearie put your arms around me and kiss me oh if you could know how very much i love him how happy i am when he is with me edna how can i help it when he touches my hand and smiles down at me i forget everything else i feel as if i would follow him to the end of the earth he is a great deal older than i am but how can i remember that 
when he is looking at me with those wonderful eyes the last time i saw him he said well something very sweet and i was sure he loved me and i leaned my head against his shoulder but he would not let me touch him he pushed me away with a terrific frown that wrinkled and blackened his face oh it seems an age since then edna kissed the lovely coral lips and smoothed the bright curls that the wind had blown about the exquisitely moulded cheeks gertrude when he asks you to love him you will have a right to indulge your affection but until then you ought not to allow him to know your feelings or permit yourself to think so entirely of him but do you believe it is wrong for me to love him so much that is a question which your own heart must answer edna felt that her own lips were growing cold and she disengaged the girl's clasping arms edna i know you love me will you do something for me please give him this note i am afraid that he did not receive the other or that he is offended with me she drew a dainty three-cornered envelope from her pocket no gertrude i can be a party to no clandestine correspondence i have too much respect for your uncle to assist in smuggling letters in and out of his house beside your mother would not sanction the course you are pursuing oh i showed her the other note and she only laughed and patted my cheek and said why mignon he is old enough to be your father this note is only to find out whether he received the other i sent it by the servant who brought this fawn oh dear me just see what a hole the pretty little wretch has nibbled in my new swiss muslin dress won't mamma scold there do go away pet i will feed you presently indeed edna there is no harm in your taking the note for i give you my word mamma does not care do you think i would tell you a story please edna it will reach him so much sooner if, if you carry it over than if i were to drop it into the post-office where it may stay for a week and uncle allen has no extra servants to run around on errands for me gertrude are you not deceiving me are you sure your mother read the other note and sanctions this certainly you may ask her if you doubt me there i must hurry in mamma is calling me dear edna if you love me yes mamma i am coming edna could not resist the pleading of the lovely face pressed close to hers and with a sigh she took the tiny note and turned away more than a week had elapsed since mr hammond and mrs powell had written recommending her for the situation in mrs andrews's family and with feverish impatience she awaited the result during this interval she had not exchanged a word with mr murray had spent much of her time in writing down in her notebook such references from the library as she required in her manuscript and while estelle seemed unusually high-spirited mrs murray watched in silence the orphan's preparations for departure absorbed in very painful reflections the girl walked on rapidly till she reached the cheerless home of the blacksmith and knocked at the door come in mr murray edna pushed open the door and walked in it is not mr murray this time oh edna i am so glad you happened to come he would not let me tell you he said he did not wish it known but now you are here you will stay with me won't you till it is over hulda was kneeling at the side of her father's cot and edna was startled by the look of eager breathless anxiety printed on her white trembling face what does she mean mr reed poor little lamb she is so excited she can hardly speak and i am not strong enough to talk much hulda daughter tell miss edna all about it mr murray heard all i said to you about praying to have my eyes open and he went to town that same evening and telegraphed to some doctor in philadelphia who cures blindness to come on and see if he could do anything for my eyes mr murray was here this morning and said he had heard from the doctor and that he would come this afternoon he said he could only stay till the cars left for chattanooga as he must go back at once you know he hush there there i hear the carriage now oh edna pray for me pa pray for my poor eyes the sweet childish face was colourless and tears filled the filmy hazel eyes as hulda clasped her hands her lips moved rapidly though no sound was audible edna stepped behind the door and peeped through a crack in the planks mr murray entered first and beckoned to the stranger who paused at the threshold with a case of instruments in his hand come in hugh here is your patient very much frightened too i am afraid hulda come to the light he drew her to the window lifted her to a chair and the doctor bent down pushed back his spectacles and cautiously examined the child's eyes don't tremble so hulda 
there is nothing to be afraid of the doctor will not hurt you oh it is not that i fear to be hurt edna are you praying for me edna is not here answered mr murray glancing round the room yes she is here i did not tell her but she happened to come a little while ago edna won't you hold one of my hands oh edna edna reluctantly the orphan came forward and without lifting her eyes took one of the little outstretched hands firmly in both her own while mr murray silently appropriated the other huldah whispered please both of you pray for me the doctor raised the eyelids several times peered long and curiously at the eyeballs and opened his case of instruments this is one of those instances of congenital cataract which might have been relieved long ago a slight operation will remove the difficulty st elmo you asked me about the probability of an instantaneous restoration and i had begun to tell you about the case which wardrop mentions of a woman blind from her birth till she was forty-six years of age she could not distinguish objects for several days oh sir will i see will i see my father her fingers closed spasmodically over those that clasped them and the agonizing suspense written in her countenance was pitiable to contemplate yes my dear i hope so i think so you know murray the eye has to be trained but holler mentions a case of a nobleman who saw distinctly at various distances immediately after the cataract was removed from the axis of vision now my little girl hold just as still as possible i shall not hurt you skilfully he cut through the membrane and drew it down then held his hat between her eyes and the light streaming through the window some seconds elapsed and suddenly a cry broke from the child's lips oh something shines there's a light i believe mr murray threw his handkerchief over her head caught her in his arms and placed her on the side of the cot the first face her eyes ever look upon shall be that which she loves best her father's as he withdrew the handkerchief mr reed feebly raised his arms toward his child and whispered my little huldah my daughter can you see me she stooped put her face close to his swept her small fingers repeatedly over the emaciated features to convince herself of the identity of the new sensation of sight with the old and reliable sense of touch then she threw her head back with a wild laugh a scream of delight oh i see thank god i see my father's face my dear pa my own dear pa for some moments she hung over the sufferer kissing him murmuring brokenly her happy tender words and now and then resorting to the old sense of touch while edna wiped away tears of joyful sympathy which she strove in vain to restrain she glanced at mr murray and wondered how he could stand there watching the scene with such bright dry eyes seeming suddenly to remember that there were other countenances in the world beside that tear-stained one on the pillow huldah slipped down from the cot turned toward the group and shaded her eyes with her fingers oh edna ain't you glad for me where are you i knew jesus would hear me what things soever ye desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them i did believe and i see i see i prayed that god would send down some angel to touch my eyes and he sent mr murray and the doctor after a pause during which the oculist prepared some bandages huldah added which one is mr murray will you please come to me my ears and my fingers know you but my eyes don't he stepped forward and putting out her hands she grasped his and turned her untutored eyes upon him before he could suspect her design she fell at his feet threw her arms around his knees and exclaimed how good you are how shall i ever thank you enough how good she clung to him and sobbed hysterically edna saw him lift her from the floor and put her back beside her father while the doctor bandaged her eyes and waiting to hear no more the orphan glided away and hurried along the road ere she had proceeded far she heard the quick trot of the horses the roll of the carriage leaning out as they overtook her mr murray directed the driver to stop and swinging open the door he stepped out and approached her the doctor dines at le bocage will you take a seat with us or do you as usual prefer to walk alone thank you sir i'm not going home now i shall walk on he bowed and was turning away but she drew the delicately perfumed envelope from her pocket mr murray i was requested by the writer to hand you this note as she feared its predecessor was lost by the servant to whom she entrusted it he took it glanced at the small cramped school girlish handwriting smiled and thrust it into his vest pocket saying in a low earnest tone 
this is indeed a joyful surprise you are certainly more reliable than henry except my cordial thanks which i have not time to reiterate i generally prefer to owe my happiness entirely to gertrude but in this instance i can bear to receive it through the medium of your hands as you are so prompt and trusty i may trouble you to carry my answer the carriage rolled on leaving a cloud of dust which the evening sunshine converted into a glittering track of glory and seating herself on a grassy bank edna leaned her head against the body of a tree and all the glory passed swiftly away and she was alone in the dust as the sun went down the pillared forest aisles stretching westward filled first with golden haze then glowed with a light redder than bithyatun wine poured from the burning beaker of the sun and only the mournful cooing of doves broke the solemn silence as the pine organ whispered its low coronach for the dead day and the cool shadow of coming night crept purple mantled velvet sandaled down the forest glades oh if i had gone away a week ago before i knew there was any redeeming charity in his sinful nature if i could only despise him utterly it would be so much easier to forget him ah god pity me god help me what right have i to think of gertrude's lover gertrude's husband i ought to be glad that he is nobler than i thought but i am not oh i am not i wish i had never known the good that he has done oh edna earl has it come to this how i despise how i hate myself rising she shook back her thick hair passed her hands over her hot temples and stood listening to the distant whistle of a partridge to the plaint of the lonely dove nestled among the pine boughs high above her and gradually a holy calm stole over her face fixing it as the merciful touch of death stills features that have long writhed in mortal agony into her struggling heart entered a strength which comes only when weary wrestling honest souls turn from human sympathy seek the hallowed cloisters of nature and are folded tenderly in the loving arms of mother cybele who never did betray the heart that loved her whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy for she can so inform the mind that is within us so impressed with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues rash judgments nor the sneers of selfish men nor greetings where no kindness is nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessing to her dewy altars among the mountains of gilead fled jephthah's daughter in the days when she sought for strength to fulfil her father's battle vow and into her pitying starry eyes looked stricken rizpah from those dreary rocks where love held faithful vigil guarding the bleaching bones of her darling dead sacrificed for the sins of saul End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two part one of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty two part one mrs andrews writes that i must go on with as little delay as possible and i shall start early monday morning as i wish to stop one day at chattanooga edna rose and took her hat from the study table and mr hammond asked do you intend to travel alone i shall be compelled to do so as i know of no one who is going on to new york of course i dislike very much to travel alone but in this instance i do not see how i can avoid it do not put on your hat stay and spend the evening with me thank you sir i want to go to this church and practice for the last time on the organ after to-morrow i may never sing again in our dear choir perhaps i may come back after a while and stay an hour or two with you during the past year she had accustomed herself to practicing every saturday afternoon the hymns selected by mr hammond for the services of the ensuing day and for this purpose had been furnished by the sexton with the key which enabled her to enter the church whenever inclination prompted the churchyard was peaceful and silent as the pulseless dust in its numerous sepulchres a beautiful red bird set on the edge of a marble vase that crowned the top of one of the monuments and leisurely drank the water which yesterday's clouds had poured there 
and a rabbit nibbled the leaves of a cluster of pinks growing near a child's grave edna entered the cool church went up into the gallery and sat down before the organ for some time the low solemn tones whispered among the fluted columns that supported the gallery and gradually swelled louder and fuller and richer as she sang cast thy burden on the lord her sweet well-trained voice faltered more than once and tears fell thick and fast on the keys finally she turned and looked down at the sacred spot where she had been baptized by mr hammond and where she had so often knelt to receive the sacrament of the lord's supper the church was remarkably handsome and certainly justified the pride with which the villagers exhibited it to all strangers the massive mahogany pew doors were elaborately carved and surmounted by small crosses the tall arch windows were of superb stained glass representing the twelve apostles the floor and balustrade of the altar and the grand gothic pillared pulpit were all of the purest white marble and the capitals of the airy elegant columns of the same material that supported the organ gallery were ornamented with rich grape-leaf moulding while the large window behind and above the pulpit contained a figure of christ bearing his cross a noble copy of the great painting of solario at berlin as the afternoon sun shone on the glass a flood of ruby light fell from the garments of jesus upon the glittering marble beneath and the nimbus that radiated around the crown of thorns caught a glory that was dazzling with a feeling of adoration that no language could adequately express edna had watched and studied this costly painted window for five long years had found a marvellous fascination in the pallid face stained with purplish blood drops in the parted lips quivering with human pain and anguish of spirit in the unfathomable divine eyes that pierced the veil and rested upon the father's face not all the sermons of bossuet or chalmers or jeremy taylor or melville had power to stir the great deeps of her soul like one glance at that pale thorn-crowned christ who looked in voiceless woe and sublime resignation over the world he was dying to redeem to-day she gazed up at the picture of emmanuel till her eyes grew dim with tears and she leaned her head against the mahogany railing and murmured sadly and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me strengthen me o my saviour so that i neither faint nor stagger under mine the echo of her words died away among the arches of the roof and all was still in the sanctuary the swaying of the trees outside of the windows threw now a golden shimmer then a violet shadow over the gleaming altar pavement and the sun sunk lower and the nimbus faded and the wan christ looked ghastly and toil spent edna my darling my darling the pleading cry the tremulous tender voice so full of pathos rang startlingly through the silent church and the orphan sprang up and saw mr murray standing at her side with his arms extended toward her and a glow on his face and a look in his eyes which she had never seen there before she drew back a few steps and gazed wonderingly at him but he followed threw his arm around her and despite her resistance strained her to his heart did you believe that i would let you go did you dream that i would see my darling leave me and go out into the world to be buffeted and sorely tried to struggle with poverty and to suffer alone o oh, silly child i would part with my own life sooner than give you up of what value would it be without you my pearl my sole hope my only love my own pure edna such language you have no right to utter and i none to hear it it is dishonourable in you and insulting to me gertrude's lover cannot and shall not address such words to me unwind your arms instantly let me go she struggled hard to free herself but his clasp tightened and as he pressed her face against his bosom he threw his head back and laughed gertrude's lover knowing my history how could you believe that possible am i think you so meek and forgiving a spirit as to turn and kiss the hand that smote me gertrude's lover ha ha your jealousy blinds you my i know nothing of your history i have never asked i have never been told one word but i am not blind i know that you love her and i know too that she fully returns your affection if you do not wish me to despise you utterly leave me at once he laughed again and put his lips close to her ear saying softly tenderly ah how tenderly 
upon my honour as a gentleman i solemnly swear that i love but one woman that i love her as no other woman ever was loved with a love that passes all language a love that is the only light and hope of a wrecked cursed unutterably miserable life and that idol which i have set up in the lonely grey ruins of my heart is edna earl i do not believe you you have no honour with the touch of gertrude's lips and arms still on yours you come to me and dare to perjure yourself oh mr murray mr murray i did not believe you capable of such despicable dissimulation in the catalogue of your sins i never counted deceit i thought you too proud to play the hypocrite if you could realise how i loathe and abhor you you would get out of my sight you would not waste time in words that sink you deeper and deeper in shameful duplicity poor gertrude how entirely you mistake your lover's character how your love will change to scorn and detestation in vain she endeavoured to wrench away his arm a band of steel would have been as flexible but st elmo's voice hardened and edna felt his heart throb fiercely against her cheek as he answered when you are my wife you will repent your rash words and blush at the remembrance of having told your husband that he was devoid of honour you are piqued and jealous just as i intended you should be but darling i am not a patient man and it frets me to feel you struggling so desperately in the arms that henceforth will always enfold you be quiet and hear me for i have much to tell you don't turn your face away from mine your lips belong to me i never kissed gertrude in my life and so help me god i never will hear no i will hear nothing your touch is profanation i would sooner go down into my grave out there in the churchyard under the granite slabs than become the wife of a man so unprincipled i am neither piqued nor jealous for your affairs cannot affect my life i am only astonished and mortified and grieved i would sooner feel the coil of a serpent around my waist than your arms instantly they fell away he crossed them on his chest and his voice sank to a husky whisper as the wind hushes itself just before the storm breaks edna god is my witness that i am not deceiving you that my words come from the great troubled depths of a wretched heart you said you knew nothing of my history i find it more difficult to believe you than you to credit my declarations answer one question has not your pastor taught you to distrust me can it be possible that no hint of the past has fallen from his lips not one unkind word not one syllable of your history has he uttered i know no more of your past than if it were buried in mid-ocean mr murray placed her in one of the cushioned chairs designed for the use of the choir and leaning back against the railing of the gallery fixed his eyes on edna's face then it is not surprising that you distrust me for you know not my provocation edna will you be patient will you go back with me over the scorched and blackened track of an accursed and sinful life it is a hideous waste i am inviting you to traverse will you i will hear you mr murray but nothing that you can say will justify your duplicity to gertrude and damn gertrude i ask you to listen and suspend your judgment till you know the circumstances he covered his eyes with his hand and in the brief silence she heard the ticking of his watch edna i roll away the stone from the charnel house of the past and call forth the lazarus of my buried youth my hopes my faith in god my trust in human nature my charity my slaughtered manhood my lazarus has tenanted the grave for nearly twenty years and comes forth at my bidding a grinning skeleton you may or may not know that my father paul murray died when i was an infant leaving my mother the sole guardian of my property and person i grew up at le bocage under the training of mr hammond my tutor and my only associate my companion from earliest recollections was his son murray who was two years my senior and named for my father the hold which that boy took upon my affection was wonderful inexplicable he wound me around his finger as you wind the silken threads with which you embroider we studied read played together i was never contented out of his sight never satisfied until i saw him liberally supplied with everything that gave me pleasure i believe i was very precocious and made extraordinary strides in the path of learning at all events at sixteen i was considered a remarkable boy mr hammond had six children and as his salary was rather meagre i insisted on paying his son's expenses as well as my own when i went to yale 
i could not bear that my damon my jonathan should be out of my sight i must have my idol always with me his father was educating him for the ministry and he had already commenced the study of theology but no i must have him with me at yale and so to yale we went i had fancied myself a christian had joined the church was zealous and faithful in all my religious duties in a fit of pious enthusiasm i planned this church ordered it built the cost was enormous and my mother objected but i intended it as a shrine for the apple of my eye and where he was concerned what mattered the expenditure of thousands was not my fortune quite as much at his disposal as at mine i looked forward with fond pride to the time when i should see my idol murray hammond standing in yonder shining pulpit ha at this instant it is filled with a hideous spectre i see him there his form and features mocking me daring me to forget handsome as apollo treacherous as apollyon he paused pointing to the pure marble pile where a violet flame seemed flickering and then with a groan bowed his head upon the railing when he spoke again his face wore an ashy hue and his stern mouth was unsteady hallowed days of my blessed boyhood ah they rise before me now like holy burning stars breaking out in a stormy howling night making the blackness blacker still my short happy springtime of life so full of noble aspirations of glowing hopes of philanthropic schemes of all charitable projects i would do so much good with my money my heart was brimming with generous impulses with warm sympathy and care for my fellow-creatures every needy sufferer should find relief at my hands as long as i possessed a dollar or a crust as i look back now at that dead self and remember all that i was all the purity of my life the nobility of my character the tenderness of my heart i do not wonder that people who knew me then predicted that i would prove an honour a blessing to my race mark you that was st elmo murray as nature fashioned him before man spoiled god's handiwork back back to your shroud and sepulchre o lazarus of my youth and when i am called to the final judgment rise for me stand in my place and confront those who slaughtered you my affection for my chum murray increased as i grew up to manhood and there was not a dream of my brain a hope of my heart which was not confided to him i reverenced i trusted i almost nay i quite worshipped him when i was only eighteen i began to love his cousin whose father was pastor of a church in new haven and whose mother was mr hammond's sister you have seen her she is beautiful even now and you can imagine how lovely agnes hunt was in her girlhood she was the belle and pet of the students and before i had known her a month i was her accepted lover i loved her with all the devotion of my chivalric ardent boyish nature and for me she professed the most profound attachment her parents favoured our wishes for an early marriage but my mother refused to sanction such an idea until i had completed my education and visited the old world i was an obedient affectionate son then and yielded respectfully but as vacation approached i prepared to come home hoping to prevail on mother to consent to my being married just before we sailed for europe the ensuing year after i left yale murray was my confidant and adviser in his sympathizing ears i poured all my fond hopes and he insisted that i ought to take my lovely bride with me it would be cruel to leave her so long and beside he was so impatient for the happy day when he should call me his cousin he declined coming home on the plea of desiring to prosecute his theological studies with his uncle mr hunt well do i recollect the parting between us i had left agnes in tears inconsolable because of my departure and i flew to murray for words of consolation when i bade him good-bye my eyes were full of tears and as he passed his arm around my shoulders i whispered murray take care of my angel agnes for me watch over and comfort her while i am away ah as i stand here to-day i hear again ringing over the ruins of the past twenty years his loving musical tones answering my dear boy trust her to my care st elmo for your dear sake i will steal time from my books to cheer her while you are absent but hurry back for you know i find black letter more attractive than blue eyes god bless you my precious friend write to me constantly since then i always shudder involuntarily when i hear parting friends bless each other for well well do i know the stinging curse coiled up in those smooth 
liquid words i came home and busied myself in the erection of this church in plans for murray's advancement in life as well as my own my importunity prevailed over my mother's sensible objections and she finally consented that i should take my bride to europe while i had informed mr hammond that i wished murray to accompany us that i would gladly pay his travelling expenses i was so anxious for him to see the east especially palestine full of happy hopes i hurried back earlier than i had intended and reached new haven very unexpectedly the night was bright with moonshine my heart was bright with hope and too eager to see agnes whose letters had breathed the most tender solicitude and attachment i rushed up the steps and was told that she was walking in the little flower garden down the path i hurried and stopped as i heard her silvery laugh blended with murray's then my name was pronounced in tones that almost petrified me under a large apple tree in the parsonage garden they sat on a wooden bench and only the tendrils and branches of an isabella grape vine divided us i stood there grasping the vine looking through the leaves at the two whom i had so idolized and saw her golden head flashing in the moonlight as she rested it on her cousin's breast heard and saw their kisses heard what wrecked blasted me i heard myself ridiculed sneered at maligned heard that i was to be a mere puppet a cat's paw that i was a doting silly fool easily hoodwinked that she found it difficult almost impossible to endure my caresses that she shuddered in my arms and flew for happiness to his i heard that from the beginning i had been duped that they had always loved each other always would but poverty stubbornly barred their marriage and she must be sacrificed to secure my fortune for the use of both all that was uttered i cannot now recapitulate but it is carefully embalmed and lies in the little taj mahal among other cherished souvenirs of my precious friendships while i stood there i was transformed the soul of st elmo seemed to pass away a fiend took possession of me love died hope with it and an insatiable thirst for vengeance set my blood on fire during those ten minutes my whole nature was warped distorted my life blasted mutilated deformed the loss of agnes's love i could have borne nay fool that i was i think my quondam generous affection for murray would have made me relinquish her almost resignedly if his happiness had demanded the sacrifice on my part if he had come to me frankly and acknowledged all my insane idolatry would have made me place her hand in his and remove the barrier of poverty and the assurance that i had secured his lifelong happiness would have sufficed for mine oh the height and depth and marvellous strength of my love for that man passes comprehension but their scorn their sneers at my weak credulity their bitter ridicule of my awkward overgrown boyishness stung me to desperation i wondered if i were insane or dreaming or the victim of some horrible delusion my veins ran fire as i listened to the tingling of her silvery voice with the rich melody of his and i turned and left the garden and walked back toward the town the moon was full but i staggered and groped my way like one blind to the college buildings i knew where a pair of pistols were kept by one of the students and possessing myself of them i wandered out on the road leading to the parsonage i was aware that murray intended coming into the town and at last i reeled into a shaded spot near the road and waited for him oh the mocking glory of that cloudless night to this day i hate the cold glitter of stars and the golden sheen of midnight moons for the first time in my life i cursed the world and all it held cursed the contented cricket singing in the grass at my feet cursed the blood in my arteries that beat so thick and fast i could not listen for the footsteps i was waiting for at last i heard him whistling a favourite tune which all our lives we had whistled together as we hunted through the woods around le bocage and as the familiar sound of the braise of balcather drew nearer and nearer i sprang up with a cry that must have rung on the night air like the yell of some beast of prey of all that passed i only know that i cursed and insulted and maddened him till he accepted the pistol which i thrust into his hand we moved ten paces apart and a couple of students who happened accidentally to pass along the road and heard our altercation stopped at our request gave the word of command and we fired simultaneously the ball entered murray's heart and he fell dead without a word i was severely wounded in the chest and now i wear the ball here in my side ah a precious in memoriam of murdered confidence until now edna had listened breathlessly with her eyes upon his 
but here a groan escaped her and she shuddered violently and hid her face in her hands mr murray came nearer stood close to her and hurried on my last memory of my old idol is as he lay with his handsome treacherous face turned up to the moon and the hair which agnes had been fingering dabbled with dew and the blood that oozed down from his side when i recovered my consciousness murray hammond had been three weeks in his grave as soon as i was able to travel my mother took me to europe and for five years we lived in paris naples or wandered to and fro then she came home and i plunged into the heart of asia after two years i returned to paris and gave myself up to every species of dissipation i drank gambled and my midnight carousals would sicken your soul were i to paint all their hideousness you have read in the scriptures of persons possessed of devils a savage mocking tearing devil held me in bondage i sold myself to my mephistopheles on condition that my revenge might be complete i hated the whole world with an intolerable murderous hate and to mock and make my race suffer was the only real pleasure i found the very name the bare mention of religion maddened me a minister's daughter a minister's son a minister himself had withered my young life and i blasphemously derided all holy things o oh, edna my darling it is impossible to paint all the awful wretchedness of that period when i walked in the world seeking victims and finding many verily there is not a crime but takes its proper change out still in crime if once rung on the counter of this world let sinners look to it ah upon how many lovely women have i visited agnes's sin of hypocrisy into how many ears have i poured tender words until fair hands were as good as offered to me and i turned their love to mockery i hated and despised all womanhood and even in paris i became notorious as a heartless trifler with the affections i won and trampled under my feet whenever a brilliant and beautiful woman crossed my path i attached myself to her train of admirers until i made her acknowledge my power and give public and unmistakable manifestation of her preference for me then i left her a target for the laughter of her circle it was not vanity oh no no that springs from self-love and i had none it was hate of everything human especially of everything feminine one of the fairest faces that ever brightened the haunts of fashion a queenly elegant girl the pet of her family and society now wears serge garments and a black veil and is immured in an italian convent because i entirely won her heart and when she waited for me to declare my affection and ask her to become my wife i quitted her side for that of another belle and never visited her again on the day when she bade adieu to the world i was among the spectators and as her mournful but lovely eyes sought mine i laughed and gloried in the desolation i had wrought sick of europe i came home and to a part i come where no light shines my tempting fiend pointed to one whose suffering would atone for much of my misery edna i withhold nothing there is much i might conceal but i scorn to do so during one terribly fatal winter scarlet fever had deprived mr hammond of four children leaving him an only daughter annie the image of her brother murray her health was feeble consumption was stretching its skeleton hands toward her and her father watched her as a gardener tends his pet choice delicate exotic she was about sixteen very pretty very attractive after murray's death i never spoke to mr hammond never crossed his path but i met his daughter without his knowledge and finally i made her confess her love for me i offered her my hand she accepted it a day was appointed for an elopement and marriage the hour came she left the parsonage but i did not meet her here on the steps of this church as i had promised and she received a note that announced my inability to fulfil the engagement two hours later her father found her insensible on the steps and the marble was dripping with a hemorrhage of blood from her lungs the dark stain is still there you must have noticed it i never saw her again she kept her room from that day and died three months after when on her deathbed she sent for me but i refused to obey the summons as i stand here i see through the window the grey granite vault overgrown with ivy and the marble slab where sleep in untimely death murray and annie hammond the victims of my insatiable revenge do you wonder that i doubted you when you said that afflicted father alan hammond had never uttered one unkind word about me mr murray pointed to a quiet corner of the churchyard but edna did not lift her face and he heard the half-smothered shuddering moan that struggled up as she listened to him he put his hands on hers but she shivered and shrank away from him End of chapter twenty two part one
chapter twenty two part two of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty two part two years passed i grew more and more savage the very power of loving seemed to have died out in my nature my mother endeavoured to drag me into society but i was surfeited sick of the world sick of my own excesses and gradually i became a recluse a surly misanthrope how often have i laughed bitterly over those words of mills yet nothing is more certain than that improvement in human affairs is wholly the work of the uncontented characters my indescribable my tormenting discontent daily belied his aphorism my mother is a woman of stern integrity of character and sincerity of purpose but she is worldly and ambitious and inordinately proud and for her religion i had lost all respect again i went abroad solely to kill time was absent two years and came back i had ransacked the world and was disgusted hopeless prematurely old a week after my return i was attacked by a very malignant fever and my life was despaired of but i exulted in the thought that at last i should find oblivion i refused all remedies and set at defiance all medical advice hoping to hasten the end but death cheated me i rose from my bed of sickness cursing the mockery realizing that indeed the good die first and they whose hearts are dry as summer dust burn to the socket some months after my recovery while i was out on a camp hunt you were brought to le bocage and the sight of you made me more vindictive than ever i believed you selfishly designing and i could not bear that you should remain under the same roof with me i hated children as i hated men and women but that day when you defied me in the park and told me i was sinful and cruel i began to notice you closely i weighed your words watched you when you little dreamed that i was present and often concealed myself in order to listen to your conversation i saw in your character traits that annoyed me because they were noble and unlike what i had believed all womanhood or girlhood to be i was aware that you dreaded and disliked me i saw that very clearly every time i had occasion to speak to you how it all came to pass i cannot tell i know not and it has always been a mystery even to me but edna after the long lapse of years of sin and reckless dissipation my heart stirred and turned to you child though you were and a strange strange invincible love for you sprang from the bitter ashes of a dead affection for agnes hunt i wondered at myself i sneered at my idiocy i cursed my mad folly and tried to believe you as unprincipled as i had found others but the singular fascination strengthened day by day finally i determined to tempt you hoping that your duplicity and deceit would wake me from the second dream into which i feared there was danger of my falling thinking that at your age curiosity was the strongest emotion i carefully arranged the interior of the taj mahal so that it would be impossible for you to open it without being discovered and putting the key in your hands i went abroad i wanted to satisfy myself that you were unworthy and believed you would betray the trust for four years i wandered restless impatient scorning myself more and more because i could not forget your sweet pure haunting face because despite my jeers i knew that i loved you at last i wrote to my mother from egypt that i should go to central persia and so i intended but one night as i sat alone smoking amid the ruins of the propylon at phylus a vision of lurbocage rose before me and your dear face looked at me from the lotus crowned columns of the ancient temple i forgot the hate i bore all mankind i forgot everything but you 
your pure calm magnificent eyes and the longing to see you my darling the yearning to look into your eyes once more took possession of me i sat there till the great golden dewless dawn of the desert fell upon egypt and then came a struggle long and desperate i laughed and swore at my folly but far down in the abysses of my distorted nature hope had kindled a little feeble flickering ray i tried to smother it but its flame clung to some crevice in my heart and would not be crushed while i debated a pigeon that dwelt somewhere in the crumbling temple fluttered down at my feet cooed softly looked in my face then perched on a mutilated red granite sphinx immediately in front of me and after a moment rose circled above me in the pure rainless air and flew westward i accepted it as an omen and started to america instead of to persia on the night of the tenth of december four years after i bade you good-bye at the park gate i was again at le bocage silently and undiscovered i stole into my own house and secreted myself behind the curtains in the library i had been there one hour when you and gordon lee came in to examine the targum oh edna how little you dreamed of the eager hungry eyes that watched you during that hour that you two sat there bending over the same book i became thoroughly convinced that while i loved you as i never expected to love any one gordon also loved you and intended if possible to make you his wife i had contrasted my worn haggard face and grayish locks with his so full of manly hope and youthful beauty and i could not doubt that any girl would prefer him to me edna my retribution began then i felt that my devil was mocking me as i had long mocked others and made me love you when it was impossible to win you then and there i was tempted to spring upon and throttle you both before he triumphantly called you his at last lee left and i escaped to my own rooms i was pacing the floor when i heard you cross the rotunda and saw the glimmer of the light you carried hoping to see you open the little taj i crawled behind the sarcophagus that holds my two mummies crouched close to the floor and peeped at you across the gilded byssus that covered them my eyes have often been told possess magnetic or mesmeric power at all events you felt my eager gaze you were restless and searched the room to discover whence that feeling of a human presence came darling were you superstitious that you avoided looking into the dark corner where the mummies lay presently you stopped in front of the little tomb and swept away the spider-web and took the key from your pocket and as you put it into the lock i almost shouted aloud in my savage triumph i absolutely panted to find lee's future wife as unworthy of confidence as i believe the remainder of her sex but you did not open it you merely drove away the spider and rubbed the marble clean with your handkerchief and held the key between your fingers then my heart seemed to stand still as i watched the light streaming over your beautiful holy face and warm crimson dress and when you put the key in your pocket and turned away my groan almost betrayed me i had taken out my watch to see the hour and in my suspense i clutched it so tightly that the gold case and the crystal within all crushed in my hand you heard the tingling sound and wondered whence it came and when you had locked the door and gone i raised one of the windows and swung myself down to the terrace do you remember that night yes mr murray her voice was tremulous and almost inaudible i had business in tennessee no matter now what or where and i went on that night after a week i returned that afternoon when i found you reading in my sitting-room still i was sceptical and not until i opened the tomb was i convinced that you had not betrayed the trust which you supposed i placed in you then as you stood beside me in all your noble purity and touching girlish beauty as you looked up half reproachfully half defiantly at me it cost me terrible effort to master myself to abstain from clasping you to my heart and telling you all that you were to me oh how i longed to take you in my arms and feed my poor famished heart with one touch of your lips i dared not look at you lest i should lose my self-control the belief that gordon was a successful rival sealed my lips on that occasion and all the dreary wretchedness of the days of suspense that followed i was a starving beggar who stood before what i coveted above everything else on earth and saw it labelled with another man's name and beyond my reach the daily sight of that emerald ring on your finger maddened me 
and you can form no adequate idea of the bitterness of feeling with which i noted my mother's earnest efforts and manoeuvres to secure for gordon lee to sell to him the little hand which her own son would have given worlds to claim in the sight of god and man continually i watched you when you least expected me i strewed infidel books where i knew you must see them i tempted you more than you dreamed of i teased and tormented and wounded you whenever an opportunity offered for i hoped to find some flaw in your character some defect in your temper some inconsistency between your professions and your practice i knew lee was not your equal and i said bitterly she is poor and unknown and will surely marry him for his money for his position as agnes would have married me but you did not and when i knew that you had positively refused his fortune i felt that a great dazzling light had broken suddenly upon my darkened life and for the first time since i parted with murray hammond tears of joy filled my eyes i ceased to struggle against my love i gave myself up to it and only asked how can i overcome her aversion to me you were the only tie that linked me with my race and for your sake i almost felt as if i could forget my hate but you shrank more and more from me and my punishment overtook me when i saw how you hated clinton alston's blood-smeared hands and with what unfeigned horror you regarded his career when you declared so vehemently that his fingers should never touch yours oh it was the fearful apprehension of losing you that made me catch your dear hands and press them to my aching heart i was stretched upon a rack that taught me the full import of isaac taylor's grim words remorse is man's dread prerogative believing that you knew all my history and that your aversion was based upon it i was too proud to show you my affection douglas manning was as much my friend as i permitted any man to be we had travelled together through arabia and with his handwriting i was familiar suspecting your literary schemes and dreading a rival in your ambition i wrote to him on the subject discovered all i wished to ascertain and requested him for my sake to reconsider and examine your manuscript he did so to oblige me and i insisted that he should treat your letters and your manuscript with such severity as to utterly crush your literary aspirations o oh, child do you see how entirely you fill my mind and heart how i scrutinize your words and actions o oh, my darling he paused and leaned over her putting his hand on her head but she shook off his touch and exclaimed but gertrude gertrude be patient and you shall know all for as god reigns above us there is no recess of my heart into which you shall not look it is perhaps needless to tell you that estelle came here to marry me for my fortune it is not agreeable to say such things of one's own cousin but to-day i deal only in truths and facts sustain me she professes to love me has absolutely avowed it more than once in days gone by whether she really loves anything but wealth and luxury i have never troubled myself to find out but my mother fancies that if estelle were my wife i might be less cynical once or twice i tried to be affectionate toward her solely to see what effect it would have upon you but i discovered that you could not easily be deceived in that direction the mask was too transparent and beside the game disgusted me i have no respect for estelle but i have a shadowy traditional reverence for the blood in her veins which forbids my flirting with her as she deserves the very devil himself brought agnes here she had married a rich old banker only a few months after murray's death and lived in ease and splendour until a short time since when her husband failed and died leaving her without a cent she knew how utterly she had blasted my life and imagined that i had never married because i still loved her with unparalleled effrontery she came here and trusting to her wonderfully preserved beauty threw herself and her daughter in my way when i heard she was at the parsonage all the old burning hate leaped up strong as ever i fancied that she was the real cause of your dislike to me and that night when the game of billiards ended i went to the parsonage for the first time since murray's death oh the ghostly thronging memories that met me at the gate trooped after me up the walk and hovered like vultures as i stood in the shadow of the trees where my idol and i had chatted and romped and shouted and whistled in the far past in the sinless bygone unobserved i stood there and looked once more after the lapse of twenty years on the face that had caused my crime and ruin i listened to her clear laugh silvery as when i heard it chiming with murray's under the apple tree on the night that branded me and drove me forth to wander like cain and i resolved if she really loved her daughter to make her suffer for all that she had inflicted on me the first time i met gertrude i could have sworn my boyhood's love was restored to me she is so entirely the image of what agnes was to possess themselves of my home and property is all that brought them here and whether as my wife or as my mother-in-law i think agnes cares little 
the first she sees is impracticable and now to make me wed gertrude is her aim like mother like daughter oh no no visit not her mother's sins on her innocent head gertrude is true and affectionate and she loves you dearly edna spoke with a great effort and the strange tones of her own voice frightened her loves me ha ha just about as tenderly as her mother did before her that they do both dearly love my purse i grant you hear me out agnes threw the girl constantly and adroitly in my way the demon here in my heart prompted revenge and above all i resolved to find out whether you were indeed as utterly indifferent to me as you seemed i know that jealousy will make a woman betray her affection sooner than any other cause and i deliberately set myself to work to make you believe that i loved that pretty cheat over yonder at the parsonage that frolicsome wax doll who would rather play with a kitten than talk to cicero who intercepts me almost daily to favour me with manifestations of devotion and shows me continually that i have only to put out my hand and take her to rule over my house and trample my heart under her pretty feet when you gave me that note of hers a week ago and looked so calmly so coolly in my face i felt as if all hope were dying in my heart for i could not believe that if you had one atom of affection for me you could be so generous so unselfish toward one whom you considered your rival that night i did not close my eyes and had almost decided to revisit south america but next morning my mother told me you were going to new york that all entreaties had failed to shake your resolution then once more a hope cheered me and i believe that i understood why you had determined to leave those whom i know you love tenderly to quit the home my mother offered you and struggle among strangers yesterday they told me you would leave on monday and i went out to seek you but you were with mr hammond as usual and instead of you i met that curse of my life agnes face to face at last with my red-lipped lamia oh it was a scene that made jubilee down in pandemonium she pled for her child's happiness ha 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 implored me most pathetically to love her gertrude as well as gertrude loved me and that my happiness would make me forget the unfortunate past she would willingly give me her daughter for she did not know how deep how lasting how deathless was my affection i had gertrude's whole heart and i was too generous to trifle with her tender love edna darling i will not tell you all she said you would blush for your sisterhood but my vengeance was complete when i declined the honour she was so eager to force upon me when i overwhelmed her with my scorn and told her that there was only one woman whom i respected or trusted only one woman upon the broad earth whom i loved only one woman who could ever be my wife and her name was edna earl his voice died away and all was still as the dead in their grassy graves the orphan's face was concealed and after a moment st elmo murray opened his arms and said in that low winning tone which so many women had found it impossible to resist come to me now my pure noble edna you whom i love as only such a man as i have shown myself to be can love no mr murray gertrude stands between us gertrude do not make me swear here in your presence do not madden me by repeating her name i tell you she is a silly child who cares no more for me than her mother did before her nothing shall stand between us i love you the god above us is my witness that i love you as i never loved any human being and i will not i swear i will not live without you you are mine and all the legions in hell shall not part us he stooped snatched her from the chair as if she had been an infant and folded her in his strong arms mr murray i know she loves you my poor little trusting friend you trifled with her warm heart as you hope to trifle with mine but i know you you have shown me how utterly heartless remorseless unprincipled you are you had no right to punish gertrude for her mother's sins and if you had one spark of honour in your nature you would marry her and try to atone for the injury you have already done by pretending to give her a heart which belongs entirely to you if i wished to deceive you now think you i would have told all that hideous past which you cannot abhor one half as much as i do your heart is not mine it belongs to sin or you could not have so maliciously deceived poor gertrude you love nothing but your ignoble revenge and the gratification of your self-love you take care do not rouse me be reasonable little darling you doubt my love well i ought not to wonder at your scepticism after all you have heard but you can feel how my heart throbs against your cheek and if you will look into my eyes you will be convinced that i am fearfully in earnest when i beg you to be my wife to-morrow to-day now if you will only let me send for a minister or a magistrate you are you ask annie to be your wife and hush hush look at me edna raise your head and look at me she tried to break away and finding it impossible pressed both hands over her face and hid it against his shoulder he laughed and whispered my darling i know what that means 
you dare not look up because you cannot trust your own eyes because you dread for me to see something there which you want to hide which you think it your duty to conceal he felt a long shudder creep over her and she answered resolutely do you think sir that i could love a murderer a man whose hands are red with the blood of the son of my best friend look at me then he raised her head drew down her hands took them firmly in one of his and placing the other under her chin lifted the burning face close to his own she dreaded the power of his lustrous mesmeric eyes and instantly her long silky lashes swept her flushed cheeks ah you dare not you cannot look me steadily in the eye and say st elmo i never have loved do not and never can love you you are too truthful your lips cannot dissemble i know you do not want to love me your reason your conscience forbid it you are struggling to crush your heart you think it your duty to despise and hate me but my own edna my darling my darling you do love me you know you do love me though you will not confess it my proud darling he drew the face tenderly to his own and kissed her quivering lips repeatedly and at last a moan of anguish told how she was wrestling with her heart do you think you can hide your love from my eager eyes oh i know that i am unworthy of you i feel it more and more every day every hour it is because you seem so noble so holy to my eyes that i reverence while i love you you are so far above all other women so glorified in your pure consistent piety that you only have the power to make my future life redeemed the wretched and sinful past i tempted and tried you and when you proved so true and honest and womanly you kindled a faint beam of hope that after all there might be truth in saving purifying power in religion do you know that since this church was finished i have never entered it until a month ago when i followed you here and crouched downstairs yonder behind one of the pillars and heard your sacred songs your hymns so full of grandeur so full of pathos that i could not keep back my tears while i listened since then i have come every saturday afternoon and during the hour spent here my unholy nature was touched and softened as no sermon ever touched it oh you wield a power over me over all my future which ought to make you tremble the first generous impulse that has stirred my callous bitter soul since i was a boy i owe to you i went first to see poor reed in order to discover what took you so often to that cheerless place and my interest in little hulda arose from the fact that you loved the child oh my darling i know i have been sinful and cruel and blasphemous but it is not too late for me to atone it is not too late for me to do some good in the world and if you will only love me and trust me and help me his voice faltered his tears fell upon her forehead and stooping he kissed her lips softly reverently as if he realized the presence of something sacred my precious edna no oath shall ever soil my lips again the touch of yours has purified them i have been mad i think for many many years and i loathe my past life but remember how sorely i was tried and be merciful when you judge me with your dear little hand in mine to lead me i will make amends for the ruin and suffering i have wrought and my edna my own wife shall save me before the orphan's mental vision rose the picture of gertrude the trembling coral mouth the childish wistful eyes the lovely head nestled down so often and so lovingly on her shoulder and she saw too the bent figure and white locks of her beloved pastor as he sat in his old age in his childless desolate home facing the graves of his murdered children oh mr murray you cannot atone you cannot call your victims from their tombs you cannot undo what you have done what amends can you make to mr hammond and to my poor little confiding gertrude i cannot help you i cannot save you hush you can you shall do you think i will ever give you up have mercy on my lonely life my wretched darkened soul lean your dear head here on my heart and say st elmo what a wife can do to save her erring sinful husband i will do for you if i am ever to be saved you you only can effect my redemption for i trust i reverence you edna as you value my soul my eternal welfare give yourself to me give your pure sinless life to purify mine with a sudden bound she sprang from his embrace and lifted her arms toward the christ who seemed to shudder as the flickering light of fading day fell through waving foliage upon it look yonder to jesus bleeding only his blood can wash away your guilt mr murray i can never be your wife i have no confidence in you knowing how systematically you have deceived others how devoid of conscientious scruples you are i should never be sure that i too was not the victim of your heartless cynicism beside i hush hush to your keeping i commit my conscience and my heart no no i am no vice-regent of an outraged and insulted god i put no faith in any man whose conscience another keeps from the species of fascination which you exert i shrink with unconquerable dread and aversion and would almost as soon entertain the thought of marrying lucifer himself 
oh your perverted nature shocks repels astonishes grieves me i can neither respect nor trust you mr murray have mercy upon yourself go yonder to jesus he only can save and purify you edna you do not you cannot intend to leave me darling he held out his arms and moved toward her but she sprang past him down the steps of the gallery out of the church and paused only at sight of the dark dull spot on the white steps where annie hammond had lain insensible an hour later st elmo murray raised his face from the mahogany railing where it had rested since edna left him and looked around the noble pile which his munificence had erected a full moon eyed him pityingly through the stained glass and the gleam of the marble pulpit was chill and ghostly and in that weird light the christ was threatening wrathful appalling as st elmo stood there alone confronting the picture confronting the past memory like the witch of endor called up visions of the departed that were more terrible than the mantled form of israel's prophet and the proud hopeless man bowed his haughty head with a cry of anguish that rose mournfully to the vaulted ceiling of the sanctuary it went up single echoless my god i am forsaken end of chapter twenty two part two chapter twenty three of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty three the weather was so inclement on the following day that no service was held in the church but notwithstanding the heavy rain edna went to the parsonage to bid adieu to her pastor and teacher when she ascended the steps mr hammond was walking up and down the portico with his hands clasped behind him as was his habit when engrossed in earnest thought and he greeted his pupil with a degree of mournful tenderness very soothing to her sad heart leading the way to his study where mrs powell sat with an open book on her lap he said gently agnes will you be so kind as to leave us for a while this is the last interview i shall have with edna for a long time perhaps for ever and there are some things i wish to say to her alone you will find a better light in the dining-room where all is quiet as mrs powell withdrew he locked the door and for some seconds paced the floor then taking a seat on the chintz-covered lounge beside his pupil he said eagerly st elmo was at the church yesterday afternoon are you willing to tell me what passed between you mr hammond he told me his melancholy history i know all now know why he shrinks from meeting you whom he has injured so cruelly know all his guilt and your desolation the old man bowed his white head on his bosom and there was a painful silence when he spoke his voice was scarcely audible the punishment of eli has fallen heavily upon me and there have been hours when i thought that it was greater than i could bear that it would utterly crush me but the bitterness of the curse has passed away and i can say truly of the meekest angel of god the angel of patience he walks with thee that angel kind and gently whispers be resigned bear up bear on the end shall tell the dear lord ordereth all things well i tried to train up my children in the fear and admonition of the lord but i must have failed signally in my duty though i have never been able to discover in what respect i was negligent one of the sins of my life was my inordinate pride in my only boy my gifted gifted handsome son my love for murray was almost idolatrous and when my heart throbbed with proudest hopes and aspirations my idol was broken and laid low in the dust and like david mourning for his rebellious child absalom i cried out in my affliction my son my son would god i had died for thee murray hammond was my precious diadem of earthly glory and suddenly i found myself uncrowned and sackcloth and ashes were my portion why did you never confide these sorrows to me did you doubt 
my earnest sympathy no my child but i thought it best that saint elmo should lift the veil and show you all that he wished you to know i felt assured that the time would come when he considered it due to himself to acquaint you with his sad history and when i saw him go into the church yesterday i knew that the hour had arrived i did not wish to prejudice you against him for i believe that through your agency the prayers of twenty years would be answered and that his wandering embittered heart would follow you to that cross before which he bowed in his boyhood and it was through my son's sin and duplicity that st elmo's noble career was blasted and his most admirable character perverted and i have hoped and believed that through your influence my beloved pupil he would be redeemed from his reckless course my dear little edna you are very lovely and winning and i believe he would love you as he never loved any one else oh i have hoped everything from your influence far far beyond all computation is the good which a pious consistent christian wife can accomplish in the heart of a husband who truly loves her oh mr hammond you pain and astonish me surely you would not be willing to see me marry a man who scoffs at the very name of religion who wilfully deceives and trifles with the feelings of all who are sufficiently credulous to trust his hollow professions whose hands are red with the blood of your children what hope of happiness or peace could you indulge for me in view of such a union i should merit all the wretchedness that would inevitably be my life long portion if knowing his crimes i could consent to link my future with his he would not deceive you my child if you knew him as well as i do if you could realize all that he was before his tender loving heart was stabbed by the two whom he almost adored you would judge him more leniently edna if i whom he has robbed of all that made life beautiful if i standing here in my lonely old age in sight of the graves of my murdered darlings if i can forgive him and pray for him and as god is my witness love him you have no right to visit my injuries and my sorrows upon him edna looked in amazement at his troubled earnest countenance and exclaimed oh if he knew all your noble charity your unparalleled magnanimity surely surely your influence would be his salvation his stubborn bitter heart would be melted but sir i should have a right to expect annie's sad fate if i could forget her sufferings and her wrongs mr hammond rose and walked to the window and after a time when he resumed his seat his eyes were full of tears and his wrinkled face was strangely pallid my darling annie my sweet fragile flower my precious little daughter so like her sainted mother ah it is not surprising that she could not resist his fascinations but edna he never loved my pet lamb do you know that you have become almost as dear to me as my own dead child she deceived me she was willing to forsake her father in his old age but through long years you have never once betrayed my perfect confidence the old man put his thin hand on the orphan's head and turned the countenance toward him my dear little girl you will not think me impertinently curious when i ask you a question which my sincere affection for an interest in you certainly sanction do you love st elmo mr hammond it is not love for esteem respect confidence belong to love but i cannot deny that he exerts a very singular a wicked fascination over me i dread his evil influence i avoid his presence and know that he is utterly unworthy of any woman's trust and yet and yet oh sir i feel that i am very weak and i fear that i am unwomanly but i cannot despise i cannot hate him as i ought to do is not this feeling on your part one of the causes that hurry you away to new york that is certainly one of the reasons why i am anxious to go away as early as possible oh mr hammond much as i love much as i owe you and mrs murray 
i sometimes wish that i had never come here never seen le bocage and the mocking jeering man who owns it try to believe that somehow in the mysterious divine economy it is all for the best in reviewing the apparently accidental circumstances that placed you among us i have thought that because this was your appointed field of labour god in his wisdom brought you where he designed you to work does mrs murray know that her son offered to make you his wife no no i hope she never will for it would mortify her exceedingly to know that he could be willing to give his proud name to one of whose lineage she is so ignorant how did you know it i knew what his errand must be when he forced himself to visit a spot so fraught with painful memories as my church edna i shall not urge you but ponder well the step you are taking for st elmo's future will be coloured by your decision i have an abiding and comforting faith that he will yet lift himself out of the abyss of sinful dissipation and scoffing scepticism and your hand would aid him as none other human can mr hammond it seems incredible that you can plead for him oh do not tempt me do not make me believe that i could restore his purity of faith and life do not tell me that it would be right to give my hand to a blasphemous murderer oh my own heart is weak enough already i know that i am right in my estimate of his unscrupulous character and i am neither so vain nor so blind as to imagine that my feeble efforts could accomplish for him would all your noble magnanimity and patient endeavours have entirely failed to effect if he can obstinately resist the influence of your life he would laugh mine to scorn it is hard enough for me to leave him when i feel that duty demands it oh my dear mr hammond do not attempt to take from me the only staff which can carry me firmly away do not make my trial even more severe i must not see his face for i will not be his wife instead of weakening my resolution by holding out flattering hopes of reforming him pray for me oh pray for me that i may be strengthened to flee from a great temptation i will marry no man who is not an earnest humble believer in the religion of our lord jesus christ rather than become the wife of a sacrilegious scoffer such as i know mr murray to be i will so help me god live and work alone and go down to my grave edna earl the minister sighed heavily bear one thing in mind it has been said that in disavowing guardianship we sometimes slaughter abel you cannot understand my interest in st elmo remember that if his wretched soul is lost at last it will be required at the hands of my son in that dread day dies irae dies illa when we shall stand at the final judgment do you wonder that i struggle in prayer in an all-possible human endeavour to rescue him from ruin so that when i am called from earth i can meet the spirit of my only boy with the blessed tidings that the soul he jeopardized and well nigh wrecked has been redeemed is safe anchored once more in the faith of christ but i will say no more your own heart and conscience must guide you in this matter i would pour a flood of glorious sunshine upon my sad and anxious heart as i go down to my grave if i could know that you whose life and character i have in great degree moulded were instrumental in saving one whom i have loved so long so well and under such afflicting circumstances as my poor saint elmo to the mercy of his maker and the intercession of his saviour i commit him as for me i go my way onward upward a short silence ensued and at last edna rose to say good-bye do you still intend to leave at four o'clock in the morning i fear you will have bad weather for your journey yes sir i shall certainly start to-morrow and now i must leave you oh my best friend how can i tell you good-bye the minister folded her in his trembling arms and his silver locks mingled with her black hair while he solemnly blessed her she sobbed as he pressed his lips to her forehead and gently put her from him and turning she hurried away anxious to escape the sight of gertrude's accusing face for she supposed that mrs powell had repeated to her daughter mr murray's taunting words since the previous evening she had not spoken to st elmo who did not appear at breakfast but when she passed him in the hall an hour later he was talking to his mother 
and took no notice of her bow now as the carriage approached the house she glanced in the direction of his apartment and saw him sitting at the window with his elbow resting on the sill and his cheek on his hand she went at once to mrs murray and the interview was long and painful the latter wept freely and insisted that if the orphan grew weary of teaching as she knew would happen she should come back immediately to le bocage where a home would always be hers and to which a true friend would welcome her at length when estelle harding came in with some letters which she wished to submit to her aunt's inspection edna retreated to her own quiet room she went to her bureau to complete the packing of her clothes and found on the marble slab a box and note directed to her mr murray's handwriting was remarkably graceful and edna broke the seal which bore his motto nemo me impune la cassette edna i send for your examination the contents of the little tomb which you guarded so faithfully read the letters written before i was betrayed the locket attached to a ribbon which was always worn over my heart and the miniatures which it contains are those of agnes hunt and murray hammond read all the record and then judge me as you hope to be judged i sit alone amid the mouldering blackened ruins of my youth will you not listen to the prayer of my heart and the half-smothered pleadings of your own and come to me in my desolation and help me to build up a new and noble life oh my darling you can make me what you will while you read and ponder i am praying i praying for the first time in twenty years praying that if god ever hears prayer he will influence your decision and bring you to me edna my darling i wait for you your own saint elmo ah how her tortured heart writhed and bled how piteously it pleaded for him and for itself edna opened the locket and if gertrude had stepped into the golden frame the likeness could not have been more startling she looked at it until her lips blanched and were tightly compressed and the memory of gertrude became paramount murray hammond's face she barely glanced at and its extraordinary beauty stared at her like that of some avenging angel with a shudder she put it away and turned to the letters that st elmo had written to agnes and to murray in the early happy days of his engagement tender beautiful loving letters that breathed the most devoted attachment and the purest piety letters that were full of lofty aspirations and religious fervour and generous schemes for the assistance and enlightenment of the poor about leur bocage and especially for my noble matchless murray among the papers were several designs for charitable buildings a house of industry an asylum for the blind and a free schoolhouse in an exquisite ivory casket containing a splendid set of diamonds and the costly betrothal ring bearing the initials edna found a sheet of paper around which the blazing necklace was twisted disengaging it she saw that it was a narration of all that had stung him to desperation on the night of the murder as she read the burning taunts the insults the ridicule heaped by the two under the apple tree upon the fond faithful generous absent friend she felt the indignant blood gush into her face but she read on and on and two hours elapsed ere she finished the package then came a trial a long fierce agonizing trial such as few women have ever been called upon to pass through such as the world believes no woman ever triumphantly endured girded by prayer the girl went down resolutely into the flames of the furnace and the ordeal was terrible indeed but as often as love showed her the figure of mr murray alone in his dreary sitting-room waiting watching for her she turned and asked of duty the portrait of gertrude's sweet anxious face the picture of dying annie the mournful countenance of a man shut up by iron bars from god's beautiful world from the home and the family who had fondly cherished her in her happy girlhood ere st elmo trailed his poison across her sunny path after another hour the orphan went to her desk and while she wrote a pale cold rigidity settled upon her features which told that she was calmly deliberately shaking hands with the expelled the departing hagar of her heart's hope and happiness to the mercy of god and the love of christ and the judgment of your own conscience i commit you henceforth we walk different paths and after to-night it is my wish that we meet no more on earth mr murray i cannot lift up your darkened soul and you would only drag mine down for your final salvation i shall never cease to pray till we stand face to face before the bar of god edna earl
ringing for a servant she sent back the box and even his own note which she longed to keep but would not trust herself to see again and dreading reflection and too miserable to sleep she went to mrs murray's room and remained with her till three o'clock then mr murray's voice rang through the house calling for the carriage and as edna put on her bonnet and shawl he knocked at his mother's door it is raining very hard and you must not think of going to the train as you intended but my son the carriage is close and i cannot permit you to expose yourself so unnecessarily and in short i will not take you so there is an end of it of course i can stand the weather and i will go over with edna and put her under the care of some one on the train as soon as possible send her down to the carriage i shall order her trunks strapped on he was very pale and stern and his voice rang coldly clear as he turned and went downstairs the parting was very painful and mrs murray followed the orphan to the front door st elmo i wish you would let me go i do not mind the rain impossible you know i have an unconquerable horror of scenes and i do not at all fancy witnessing one that threatens to last until the train leaves go upstairs and cry yourself to sleep in ten minutes that will be much more sensible come edna are you ready the orphan was folded in a last embrace and mr murray held out his hand drew her from his mother's arms and taking his seat beside her in the carriage ordered the coachman to drive on the night was very dark the wind sobbed down the avenue and the rain fell in such torrents that as edna leaned out for a last look at the stately mansion which she had learned to love so well she could only discern the outline of the bronze monsters by the glimmer of the light burning in the hall she shrank far back in one corner and her fingers clutched each other convulsively but when they had passed through the gate and entered the main road mr murray's hand was laid on hers the cold fingers were unlocked gently but firmly and raised to his lips she made an effort to withdraw them but found it useless and the trial which she had fancies was at an end seemed only beginning edna this is the last time i shall ever speak to you of myself the last time i shall ever allude to all that has passed it is entirely useless for one to ask you to reconsider if you have no pity for me have some mercy on yourself you cannot know how i dread the thought of your leaving me and being roughly handled by a cold selfish ruthless world oh it maddens me when i think of your giving your precious life which would so glorify my home and gladden my desolate heart to a public who will trample upon you if possible and if it cannot entirely crush you will only value you as you deserve when with ruined health and withered hopes you sink into the early grave malice and envy will have dug for you already your dear face has grown pale and your eyes have a restless troubled look and shadows are gathering about your young pure fresh spirit my darling you are not strong enough to wrestle with the world you will be trodden down by the masses in this conflict upon which you enter so eagerly do you not know that literati means literally the branded the lettered slave oh if not for my sake at least for your own reconsider before the hot irons sear your brow and hide it here my love keep it white and pure and unfurrowed here in the arms that will never weary of sheltering and clasping ye close and safe from the burning brand of fame literati a bondage worse than roman slavery help me to make a proper use of my fortune and you will do more real good to your race than by all you can ever accomplish with your pen no matter how successful it may prove if you were selfish and heartless as other women adulation and celebrity and the praise of the public might satisfy you but you are not and i have studied your nature too thoroughly to mistake the result of your ambitious career my darling ambition is the mirage of the literary desert you are anxious to traverse it is the bar shaitan the satan's water which will ever recede and mock your thirsty toil-spent soul dear little pilgrim do not scorch your feet and wear out your life in the hot blinding sands struggling in vain for the constantly fading vanishing oasis of happy literary celebrity ah the sahara of letters is full of bleaching bones that tell where many of your sex as well as of mine fell and perished miserably even before the noon of life ambitious spirit come rest in peace in the cool quiet happy palm grove that i offer you my shrinking violet sweeter than all pistum boasts you cannot cope successfully with the world of selfish men and frivolous heartless women of whom you know absolutely nothing to-day i found a passage which you had marked in one of my books and it echoes ceaselessly in my heart my future will not copy fair my past i wrote that once 
and thinking at my side my ministering life angel justified the word by his appealing look upcast to the white throne of god i turned at last and there instead saw thee not unallied two angels in thy soul then i long tired by natural ills received the comfort fast while budding at thy sight my pilgrim's staff gave out green leaves with morning dews impearled i seek no copy of life's first half leave here the pages with long musing curled write me new my future's epigraph new angel mine unhoped for in the world he had passed his arm around her and drawn her close to his side and the pleading tenderness of his low voice was indeed hard to resist no mr murray my decision is unalterable if you do really love me spare me spare me further entreaty before we part there are some things i should like to say and have little time left will you hear me he did not answer but tightened his arm drew her head to his bosom and leaned his face down on hers mr murray i want to leave my bible with you because there are many passages marked which would greatly comfort and help you it is the most precious thing i possess for grandpa gave it to me when i was a little girl and i could not bear to leave it with any one but you i have it here in my hand will you look into it sometimes if i give it to you he merely put out his hand and took it from her she paused a few seconds and as he remained silent she continued mr hammond is the best friend you have on earth yesterday having seen you enter the church and suspecting what passed he spoke to me of you and oh he pleaded for you as only he could he urged me not to judge you too harshly not to leave you and these were his words edna if i whom he has robbed of all that life made beautiful if i standing here alone in my old age in sight of the graves of my murdered darlings if i can forgive him and pray for him and as god is my witness love him you have no right to visit my injuries and my sorrows upon him mr murray he can help you and he will if you will only permit him if you could realize how dearly he is interested in your happiness you could not fail to reverence that religion which enables him to triumph over all the natural feelings of resentment mr murray you have declared again and again that you love me oh if it be true meet me in heaven i know that i am weak and sinful but i am trying to correct the faults of my character i am striving to do what i believe to be my duty and i hope at last to find a home with my god for several years ever since you went abroad i have been praying for you and while i live i shall not cease to do so oh will you not pray for yourself mr murray i believe i shall not be happy even in heaven if i do not see you there on earth we are parted your crimes divide us but there there oh for my sake make an effort to redeem yourself and meet me there she felt his strong frame tremble and a heavy shuddering sigh broke from his lips and swept across her cheek but when he spoke his words contained no hint of the promise she longed to receive edna my shadow has fallen across your heart and i am not afraid that you will forget me you will try to do so you will give me as little thought as possible you will struggle to crush your aching heart and endeavour to be famous but amid your ovations the memory of a lonely man who loves you infinitely better than all the world for which you forsook him will come like a breath from the sepulchre to wither your bays and my words my pleading words will haunt you rising above the paeans of your public worshippers when the laurel crown you covet now shall become a chaplet of thorns piercing your temples or a band of iron that makes your brow ache you will think mournfully of the days gone by when i prayed for the privilege of resting your weary head here on my heart you cannot forget me sinful and unworthy as i confess myself i am conqueror i triumph now even though you never permit me to look upon your face again for i believe i have a place in my darling's heart which no other man which not the whole world can usurp or fill you are too proud to acknowledge it too truthful to deny it but my pure pearl my heart feels it as well as yours and it is a comfort of which all time cannot rob me without it how could i face my future so desolate sombre lonely edna the hour has come when in accordance with your own decree we part for twenty years no woman's lips except my mother's have touched mine until yesterday when they pressed yours perhaps we may never meet again in this world and ah do not shrink away from me i want to kiss you once more my darling my darling i shall wear it on my lips till death stiffens them and i am not at all afraid that any other man will ever be allowed to touch lips that belong to me alone that i have made and here seal all my own good-bye he strained her to him and pressed his lips twice to hers then the carriage stopped at the railroad station he handed her out found a seat for her in the cars 
which had just arrived arranged her wrappings comfortably and went back to attend to her trunks she sat near an open window and though it rained heavily he buttoned his coat to the throat and stood just beneath it with his eyes bent down twice she pronounced his name but he did not seem to hear her and edna put her hand lightly on his shoulder and said do not stand here in the rain in a few minutes we shall start and i prefer that you should not wait please go home at once mr murray he shook his head but caught her hand and leaned his cheek against the soft palm passing it gently and caressingly over his haggard face the engine whistled mr murray pressed a long warm kiss on the hand he had taken the cars moved on and as he lifted his hat giving her one of his imperial graceful bows edna had a last glimpse of the dark chiselled repulsive yet handsome face that had thrown its baleful image deep in her young heart and defied all her efforts to expel it the wind howled around the cars the rain fell heavily beating a dismal tattoo on the glass the night was mournfully dreary and the orphan sank back and lowered her veil and hid her face in her hands henceforth she felt that in obedience to her own decision and fiat they stood aloof the scars remaining like cliffs that had been rent asunder a dreary sea now flows between but neither heat nor frost nor thunder shall wholly do away i ween the marks of that which once hath been end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty four as day dawned the drab clouds blanched broke up in marbled masses the rain ceased the wind sang out of the west heralding the coming blue and gold and at noon not one pearly vapour sail dotted the sky during the afternoon edna looked anxiously for the first glimpse of lookout but a trifling accident detained the train for several hours and it was almost twilight when she saw it a purple spot staining the clear barrel horizon spreading rapidly shifting its tyrian mantle for gray robes and at length the rising moon silvered its rocky crest as it towered in silent majesty over the little village nestled at its base the kind and gentlemanly conductor on the cars accompanied edna to the hotel and gave her a parcel containing several late papers as she sat in her small room weary and yet sleepless she tried to divert her thoughts by reading the journals and found in three of them notices of the last number of such magazine and a special mention of her essay keeping the vigil of st martin under the pines of grutley the extravagant laudations of this article surprised her and she saw that while much curiosity was indulged concerning the authorship one of the editors ventured to attribute it to a celebrated and very able writer whose genius and erudition had lifted him to an enviable eminence in the world of american letters the criticisms were excessively flattering and the young author gratified at the complete success that had crowned her efforts cut out the friendly notices intending to enclose them in a letter to mrs murray unable to sleep giving audience to memories of her early childhood she passed the night at her window watching the constellations go down behind the dark frowning mass of rock that lifted its parapets to the midnight sky and in the morning light saw the cold misty cowl drawn over the venerable hoary head the village had changed so materially that she could scarcely recognize any of the old landmarks and the people who kept the hotel could tell her nothing about peter wood the miller after breakfast she took a box containing some flowers packed in wet cotton and walked out on the road leading in the direction of the blacksmith's shop very soon the trees became familiar she remembered every turn of the road and bend on the fences and at last the grove of oak and chestnut shading the knoll at the intersection of the roads met her eye she looked for the forge and bellows for the anvil and slack tub but shop and shed had fallen to decay and only a heap of rubbish overgrown with rank weeds and vines marked the spot where she had spent so many happy hours 
the glowing yellow chestnut leaves dropped down in her feet and the oaks tossed their gnarled arms as if welcoming the wanderer whose head they had shaded in infancy and stifling a moan the orphan hurried on she saw that the timber had been cut down and fences enclosed cultivated fields where forests had stood when she went away at a sudden bend in the narrow irregular road when she held her breath and leaned forward to see the old house where she was born and reared a sharp cry of pain escaped her not a vestige of the homestead remained save the rocky chimney standing in memoriam in the centre of a cornfield she leaned against the low fence and tears trickled down her cheeks as memory rebuilt the log house and placed the split-bottomed rocking-chair on the porch in front and filled it with the figure of a white-haired old man with his pipe in his hand and his blurred eyes staring at the moon through the brown cornstalk she could see the gaping mouth of the well now partly filled with rubbish and the wreaths of scarlet cypress which once fringed the shed above it and hung their flaming trumpets down until they almost touched her childish head as she sang at the well where she scoured the cedar piggin where bereft of all support and trailed helplessly over the ground close to the fence and beyond the reach of plough and hoe a yellow four o'clock with closed flowers marked the location of the little garden and one tall larkspur leaned against the fence sole survivor of the blue pets that edna had loved so well in the early years she put her fingers through a crevice broke the plumy spray and as she pressed it to her face she dropped her head upon the rails and gave herself up to the flood of painful yet inexpressibly precious memories how carefully she had worked and weeded this little plat how proud she once was of her rosemary and pinks her double feathery poppies her sweet-scented lemon-grass how eagerly she had transplanted wood violets and purple flocks from the forest how often she had sat on the steps watching for her grandfather's return and stringing those four o'clock blossoms into golden crowns for her own young head and how gaily she had sometimes swung them over brindle's horns when she went out to milk her ah sad and strange as in dark summer dawns the earliest pipe of half-awakened birds to dying ears when unto dying eyes the casement slowly grows a glimmering square so sad so strange the days that are no more with a sob she turned away and walked in the direction of the burying ground for there certainly she would find all unchanged graves at least were permanent the little spring bubbled as of yore the brush creepers made a tangled tapestry around it and crimson and blue convolvulus swung their velvety dew beaded chalices above it as on that june morning long ago when she stood there filling her bucket waiting for the sunrise she took off her gloves knelt down beside the spring and dipping up the cold sparkling water in her palms drank and wept and drank again she bathed her aching eyes and almost cheated herself into the belief that she heard again grip's fierce bark ringing through the woods and the slow drowsy tinkle of brindle's bell turning aside from the beaten track she entered the thick grove of chestnuts and looked around for the grave of the dents but the mound had disappeared and though she recognized the particular tree which had formerly overhung it and searched the ground carefully she could discover no trace of the hillock where she had so often scattered flowers a squirrel leaped and frisked in the boughs above her and she startled a rabbit from the thick grass and fallen yellow leaves but neither these nor the twitter of gossiping orioles nor the harsh hungry cry of a bluebird told her a syllable of all that had happened in her absence she conjectured that the bodies had probably been disinterred by friends and removed to georgia and she hurried on toward the hillside where the neighborhood graveyard was situated the rude unpainted paling still enclosed it and rows of headboards stretched away among grass and weeds but whose was that shining marble shaft standing in the centre of a neatly arranged square around which ran a handsome iron railing on that very spot in years gone by had stood a piece of pine board sacred to the memory of aaron hunt an honest blacksmith and true christian who had dared to disturb his bones to violate his last resting-place and to steal his grave for the interment of some wealthy stranger a cry of horror and astonishment broke from the orphan's trembling lips 
and she shaded her eyes with her hand and tried to read the name inscribed on the monument of the sacrilegious interloper but bitter scalding tears of indignation blinded her she dashed them away but they gathered and fell faster and unbolting the gate she entered the enclosure and stepped close to the marble erected in honour of aaron hunt by his devoted granddaughter these gilded words were traced on the polished surface of the pure white obelisk and on each corner of the square pedestal or base stood beautifully carved vases from which drooped glossy tendrils of ivy as edna looked in amazement at the glittering shaft which rose twenty feet in the autumn air as she rubbed her eyes and re-read the golden inscription and looked at the sanded walks and the well-trimmed evergreens which told that careful hands kept the lot in order she sank down at the base of the beautiful monument and laid her hot cheek on the cold marble oh grandpa grandpa he is not altogether wicked and callous as we once thought him or he could never have done this forgive your poor little pearl if she cannot help loving one who for her sake honours your dear name and memory oh grandpa if i had never gone away from here if i could have died before i saw him again before this great pain fell upon my heart she knew now where st elmo murray went that night after he had watched her from behind the sarcophagus and the mummies knew that only his hand could have erected this noble pillar of record and most fully did she appreciate the delicate feeling which made him so proudly reticent on this subject he wished no element of gratitude in the love he had endeavoured to win and scorned to take advantage of her devoted affection for her grandfather by touching her heart with a knowledge of the tribute paid to his memory until this moment she had sternly refused to permit herself to believe all his protestations of love had tried to think that he merely desired to make her acknowledge his power and confess an affection flattering to his vanity but to-day she felt that all he had avowed was true that his proud bitter heart was indeed entirely hers that this assurance filled her own heart with a measureless joy a rapture that made her eyes sparkle through their tears and brought a momentary glow to her cheeks hour after hour passed she took no note of time and sat there pondering her past life thinking how the dusty heart deep under the marble would have throbbed with fond pride if it could only have known what the world said of her writings that she should prove competent to teach the neighbour's children had been aaron hunt's loftiest ambition for his darling and now she was deemed worthy to speak to her race through the columns of a periodical that few women were considered able to fill she wondered if he were not really cognizant of it all if he were not watching her struggles and her triumph and she asked herself why he was not allowed in token of tender sympathy to drop one palm-leaf on her head from the fadeless branch he waved in heaven oh how far how far and safe god dost thou keep thy saints when once gone from us we may call against the lighted windows of thy fair june heaven where all the souls are happy and not one not even my father look from work or play to ask who is it that cries after us below there in the dark the shaft threw a long slanting shadow eastward as the orphan rose and taking from the box the fragrant exotics which she had brought from le bocage arranged them in the damp soil of one of the vases and twined their bright-hued petals among the dark green ivy leaves one shining wreath she broke and laid away tenderly in the box a hallowed souvenir of the sacred spot where it grew and as she stood there looking at a garland of poppy leaves chiselled around the inscription neither flush nor tremor told aught that passed in her mind and her sculptured features were calm as the afternoon sun showed how pale and fixed her face had grown she climbed upon the broad base and pressed her lips to her grandfather's name and there was a mournful sweetness in her voice as she said aloud pray god to pardon him grandpa pray christ to comfort and save his precious soul o oh, grandpa pray the holy spirit to melt and sanctify his suffering heart 
it was painful to quit the place she lingered and started away and came back and at last knelt down and hid her face and prayed long and silently then turning quickly she closed the iron gate and without trusting herself to another look walked away she passed the spring and the homestead ruins and finally found herself in sight of the miller's house which alone seemed unchanged as she lifted the latch of the gate and entered the yard it seemed but yesterday that she was driven away to the depot in the miller's covered cart an ancient apple tree that she well remembered stood near the house and the spreading branches were bent almost to the earth with the weight of red streaked apples round and ripe the shaggy black dog that so often frolicked with grip in the days gone by now lay on the step blinking at the sun and the flies that now and then buzzed over the golden balsam whose crimson sea glowed in the evening sunshine over the rocky well rose a rude arbor where a scuppernong vine clambered and hung its rich luscious brown clusters and here with a pipe between her lips and at her feet a basket full of red pepper pods which she was busily engaged in stringing sat an elderly woman she was clad in blue and yellow plaid homespun and wore a white apron and a snowy muslin cap whose crimped ruffles pressed caressingly the grizzled hair combed so smoothly over her temples presently she laid her pipe down on the top of the mossy well where the dripping bucket sat and lifted the scarlet wreath of peppers eyed it satisfactorily and as she resumed her work began to hum old lang syne should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind should old acquaintance be forgot and days old lang syne the countenance was so peaceful and earnest and honest that as edna stood watching it a warm loving light came into her own beautiful eyes and she put out both hands unconsciously and stepped into the little arbor her shadow fell upon the matronly face and the woman rose and curtsied good evening miss will you be seated there is room enough for two on my bench the orphan did not speak for a moment but looked up in the brown wrinkled face and then pushing back her bonnet and veil she said eagerly mrs wood don't you know me the miller's wife looked curiously at her visitor glanced at her dress and shook her head no miss if ever i set my eyes on you before it's more than i remember and dorothy wood has a powerful memory they say and seldom forgets faces do you remember aaron hunt and his daughter hester to be sure i do but you ain't neither the one nor the other i take it stop let me see aha tabitha willis you children run here quick but no it can't be you can't be edna earl she shaded her eyes from the glare of the sun and stooped forward and looked searchingly at the stranger then the coral wreath fell from her fingers she stretched out her arms and the large mouth trembled and twitched are you can you be little edna aaron hunt's grandchild i am the poor little edna you took such tender care of in her great affliction samson and the philistines little edna so you are what was i thinking about that i didn't know you right away god bless your pretty white face she caught the orphan in her strong arms and kissed her and cried and laughed alternately a young girl apparently about edna's age and a tall lank young man with yellow hair full of meal dust came out of the house and looked on in stupid wonder why children don't you know little edna that lived at aaron hunt's his granddaughter this is my tabitha and my son willis that tends the mill and takes care of us now my poor peter god rest his soul is dead and buried these three years bring some seats willis sit down here by me edna and take off your bonnet child and let me see you huh huh who'd have thought it what a powerful handsome woman you have made to be sure to be sure well well the very saints up in glory can't begin to tell what children will turn out lean your face this way why you ain't no more like that little barefooted tangle-haired rosy-faced edna that used to run around these woods in striped homespun hunting the cows than i dorothy elmira wood am like the queen of sheba 
when she went up visiting to jerusalem to call on solomon how wonderful pretty you are and how soft and white your hands are now i look at you good i see you are like your mother hester earl and she was the loveliest mild little pink in the county you are taller than your mother and prouder looking but you have got her big soft shining black eyes and your mouth is sweet and sorrowful and patient as hers always was after your father fell off that frosty roof and broke his neck little edna came back a fine handsome woman looking like a queen but honey you don't seem healthy like my tabitha see what a bright red she has in her face you are too pale you look as if you had just been bled ain't you well child mrs wood felt the girl's arms and shoulders and found them thinner than her standard of health demanded i'm very well thank you but tired from my journey and from walking all about the old place and like enough you've cried a deal your eyes are heavy you know honey the old house burnt down one blustery night in march and so we sold the place but when my old man died we were hard pressed we were and a man by the name of simmons he bought it and planted it in corn edna have you been to your grandpa's grave yes ma'am i was there a long time to-day oh ain't it beautiful it would be a real comfort to die if folks knew such lovely gravestones would cover em i think your grandpa's grave is the prettiest place i ever saw and i wonder sometimes what aaron hunt would say if he could rise out of his coffin and see what is over him poor thing you haven't got over it yet i see i thought we should have buried you too when he died for never did i see a child grieve so mrs wood who keeps the walks so clean and the evergreens so nicely cut my willis to be sure the gentleman that came here and fixed everything last december paid willis one hundred dollars to attend to it and keep the weeds down he said he might come back unexpectedly almost any time and that he did not want to see so much as a blade of grass in the walks so you see willis goes there every saturday and straightens up things what is his name and who is he anyhow he only told us he was a friend of yours and that his mother had adopted you what sort of a looking person was he mrs wood oh child if he is so good to you i ought not to say but he was a powerful grim-looking man with fierce eyes and a thick moustache and hair almost pepper and salt and bless your soul honey his shoulders were as broad as a barn door while he talked i didn't like his countenance it was dark like a pirate's or one of those prowling cattle thieves over in the coves he asked a power of questions about you and your grandpa and when i said you had no kin on earth that i ever heard of he laughed that is he showed his teeth and said so much the better so much the better what is his name mr murray and is he has been very kind to me but edna i thought you went to the factory to work do tell me how you fell into the hands of such rich people edna briefly acquainted her with what had occurred during her long absence and informed her of her plans for the future and while she listened mrs wood lighted her pipe and resting her elbow on her knee dropped her face on her hands and watched her visitor's countenance finally she nodded to her daughter saying do you hear that bitha she can write for the papers and get paid for it and she is smart enough to teach well well that makes me say what i do say and i stick to it where there's a will there's a way and where there's no hearty will all the ways in creation won't take folks to an education some children can't be kicked and kept down spite of all the world they will manage to scuffle up somehow and then again some can't be cuffed and coaxed and dragged up by the ears here's edna that always had a hankering after books and she has made something of herself and here's my girl that i wanted to get book learning and i slaved and i saved to send her to school and sure enough she has got no more use for reading and knows as little as her poor mother who never had a chance to learn it is no earthly use to fly in the face of blood and nature what is bred in the bone won't come out in the flesh some are cut out for one thing and some for another jerusalem artichokes won't bear hops and persimmons don't grow on blackjacks she put her brawny brown hand on edna's forehead and smoothed the bands of hair and sighed heavily mrs wood i should like to see brindle once more lord bless your soul honey she has been dead these three years why you forget cows don't hang on as long as methuselah and brenda was no yearling when we took her she mired down in the swamp back of the mill pond and before we could find her she was dead but her calf is as pretty a young thing as ever you saw speckled all over most as thick as a guinea and the children call her speckle 
willis step out and see if the heifer's in sight edna ain't you going to stay with me to-night thank you mrs wood i should like very much to do so but have not time and must get back to chattanooga before the train leaves for i am obliged to go on to-night well anyhow lay off your bonnet and stay and let me give you some supper then we will go back with you that is if you ain't too proud to ride to town in our cart we have got a new cart but it is only a miller's cart and may be it won't suit your fine fashionable clothes i shall be very glad to stay and i only wish it was the same old cart that took me to the depot more than five years ago please give me some water mrs wood rolled up her sleeves put away her pretty peppers and talking vigorously all the time prepared some refreshments for her guests a table was set under the apple tree a snowy cotton cloth spread over it and yellow butter tempting as goshen's and a loaf of fresh bread and honey amber hued and buttermilk and cider and stewed pears and a dish of ripe but red apples crowned the board the air was laden with the fragrance that stole in crossing a hayfield beyond the road the bees darted in and out of their hives and a peacock spread his iridescent feathers to catch the level yellow rays of the setting sun and from the distant mill-pond came the gabble of geese as the noisy fleet breasted the ripples speckle had been driven to the gate for edna's inspection stood close to the paling thrusting her pearly horns through the cracks and watching the party at the table with her large liquid beautiful earnest eyes and a far-off lookout rose solemn and sombre edna you eat nothing what ails you child they say too much brain work is not healthy and i reckon you study too hard better stay here with me honey and run around the woods and get some red in your face and churn and spin and drink buttermilk and get plump and go chestnutting with my children goodness knows they are strong enough and hearty enough and too much study will never make shads of them for they won't work their brains even to learn the multiplication table see here edna if you will stay a while with me i will give speckle to you thank you dear mrs wood i wish i could but the lady who engaged me to teach her children wrote that i was very much needed and consequently i must hurry on speckle is a perfect little beauty but i would not be so selfish as to take her away from you clouds began to gather in the southwest and as the covered cart was brought to the gate a distant mutter of thunder told that a storm was brewing mrs wood and her two children accompanied the orphan and as they drove through the woods myriads of fireflies starred the gloom it was dark when they reached the station and willis brought the trunks from the hotel and found seats for the party in the cars which were rapidly filling with passengers presently the down train from knoxville came thundering in and the usual rush and bustle ensued mrs wood gave the orphan a hearty kiss and warm embrace and bidding her be sure to write soon and say how you are getting along the kind-hearted woman left the cars wiping her eyes with the corner of her apron at last the locomotive signalled that all was ready and as the train moved on edna caught a glimpse of a form standing under a lamp leaning with folded arms against the post a form strangely like mr murray's she leaned out and watched it till the cars swept round a curve and lamp and figure and village vanished how could he possibly be in chattanooga the conjecture was absurd she was the victim of some optical illusion with a long heavily drawn sigh she leaned against the window frame and looked at the dark mountain mass looming behind her and after a time when the storm drew nearer she saw it only now and then as a vivid vindictive and serpentine flash gored the darkness and shore it across with a gash end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of saint elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty five in one of those brownstone palatial houses on fifth avenue which make the name of the street a synonym for almost royal luxury and magnificence sat mrs andrews's new governess a week after her arrival in new york her reception though cold and formal had been punctiliously courteous and a few days sufficed to give the stranger an accurate insight into the characters and customs of the family with whom she was now domesticated though good-natured intelligent and charitable 
mrs andrews was devoted to society and gave to the demands of fashion much of the time which had been better expended at home in training her children and making her hearthstone rival the attractions of the club where mr andrews generally spent his leisure hours she was much younger than her husband was handsome gay and ambitious and the polished hauteur of her bearing often reminded edna of mrs murray while mr andrews seemed immersed in business during the day and was rarely at home except at his meals felix the eldest of the two children was a peevish spoiled exacting boy of twelve years of age endowed with a remarkably active intellect but pitiably dwarfed in body and hopelessly lame in consequence of a deformed foot his sister hattie was only eight years old a bright pretty affectionate girl over whom felix tyrannized unmercifully and whom from earliest recollection had been accustomed to yield both her rights and privileges to the fretful invalid the room occupied by the governess was small but beautifully furnished and as it was situated in the fourth story the windows commanded a view of the trees in a neighbouring park and the waving outline of long island on the day of her arrival mrs andrews entered into a minute analysis of the characters of the children indicated the course which she wished pursued toward them and impressing upon edna the grave responsibility of her position the mother gave her children to the stranger's guardianship and seemed to consider her maternal duties fully discharged edna soon ascertained that her predecessors had found the path intolerably thorny and abandoned it in consequence of felix's uncontrollable fits of sullenness and passion tutors and governesses had quickly alternated and as the cripple finally declared he would not tolerate the former his mother resolved to humour his caprice in the choice of a teacher fortunately the boy was exceedingly fond of his books and as the physicians forbade the constant use of his eyes the governess was called on to read aloud at least one half of the day from eight o'clock in the morning till eight at night the whole care of these children devolved on edna who ate talked drove with them accompanied them wherever their inclination led and had not one quiet moment from breakfast until her pupils went to sleep sometimes felix was restless and wakeful and on such occasions he insisted that his governess should come and read him to sleep notwithstanding the boy's imperious nature he possessed some redeeming traits and edna soon became much attached to him while his affection for his new keeper astonished and delighted his mother for a week after edna's arrival inclement weather prevented the customary daily drive which contributed largely to the happiness of the little cripple but one afternoon as the three sat in the schoolroom felix threw his latin grammar against the wall and exclaimed i want to see the swans in central park and i mean to go even if it does rain hattie ring for patrick to bring the coop round to the door miss earl don't you want to go yes for there is no longer any danger of rain the sun is shining beautifully and besides i hope you will be more amiable when you get into the open air she gave him his hat and crutches took his grey shawl on her arm and they went down to the neat carriage drawn by a handsome chestnut horse and set apart for the use of the children as they entered the park edna noticed that the boy's eyes brightened and that he looked eagerly at every passing face now hattie you must watch on your side and i will keep a good look out on mine i wonder if she will come this evening for whom are you both looking asked the teacher oh for little lila bro felix's sweetheart laughed hattie glancing at him with a mischievous twinkle in her bright eyes 
no such thing never had a sweetheart in my life don't be silly hattie mind your window or i guess we shan't see her well anyhow i heard uncle gray tell mamma that he kissed his sweetheart's hand at the party and i saw bro felix kiss lila's last week i didn't miss earl cried the cripple reddening as he spoke oh he did miss earl stop pinching me bro felix my arm is all black and blue now there she is look here on my side here is red riding hood edna saw a little girl clad in scarlet and led by a grave middle-aged nurse who was walking leisurely toward one of the lakes felix put his head out of the window and called to the woman hannah are going to feed the swans good evening yes we are going there now well we will meet you there what is the child's name asked edna lila manning and she is deaf and dumb we talked to her on our fingers they left the carriage and approached the groups of children gathered on the edge of the water and at sight of felix the little girl in scarlet sprang to meet him moving her slender fingers rapidly as she conversed with him she was an exceedingly lovely but fragile child apparently about hattie's age and as edna watched the changing expression of her delicate features she turned to the nurse and asked is she an orphan yes miss but she will never find it out as long as her uncle lives he makes a great pet of her what is his name and where does he live mr douglas g manning he boards at number twenty third street but he spends most of his time at the office no matter what time of night he comes home he never goes to his own room till he has looked at lila and kissed her good night master felix please don't untie her hat the wind will blow her hair all out of curl for some time the children were much amused in watching the swans and when they expressed themselves willing to resume their drive an arrangement was made with hannah to meet at the same place the ensuing day they returned to the carriage and felix said don't you think lila is a little beauty yes i quite agree with you do you know her uncle no and don't want to know him he is too cross and sour i have seen him walking sometimes with lila and mamma has him at her parties and dinners but hattie and i never see the company unless we peep and above all things i hate peeping it is ungenteel and vulgar only poor people peep mr manning is an old bachelor and very crabbed so my uncle grace says he is the editor of the magazine that mamma declares she can't live without look look hattie there goes mamma this minute stop patrick uncle gray uncle gray hold up won't you and let me see the new horses an elegant phaeton drawn by a pair of superb black horses drew up close to the coop and mrs andrews and her only brother mr gray chilton leaned forward and spoke to the children while mr chilton who was driving teased hattie by touching her head and shoulders with his whip uncle gray i think the bays are the handsomest which proves you utterly incapable of judging horse-flesh for these are the finest horses in the city i presume this is miss earl though nobody seems polite enough to introduce us he raised his hat slightly bowed and drove on is this the first time you've met my uncle asked felix yes does he live in the city why he lives with us haven't you seen him about the house you must have heard him romping around with hattie for they make noise enough to call in the police i think my uncle gray is the handsomest man i ever saw except edwin booth when he plays hamlet what do you say as i had barely a glimpse of your uncle i formed no opinion felix button your coat and draw your shawl over your shoulders it is getting cold when they reached home the children begged for some music and placing her hat on a chair edna sat down before the piano and played and sang while felix stood leaning on his crutches gazing earnestly into the face of his teacher the song was longfellow's rainy day and when she concluded it the cripple laid his thin hand on hers and said sing the last verse again i feel as if i should always be a good boy if you would only sing that for me every day into each life some rain must fall yes lameness fell into mine while she complied with his request edna watched his sallow face and saw tears gather in the large sad eyes and she felt that henceforth the boy's evil spirit 
could be exorcised miss earl we never had a governess at all like you they were old and cross and ugly and didn't love to play chess and could not sing and i hated them but i do like you and i will try to be good he rested his head against her arm and she turned and kissed his pale broad forehead halloo felix flirting with your governess this is a new phase of school life you ought to feel quite honoured miss earl though upon my word i am sorry for you the excessive amiability of my nephew has driven not less than six of your predecessors in confusion from the field leaving him victorious i warn you he is an incipient tyrann and the schoolroom is the franche compte of his campaigns mr chilton came up to the piano and curiously scanned edna's face but taking her hat and veil she rose and moved toward the door saying i'm disposed to believe that he has been quite as much sinned against as sinning come children it is time for your tea from that hour her influence over the boy strengthened so rapidly that before she had been a month in the house he yielded implicit obedience to her wishes and could not bear for her to leave him even for a moment when more than usually fretful and inclined to tyrannize over hattie or speak disrespectfully to his mother a warning glance or word from edna or the soft touch of her hand would suffice to restrain the threatened outbreak her days were passed in teaching reading aloud and talking to the children and when released from her duties she went invariably to her desk devoting more than half the night to the completion of her manuscript as she took her meals with her pupils she rarely saw the other members of the household and though mr chilton now and then sauntered into the schoolroom and frolicked with hattie his visits were coldly received by the teacher who met his attempts at conversation with very discouraging monosyllabic replies his manner led her to suspect that the good-looking lounger was as vain and heartless as he was frivolous and she felt no inclination to listen to his trifling sans souci chatter consequently when he thrust himself into her presence she either picked up a book or left him to be entertained by the children one evening in november she sat in her own room preparing to write and pondering the probable fate of a sketch which she had finished and dispatched two days before to the office of the magazine the principal aim of the little tale was to portray the horrors and sin of duelling and she had written it with great care but well aware of the vast powerful current of popular opinion that she was bravely striving to stem and fully conscious that it would subject her to severe animadversion from those who defended the custom she could not divest herself of apprehension lest the article should be rejected the door-bell rang and soon after a servant brought her a card mr d g manning to see miss earl flattered and frightened by a visit from one whose opinions she valued so highly edna smoothed her hair and with trembling fingers changed her collar and cuffs and went downstairs feeling as if all the blood in her body were beating a tattoo on the drums of her ears as she entered the library into which he had been shown mrs andrews having guests in the parlour edna had an opportunity of looking unobserved at this critical ogre of whom she stood in such profound awe douglas manning was forty years old tall and well built wore slender steel-rimmed spectacles which somewhat softened the light of his keen cold black eyes and carried a slightly bald head with the haughty air of one who habitually hurled his gauntlet in the teeth of public opinion he stood looking up at a pair of bronze griffins that crouched on the top of the rosewood bookcase and the gaslight falling full on his face showed his stern massive features which in their granitic cast reminded edna of those egyptian andro sphinx vast serene changeless there were no furrows on cheek or brow 
no beard veiled the lines and angles about the mouth but as she marked the chilling repose of the countenance so indicative of conscious power and well-regulated strength why did memory travel swiftly back among the stones of venice repeating the description of the hawthorn on bourges cathedral a perfect niobe of may had this man petrified in his youth before the steady stylus of time left on his features that subtle tracery which passing years engrave on human faces the motto of his magazine veritas sine clementia ruled his life and putting aside the lenses of passion and prejudice he coolly quietly relentlessly judged men and women and their works neither loving nor hating pitying nor despising his race looking neither to right nor left labouring steadily as a thoroughly well balanced a marvellously perfect intellectual automaton good evening mr manning i'm very glad to meet you for i fear my letters have very inadequately expressed my gratitude for your kindness her voice trembled slightly and she put out her hand he turned bowed offered her a chair and as they seated themselves he examined her face as he would have searched the title page of some new book for an insight into its contents when did you reach new york miss earle six weeks ago i was not aware that you were in the city until i received your note two days since how long do you intend to remain probably the rest of my life if i find it possible to support myself comfortably is mrs andrews an old friend no sir she was a stranger to me when i entered her house as governess for her children miss earle you are much younger than i had supposed your writings led me to imagine that you were at least thirty whereas i find you almost a child will your duties as governess conflict with your literary labours no sir i shall continue to write you appear to have acted upon my suggestion to abandon the idea of a book and confine your attention to short sketches no sir i adhere to my original purpose and am at work upon the manuscript which you advise me to destroy he fitted his glasses more firmly on his nose and she saw the gleam of his strong white teeth as a half-smile moved his lips miss earle my desk is very near a window and as i was writing late last night i noticed several large moths beating against the glass which fortunately barred their approach to the flame of the gas inside perhaps inexperience whispered that it was a cruel fate that shut them out but which heals soonest disappointed curiosity or singed wings mr manning why do you apprehend more danger from writing a book than from the preparation of magazine articles simply because the peril is inherent in the nature of the book you contemplate unless i totally misunderstand your views you indulge in the rather extraordinary belief that all works of fiction should be eminently didactic and inculcate not only sound morality but scientific theories herein permit me to say you entirely misapprehend the spirit of the age people read novels merely to be amused not educated and they will not tolerate technicalities and abstract speculation in lieu of exciting plots and melodramatic denouements persons who desire to learn something of astronomy geology chemistry philology etc never think of finding what they require in the pages of a novel but apply at once to the textbooks of the respective sciences and would as soon hunt for a lover's sentimental dialogue in newton's principia or spicy small talk in kant's critique as expect an epitome of modern science in a work of fiction but sir how many habitual novel readers do you suppose will educate themselves thoroughly from the textbooks to which you refer a modicum i grant you yet it is equally true that those who merely read 
to be amused will not digest the scientific dishes you set before them on the contrary far from appreciating your charitable efforts to elevate and broaden their range of vision they will either sneer at the author's pedantry or skip over every passage that necessitates thought to comprehend it and rush on to the next page to discover whether the heroine miss imogene arethusa penelope brown wore blue or pink tarleton to her first ball or whether on the day of her elopement the indignant papa succeeded in preventing the consummation of her felicity with mr belshazzar algernon nebuchadnezzar smith i neither magnify nor dwarf i merely state a simple fact but mr manning do you not regard the writers of each age as the custodian of its tastes as well as its morals certainly not they simply reflect and do not mould public taste shakespeare hogarth rabelais portrayed men and things as they found them not as they might could would or should have been was sir peter lely responsible for the style of dress worn by court beauties in the reign of charles the second he faithfully painted what passed before him miss earl the objection i urge against the novel you are preparing does not apply to magazine essays where an author may concentrate all the erudition he can obtain and ventilate it unchallenged for review writers now serve the public in much the same capacity that cupbearers did royalty in ancient days and they are expected to taste strong liquors as well as sweet cordials and sour light wines moreover a certain haze of sanctity envelops the precincts of maga whence the incognito we thunders with oracular power for notwithstanding the rapid annihilation of all classic faith in modern times which permits the conversion of virgil's avernus into a model oyster farm the credulous public fondly cling to the myth that editorial sanctums alone possess the sacred tripod of delphi curiosity is the best stimulant for public interest and it has become exceedingly difficult to conceal the authorship of a book while that of magazine articles can readily be disguised i repeat the world of novel readers constitute a huge hippodrome where if you can succeed in amusing your spectators or make them gasp in amazement at your rhetorical legerdemain they will applaud vociferously and pet you as they would a graceful danseuse or a dexterous acrobat or a daring equestrian but if you attempt to educate or lecture them you will either declaim to empty benches or be hissed down they expect you to help them kill time not improve it sir is it not nobler to struggle against than to float ignominiously with a tide of degenerate opinion that depends altogether on the earnestness of your desire for a martyrdom by drowning i have seen stronger swimmers than you go down after desperate efforts to keep their heads above water edna folded her hands in her lap and looked steadily into the calm cold eyes of the editor then shook her head and answered i shall not drown at all events i will risk it i would rather sink in the effort than live without attempting it when you require ointment for singed wings i shall have no sympathy with which to anoint them for like most of your sex i see you mistake blind obstinacy for rational heroic firmness the next number of the magazine will contain the contribution you sent me two days since and while i do not accept all your views i think it by far the best thing i have yet seen from your pen it will of course provoke controversy but for that result i presume you are prepared miss earl you are a stranger in new york and if i can serve you in any way i shall be glad to do so thank you mr manning i need some books which i am not able to purchase and cannot find in this house if you can spare them temporarily from your library you will confer a great favour on me certainly have you a list of those which you require no sir but here is a pencil and piece of paper write down the titles and i will have them sent to you in the morning she turned to the table to prepare the list 
and all the while mr manning's keen eyes scanned her countenance dress and figure a half smile once more stirred his grave lips when she gave him the paper over which he glanced indifferently miss earl i fear you will regret your determination to make literature a profession for your letters inform me that you are poor and doubtless you remember the witticism concerning the republic of letters which contained not a sovereign your friend mr murray appreciated the obstacles you are destined to encounter and i am afraid you will not find life in new york as agreeable as it was under his roof when did you hear from him i received a letter this morning and you called to see me because he requested you to do so i had determined to come before his letter arrived he noticed the incredulous smile that flitted across her face and after a moment's pause he continued i do not wish to discourage you on the contrary i sincerely desire to aid you but mill has analyzed the subject very ably in his political economy and declares that on any rational calculation of chances in the existing competition no writer can hope to gain a living by books and to do so by magazines and reviews becomes daily more difficult yes sir that passage is not encouraging but i comfort myself with another from the same book in a national or universal point of view the labour of the savant or speculative thinker is as much a part of production in the very narrowest sense as that of the inventor of a practical art the electromagnetic telegraph was the wonderful and most unexpected consequence of the experiments of ersted and the mathematical investigations of ampere and the modern art of navigation is an unforeseen emanation from the purely speculative and apparently meekly curious inquiry by the mathematicians of alexandria into the properties of three curves formed by the intersection of a plane surface and a cone no limit can be set to the importance even in a purely productive and material point of view of mere thought sir the economic law which regulates the wages of mechanics should operate correspondingly in the realm of letters your memory is remarkably accurate not always sir but when i put it on its honour and trust some special treasure to its guardianship it rarely proves treacherous i think you could command better wages for your work in new york than anywhere else on this continent you have begun well permit me to say to you be careful do not write too rapidly and do not despise adverse criticism if agreeable to you i will call early next week and accompany you to the public libraries which contain much that may interest you i will send you a note as soon as i ascertain when i can command the requisite leisure and should you need my services i hope you will not hesitate to claim them good evening miss earle he bowed himself out of the library and edna went back to her own room thinking of the brief interview and confessing her disappointment in the conversation of this most dreaded of critics he is polished as an icicle and quite as cold he may be very accurate and astute and profound but certainly he is not half so brilliant as she did not complete the parallel but compressed her lips took up her pen and began to write on the following morning mrs andrews came into the schoolroom and after kissing her children turned blandly to the governess miss earle i believe mr manning called upon you last evening where did you know him i never saw him until yesterday but we have corresponded for some time indeed you are quite honoured he is considered very fastidious he is certainly hypercritical yet i have found him kind and gentlemanly even courteous our correspondence is entirely attributable to the fact that i write for his magazine mrs andrews dropped her ivory crochet needle and sat for a moment the picture of wild-eyed amazement is it possible i had no idea you were an author why did you not tell me before what have you written edna mentioned the titles of her published articles and the lady of the house exclaimed oh that vigil of gretley is one of the most beautiful things i ever read and i've often teased mr manning to tell me who wrote it that apostrophe to the thirty confederates is so mournfully grand that it brings tears to my eyes why miss earle you would be famous some day 
if i had your genius i should never think of plodding through life as a governess but my dear madam i must make my bread and am compelled to teach while i write i do not see what time you have for writing i notice you never leave the children till they are asleep and you must sleep enough to keep yourself alive are you writing anything at present i finished an article several days ago which will be published in the next number of the magazine of course i have no leisure during the day but i work till late at night miss earle if you have no objection to acquainting me with your history i should like very much to know something of your early life and education while edna gave a brief account of her childhood felix nestled his hand into hers and laid his head on her knee listening eagerly to every word when she concluded mrs andrews mused a moment and then said henceforth miss earle you will occupy a different position in my house and i shall take pleasure in introducing you to such of my friends as will appreciate your talent i hope you will not confine yourself exclusively to my children but come down sometimes in the evening and sit with me and moreover i prefer that you should dine with us instead of with these nursery folks who are not quite capable of appreciating you how do you know that mamma i can tell you one thing i appreciated her before i found out that she was likely to be famous if before i knew that mr manning condescended to notice her we nursery folk judge for ourselves we don't wait to find out what other people think and i shan't give up miss earle she is my governess and i wish you would just let her alone there was a touch of scorn in the boy's impatient tone and his mother bit her lip and laughed constrainedly really felix who gave you a bill of sale to miss earle she should consider herself exceedingly fortunate as she is the first of all your teachers with whom you have not quarrelled most shamefully even fought and scratched and because she is sweet and good and pretty and i love her you must interfere and take her off to entertain your company she came here to take care of hattie and me and not to go downstairs to see visitors she can't go mamma i want her myself you have all the world to talk to and i have only her don't meddle mamma you are very selfish and ill-tempered my poor little boy and i am heartily ashamed of you if i am it is because hush felix and the later hand on the pale curling lips of the cripple and luckily at this instant mrs andrews was summoned from the room scarcely waiting till the door closed after her the boy exclaimed passionately felix don't call me felix that means happy lucky and she had no right to give me such a name i am in felix nobody loves me and nobody cares for me except to pity me and i would rather be strangled than pitied i wish i was dead and at rest in greenwood i wish somebody would knock my brains out with my crutch and save me from hobbling through life even my mother is ashamed of my deformity she ought to have treated me as the spartans did their dwarfs she ought to have thrown me into the east river before i was a day old i wish i was dead oh i do i do felix it is very wicked to i tell you i won't be called felix whenever i hear the name it makes me feel as i did one day when my crutches slipped on the ice and i fell on the pavement before the door and some newsboys stood and laughed at me in felix andrews i want that written on my tombstone when i am buried he trembled from head to foot and angry tears dimmed his large flashing eyes while hattie sat with her elbows resting on her knees and her chin in her hands looking sorrowfully at her brother edna put her arm around the boy's shoulder and drew his head down on her lap saying tenderly your mother did not mean that she was ashamed of her son but only grieved and mortified by his ungovernable temper which made him disrespectful to her i know that she is very proud of your fine intellect and your ambition to become a thorough scholar and oh yes and of my handsome body and my pretty feet my dear little boy it is sinful for you to speak in that way and god will punish you if you do not struggle against such feelings i don't see how i can be punished any more than i have been already to be a lame dwarf is the worst that can happen suppose you were poor and friendless an orphan with no one to care for you suppose you had no dear good little sister like hattie to love you now felix i know that the very fact that you are not as strong and well grown as most boys of your age only makes your mother and all of us love you more tenderly and it is very ungrateful in you to talk so bitterly when we are trying to make you happy and good and useful look at little lila shut up in silence unable to speak one word or to hear a bird sing or a baby laugh and yet see how merry and good-natured she is 
how much more afflicted she is than you are suppose she was always fretting and complaining looking miserable and sour and out of humour do you think you would love her half as well as you do now he made no reply but his thin hands covered his sallow face hattie came close to him sat down on the carpet and put her head thickly crowned with yellow curls on his knee her uncle gray had given her a pretty ring the day before and now she silently and softly took it from her own finger and slipped it on her brother's felix you and hattie were so delighted with that little poem which i read to you from the journal of eugenie de Gerin, that i have tried to set it to music for you the tune does not suit it exactly but we can use it until i find a better one she went to the piano and sang that pretty nursery ballad juju the angel of the playthings hattie clapped her hands with delight and felix partly forgot his woes and grievances now i want you both to learn to sing it and i will teach hattie the accompaniment on felix's birthday which is not very distant you can surprise your father and mother by singing it for them in gratitude to the author i think every little child should sing it and call it eugenie's angel song hattie it is eleven o'clock and time for you to practise your music lesson the little girl climbed upon the piano stool and began to count aloud and after a while edna bent down and put her hand on felix's shoulder you grieved your mother this morning and spoke very disrespectfully to her i know you regret it and you ought to tell her so and ask her to forgive you you would feel happier all day if you would only acknowledge your fault i hear your mother in her own room will you not go and kiss her he averted his head and muttered i don't want to kiss her but you ought to be a dutiful son and you are not and your mother has cause to be displeased with you if you should ever be so unfortunate as to lose her and stand as i do motherless in the world you will regret the pain you gave her this morning oh if i had the privilege of kissing my mother i could bear almost any sorrow patiently if it mortifies you to acknowledge your bad behaviour it is the more necessary that you should humble your pride felix sometimes i think it requires more nobility of soul to ask pardon for our faults than to resist the temptation to commit them she turned away and busied herself in correcting his latin exercise and for some time the boy sat sullen and silent at length he sighed heavily and taking his crutches came up to the table where she sat suppose you tell my mother i am sorry i was disrespectful felix are you really sorry yes well then go and tell her so and she will love you a thousand times more than ever before the confession should come from your own lips he stood irresolute and sighed again i will go if you will go with me she rose and they went to mrs andrews room the mother was superbly dressed in visiting costume and was tying on her bonnet when they entered mrs andrews your son wishes to say something which i think you will be glad to hear indeed well felix what is it mamma i believe i know i was very cross and disrespectful to you and oh mamma i hope you will forgive me he dropped his crutches and stretched out his arms and mrs andrews threw down the diamond cluster with which she was fastening her ribbons and caught the boy to her bosom my precious child my darling of course i forgive you gladly my dear son if you only knew half how well i love you you would not grieve me so often by your passionate temper my darling she stooped to kiss him and when she turned to look for the girlish form of the governess it was no longer visible mother and son were alone End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty six during the first few months after her removal to new york edna received frequent letters from mrs murray and mr hammond but as winter advanced they wrote more rarely and hurriedly and finally many weeks elapsed without bringing any tidings from le bocage st elmo's name was never mentioned and while the girl's heart ached she crushed it more ruthlessly day by day and in retaliation imposed additional and unremitting toil upon her brain mr manning had called twice to escort her to the libraries and art galleries and occasionally he sent her new books and english and french periodicals but his chill imperturbable calmness oppressed and embarrassed edna and formed a barrier to all friendly worth in their intercourse he so completely overawed her that in his august present she was unable to do herself justice and felt that she was not gaining ground in his good opinion 
the brooding serenity of his grave egyptic face was not contagious and she was conscious of a vague disquiet a painful restlessness when in his company and under his cold changeless eyes one morning in january as she sat listening to felix's recitations mrs andrews came into the schoolroom with an open note in one hand and an exquisite bouquet in the other miss earle here's an invitation for you to accompany mr manning to the opera to-night and here too is a bouquet from the same considerate gentleman as he does me the honour to request my company also i came to confer with you before sending a reply of course you will go yes mrs andrews if you will go with me edna bent over her flowers and recognising many favourites that recalled the hot-house at le bocage her eyes filled with tears and she hastily put her lips to the snowy cups of an axellus how often she had seen just such fragile petals nestling in the buttonhole of mr murray's coat i shall write and invite him to come early and take tea with us now miss earle pardon my candour i should like to know what you intend to wear you know that mr manning is quite lionised here and you will have to face a terrific battery of eyes and lorgnettes for everybody will stretch his or her neck to find out first who you are and secondly how you are dressed now i think i understand rather better than you do what is comme il faut in these matters and i hope you will allow me to dictate on this occasion moreover our distinguished escort is extremely fastidious concerning ladies toilettes here are my keys mrs andrews examine my wardrobe and select what you consider appropriate for to-night on condition that you permit me to supply any deficiencies which i may discover come to my room at six o'clock and let victorine dress your hair let me see i expect a la grec will best suit your head and face edna turned to her pupils and their books but all day the flowers in the vase on the table prattled of days gone by of purple sunsets streaming through golden starved acacia boughs of long languid luxurious southern afternoons dying slowly on beds of heliotrope and jasmine spicy geraniums and gorgeous parlagoniums of dewy delicious summer mornings for ever and ever past when standing beside a quivering snowbank of lamarck roses she had watched tamerlane and his gloomy rider go down the shadowy avenue of elms the monotonous hum of the children's voices seemed thin and strange and far far off jarring the sweet bouquet babble and still as the hours passed and the winter day waned the flower fugue swelled on and on through the cold and dreary chambers of her heart now rising stormy and passionate like a battle-blast from the deep orange trumpet of a bignonia and now whispering and sobbing and pleading from the pearly white lips of hallowed oxalis when she sat that night in mr manning's box at the academy of music the editor raised his opera-glass swept the crowded house scanning the lovely beaming faces wreathed with smiles and then his grave piercing glance came back and dwelt on the countenance at his side the cherry silk lining and puffing on her opera cloak threw a delicate stain of colour over her exquisitely moulded cheeks and in the braid of black hair which rested like a coronal on her polished brow burned a scarlet anemone her long lashes drooped as she looked down at the bouquet between her fingers and listening to the fugue which memory played on the pedal she sighed involuntarily miss earle is this your first night at the opera no sir i was here once before with mr andrews and his children i judge from your writings that you are particularly fond of music yes sir i think few persons love it better than i do what style do you prefer sacred music oratorios rather than operas the orchestra began an overture of verities and edna's eyes went back to her flowers presently mrs andrews said eagerly look miss earle yonder in the box directly opposite is the celebrated sir roger percival the english nobleman about whom all gotham is running mad if he has not more sense than most men of his age his head will be completely turned by the flattery heaped upon him what a commentary on republican americans that we are so dazzled by the glitter of a title however he really is very agreeable i have met him several times dined with him last week at the coltons he has been watching us for some minutes ah there is a bow for me and one i presume for you mr manning yes i knew him abroad we spent a month together at dresden and his brain is strong enough to bear all the adulation new yorkers offer his title edna looked into the opposite box and saw a tall elegantly dressed man with huge whiskers and a glittering opera glass and then as the curtain rose on the first act of ernani she turned to the stage and gave her entire attention to the music at the close of the second act mrs andrews said pray who is that handsome man down yonder in the parquet fanning himself with a libretto i do not think his eyes have moved from this box for the last ten minutes he is a stranger to me she turned her fan in the direction of the person indicated and mr manning looked down and answered he is unknown to me 
edna's eyes involuntarily wandered over the sea of heads and the editor saw her start and lean forward and noticed the sudden joy that flashed into her face as she met the earnest upward gaze of gordon lee an acquaintance of yours miss earl yes sir an old friend from the south the door of the box opened and sir roger percival came in and seated himself near mrs andrews who in her cordial welcome seemed utterly to forget the presence of the governess mr manning sat close to edna and taking a couple of letters from his pocket he laid them on her lap saying these letters were directed to my care by persons who are ignorant of your name and address if you will not consider me unpardonably curious i should like to know the nature of their contents she broke the seals and read the most flattering commendations of her magazine sketches the most cordial thanks for the pleasure derived from their perusal but the signatures were unknown to her a sudden wave of crimson surged into her face as she silently put the letters into mr manning's hand and watched his grave fixed on demonstrative features while he read refolded and returned them to her miss earl i have received several documents of a similar character asking for your address do you still desire to write incognito or do you wish your name given to your admirers that is a matter which i am willing to leave to your superior judgment pardon me but i much prefer that you determine it for yourself then you may give my name to those who are sufficiently interested in me to write and make the inquiry mr manning smiled slightly and lowered his voice as he said sir roger percival came here to-night to be introduced to you he has expressed much curiosity to see the author of the last article which you contributed to the magazine and i told him that you would be in my box this evening shall i present him now mr manning was rising but edna put her hand on his arm and answered hurriedly no no he is engaged in conversation with mrs andrews and moreover i believe i do not particularly desire to be presented to him here comes your friend i will vacate this seat in his favour he rose bowed to gordon lee and gave him the chair which he had occupied edna how i have longed to see you once more gordon's hand seized hers and his handsome face was eloquent with feelings which he felt no inclination to conceal the sight of your countenance is an unexpected pleasure in new york mr lee when did you arrive this afternoon mr hammond gave me your address and i called to see you but was told that you were here how are they all at home do you mean at le bocage or the parsonage i mean how are all my friends mrs murray is very well mrs Estelle ditto mr hammond has been sick but was better and able to preach before i left i brought a letter for you from him but unfortunately left it in the pocket of my travelling coat edna you have changed very much since i saw you last in what respect mr lee the crash of the orchestra filled the house and people turned once more to the stage standing with his arms folded mr manning saw the earnest look on gordon's face as with his arm resting on the back of edna's chair he talked in a low eager tone and a pitying smile partly curved the editor's granite mouth as he noticed the expression of pain on the girl's face and heard her say coldly no mr lee what i told you then i repeat now time has made no change the opera ended the curtain fell and an enthusiastic audience called out the popular prima donna while bouquets were showered upon her mr manning stooped and put his hand on edna's shall i throw your tribute for you she hastily caught the bouquet from his fingers and replied oh no thank you i am so selfish i cannot spare it i shall call at ten o'clock to-morrow to deliver your letter said gordon as he stood hat in hand i shall be glad to see you mr lee he shook hands with her and with mr manning to whom she had introduced him and left the box sir roger percival gave his arm to mrs andrews and the editor drew edna's cloak over her shoulders took her hand and led her down the steps as her little gloved fingers rested in his the feeling of awe and restraint melted away and looking into his face she said mr manning i do not think you will ever know half how much i thank you for all your kindness to an unknown authorling i have enjoyed the music very much indeed how is lila to-night a slight tremor crossed his lips the petrified hawthorn was quivering into life she is quite well thank you pray what do you know about her i was not aware that i had ever mentioned her name in your presence my pupil felix is her most devoted knight and i see her almost every afternoon when i go with the children to central park they reached the carriage where the englishman stood talking to mrs andrews and when mr manning had handed edna in he turned and said something to sir roger who laughed lightly and walked away during the drive mrs andrews talked volubly of the foreigner's ease and elegance and fastidious musical taste and mr manning listened courteously and bowed coldly in reply when they reached home she invited him to dinner on the following thursday to meet sir roger percival as the editor bade them good-night he said to edna go to sleep at once do not sit up to work to-night 
did she follow his sage advice ask of the stars that watched her through the long winter night and the dappled dawn that saw her stooping wearily over her desk at the appointed hour on the following morning mr lee called and after some desultory remarks he asked rather abruptly has st elmo murray written to you about his last whim i do not correspond with mr murray everybody wonders what droll freak will next season read the blacksmith died several months ago and to the astonishment of our people mr murray has taken his orphan hulda to le bocage has adopted her i believe at all events is educating her edna's face grew radiant oh i am glad to hear it poor little hulda needed a friend and she could not possibly have fallen into kinder hands than mr murray's there certainly exists some diversity of opinion on that subject he is rather too grim a guardian i fancy for one so young as hulda reed is mr hammond teaching hulda oh no herein consists the wonder murray himself hears her lessons so estelle told my sister apropos rumour announces the approaching marriage of the cousins my sister informed me that it would take place early in the spring do you allude to mr murray and miss harding i do they will go to europe immediately after their marriage gordon looked searchingly at his companion but saw only a faint incredulous smile across her calm face my sister is estelle's confidant so you see i speak advisedly i know that her trousseau has been ordered from paris edna's fingers closed spasmodically over each other but she laughed as she answered how then dare you betray her confidence mr lee how long will you remain in new york i shall leave to-morrow unless i have reason to hope that a longer visit will give you pleasure i came here solely to see you he attempted to unclasp her fingers but she shook off his hand and said quickly i know what you are about to say and i would rather not hear what would only distress us both if you wish me to respect you mr lee you must never again allude to a subject which i showed you last night was exceedingly painful to me while i value you as a friend and am rejoiced to see you again i shall regret to learn that you had prolonged your stay even one hour on my account you are ungrateful edna and i begin to realize that you are utterly heartless if i am at least i have never trifled with or deceived you mr lee you have no heart or you certainly could not so coldly reject an affection which any other woman would proudly accept a few years hence when your insane ambition is fully satiated and your beauty fades and your writings pall upon public taste and your smooth-tongued flatterers forsake your shrine to bow before that of some new and more popular idol than edna you will rue your folly she rose and answered quietly the future may contain only disappointments for me but however lonely however sad my lot may prove i think i shall never fall so low as to regret not having married a man whom i find it impossible to love the sooner this interview ends the longer our friendship will last my time is not now my own and as my duties claim me in the schoolroom i must bid you good-bye and if you send me away from you now you shall never look upon my face again in this world mournfully her tearful eyes sought his but her voice was low and steady as she put out both hands and said solemnly farewell dear friend god grant that when next we see each other's faces they may be overshadowed by the shining white plumes of our angel wings in that city of god where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest never again in this world ah such words are dreary and funereal as the dull fall of clouds on a coffin lid but so be it thank god time brings us all to one inevitable tryst before the great white throne he took the hands bowed his forehead upon them and groaned then drew them to his lips and left her with a slow weary step she turned and went up to her room and read mr hammond's letter it was long and kind full of affection and wise counsel but contained no allusion to mr murray as she refolded it she saw a slip of paper which had fallen unnoticed on the carpet and picking it up she read these words it grieves me to have to tell you that after all i fear st elmo will marry estelle harding he does not love her she cannot influence him to redeem himself his future looks hopeless indeed edna my child what have you done oh what have you done her heart gave a sudden wild bound then a spasm seemed to seize it and presently the fluttering ceased her pulses stopped and a chill darkness fell upon her her head sank heavily on her chest and when she recovered her memory she felt an intolerable sensation of suffocation and a sharp pain that seemed to stab the heart whose throbs were slow and feeble she raised the window and leaned out panting for breath and the freezing wind powdered her face with fine snowflakes and sprinkled its fairy flower crystals over her hair the outer world was chill and dreary the leafless limbs of the trees in the park looked ghostly and weird against the dense dun clouds which seemed to stretch like a smoke mantle just above the sea of roofs and dimly seen through the white mist brooklyn's heights and staten's hills were huge outlines monstrous as echidna physical pain blanched edna's lips and she pressed her hand repeatedly to her heart 
wondering what caused those keen pangs at last when the bodily suffering passed away and she sat down exhausted her mind reverted to the sentence in mr hammond's letter she knew the words were not lightly written and that his reproachful appeal had broken from the depths of his aching heart and was intended to rouse her to some action i can do nothing say nothing must sit still and wait patiently prayerfully to-day if i could put out my hand and touch mr murray and bind him to me for ever i would not no no not a finger must i lift even between him and estelle but he will not marry her i know i feel that he will not though i never look upon his face again he belongs to me he is mine and no other woman can take him from me a strange mysterious shadowy smile settled on her pallid features and faintly and dreamily she repeated and yet i know past all doubting truly a knowledge greater than grief can dim i know as he loved he will love me duly yea better e'en better than i love him and as i walk by the vast calm river the awful river so dread to see i say thy breath and thy depth for ever are bridged by his thoughts that cross to me her lashes drooped her head fell back against the top of the chair and she lost all her woes until felix's voice roused her and she saw the frightened boy standing at her side shaking her hand and calling piteously upon her oh i thought you were dead you looked so white and felt so cold are you very sick shall i go for mamma for a moment she looked in his face with a perplexed bewildered expression then made an effort to rise i suppose that i must have fainted for i had a terrible pain here and she laid her hand over her heart felix let us go downstairs i think if your mother would give me some wine it might strengthen me notwithstanding the snow mrs andrews had gone out but felix had the wine brought to the schoolroom and after a little while the blood showed itself shyly in the governess's white lips and she took the boy's latin book and heard him recite his lesson the day appeared wearily long but she omitted none of the appointed tasks and it was nearly nine o'clock before felix fell asleep that night softly unclasping his thin fingers which clung to her hand she went up to her own room feeling the full force of those mournful words in eugenie de joanne's journal it goes on in the soul no one is aware of what i feel no one suffers from it i only pour out my heart before god and here oh to-day what efforts i make to shake off this profitless sadness this sadness without tears arid bruising the heart like a hammer there was no recurrence of the physical agony and after two days the feeling of prostration passed away and only the memory of the attack remained the idea of lionizing her children's governess and introducing her to soi-disant fashionable society had taken possession of mrs andrews's mind and she was quite as much delighted with her patronizing scheme as a child would have been with a new hobby-horse dreams at which even messinas might have laughed floated through her busy brain and filled her kind heart with generous anticipations on thursday she informed edna that she desired her presence at dinner and urged her request with such pertinacious earnestness that no alternative remained but acquiescence and reluctantly the governess prepared to meet a formidable party of strangers when mrs andrews presented sir roger percival he bowed rather haughtily and with a distant politeness which assured edna that he was cognizant of her refusal to make his acquaintance at the opera during the early part of dinner he divided his gay words between his hostess and a pretty miss morton who was evidently laying siege to his heart and carefully flattering his vanity but whenever edna his vis-a-vis -vis, looked toward him she invariably found his fine brown eyes scrutinizing her face mr manny who sat next to edna engaged her in an animated discussion concerning the value of a small volume containing two essays by buckle which he had sent her a few days previous something which she said to the editor with reference to buckle's extravagant estimate of mill brought a smile to the englishman's lip and bowing slightly he said pardon me miss earl if i interrupt you a moment to express my surprise at hearing mill denounced by an american his books on representative government and liberty are so essentially democratic that i expected only gratitude and eulogy from his readers on this side of the atlantic despite her efforts to control it embarrassment unstrung her nerves and threw a quiver into her voice as she answered i do not presume sir to denounce a man whom buckle ranks above all other living writers and statesmen but in anticipating the inevitable result of the adoption of some of mill's proposed social reforms i could not avoid recalling that wise dictum of frederick the great concerning philosophers a saying which buckle quotes so triumphantly against plato aristotle descartes even bacon newton and a long list of names illustrious in the annals of english literature frederick declared if i wanted to ruin one of my provinces i would make over its government to the philosopher 
with due deference to buckle's superior learning and astuteness i confess my study of mill's philosophy assures me that if society should be turned over to the government of his theory of liberty and suffrage it would go to ruin more rapidly than frederick's province under his teachings the women of england might soon marshal their amazonian legions and storm not only parnassus but the ballot-box the bench and the forum that this should occur in a country where a woman nominally rules and certainly reigns is not so surprising but i dread the contagion of such an example upon america his influence is powerful from the fact that he never takes up his pen without using it to break some social shackles and its strokes are tremendous as those of the hammer of thor but surely miss earl you americans cannot with either good taste grace or consistency abrade england on the score of women's rights movements at least sir our statesmen are not yet attacked by this most loathsome of political leprosies only a few crazy fanatics have fallen victims to it and if lunatic asylums were not frequently cheated of their dues these would not be left at large but shut up together in high walled enclosures where like sidney smith's ramnivorous metaphysicians or romurus spiders they could only injure one another and destroy their own webs america has no bentham bailey hare or mill to lend countenance or strength to the ridiculous clamour raised by a few unamiable and wretched wives and as many embittered disappointed old maids of new england the noble apology which edmund burke once offered for his countrymen always recurs to my mind when i hear these women's conventions alluded to because half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink while thousands of great cattle repose beneath the shade of the british oak chew the cud and are silent pray do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field that of course there are many in number or that after all they are other than the little shrivel meagre hopping though loud and troublesome insects of the hour i think sir that the noble and true women of this continent earnestly believe that the day which invests them with the elective franchise would be the blackest in the annals of humanity would ring the death knell of modern civilization of national prosperity social morality and domestic happiness and would consign the race to a night of degradation and horror infinitely more appalling than a return to primeval barbarism even my brief sojourn in america has taught me the demoralizing tendency of the doctrine of equality of races and of sexes and you must admit miss earl that your countrywomen are growing dangerously learned answered sir roger smiling i am afraid sir that it is rather the quality than the quantity of their learning that makes them troublesome one of your own noble seers has most gracefully declared a woman may always help her husband or race by what she knows however little by what she half knows or miss knows she will only tease him sir roger bowed and mr manning said very true good and beautiful as a mere theory in sociology but in an age when those hideous hermaphrodites eclept strong-minded women are becoming so alarmingly numerous our eyes are rarely gladdened by a conjunction of highly cultivated intellects notable loving hearts tender womanly sensibilities can you shoulder the anus brabandi sir that rests with those who assert that learning renders women disagreeable and unfeminine the burden of proof remains for you permit me to lift the weight for you manning by asking miss earl what she thinks of the comparative merits of the princess and of aurora lee as correctives of the tendency she deprecates hitherto the discussion had been confined to the trio while the conversation was general but now silence reigned around the table and when the englishman's questions forced edna to look up she saw all eyes turned upon her and embarrassment flushed her face and her lashes drooped as she answered it has often been asserted by those who claim proficiency in the analysis of character that women are the most infallible judges of womanly and men of manly natures but i am afraid that the poems referred to would veto this decision while i yield to no human being in admiration of and loving gratitude to mrs browning and regard the first eight books of aurora lee as vigorous grand and marvellously beautiful i cannot deny that a painful feeling of mortification seizes me when i read the ninth and concluding book wherein aurora with most unwomanly vehemence voluntarily declares and reiterates her love for romney tennyson's princess seems to me more feminine and refined and lovely than aurora and it is because i love and revere mrs browning and consider her not only the pride of her own sex but an ornament to the world that i find it difficult to forgive the unwomanly inconsistency into which she betrays her heroine allow me to say that in my humble opinion nothing in the whole range of literature so fully portrays a perfect woman as that 
noble sketch by wordsworth and the inimitable description of, in rogers's human life the first is i presume familiar to all of us but the last i confess escapes my memory will you be good enough to repeat it said the editor knitting his brows slightly excuse me sir it is too long to be quoted here and it seems that i have already monopolized the conversation much longer than i expected or desired moreover to quote rogers to an englishman would be equivalent to carrying coal to newcastle or peddling owls in athens sir roger smiled as he said indeed miss earl while you spoke i was earnestly ransacking my memory for the passage to which you allude but i am ashamed to say it is as fruitless an effort as calling spirits from the vasty deep pray be so kind as to repeat it for me at that instant little hattie crept softly to the back of enda's chair and whispered bro felix says won't you please come back soon and finish that story where you left off reading last night very glad to possess so good an excuse the governess rose at once but mrs andrews said wait miss earl what do you want hattie bro felix wants miss earl and sent me to beg her to come go back and tell him he is in a hopeless minority and that in this country the majority rule there are fifteen here who want to talk to miss earl and he can't have her in the schoolroom just now said gray chiltern slyly pelting his niece with almonds the felix is really sick to-day and if mrs andrews will excuse me i prefer to go she looked imploringly at the lady of the house who said nothing and sir roger beckoned hattie to him and exclaimed pray may i inquire mrs andrews why your children do not make their appearance i am sure you need not fear a repetition of the sarcastic rebuke of that wit who when dining at a house where children were noisy and unruly lifted his glass bowed to the troublesome little ones and drank to the memory of king herod i am very certain the murder of the innocents would never be recalled here unless forgive me miss earl but from the sparkle in your eyes i believe you anticipate me do you really know what i am about to say i think sir i can guess let me see whether you are a clairvoyant on one occasion when a sign for a children's school was needed and the lady teacher applied the lamp to suggest a design he meekly advised that of the murder of the innocents thank you sir however i am not surprised that you entertain such flattering opinions of a profession which in england boasts squeers as its national type and representative the young man laughed good-humouredly and answered for the honour of my worthy pedagogical countryman permit me to assure you that the aforesaid squeers is simply one of dickens's inimitable caricatures nevertheless i have somewhere seen the statement that when nicholas nickleby first made its appearance only six irate schoolmasters went immediately to london to thrash the author each believing that he recognised his own features in the amiable portrait of squeers she bowed and turned from the table but mrs andrews exclaimed before you go repeat that passage from rogers then we will excuse you with one hand clasping hattie's and the other resting on the back of her chair edna fixed her eyes on mrs andrews's face and gave the quotation his house she enters there to be a light shining within when all without is night a guardian angel o'er his life presiding doubling his pleasures and his cares dividing winning him back when mingling in the throng from a vain world we love alas too long to fireside happiness and hours of ease blessed with that charm the certainty to please how oft her eyes read his her gentle mind to all his wishes all his thoughts inclined still subject ever on the watch to borrow mirth of his mirth and sorrow of his sorrow end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty seven flowery as cecilia meads was the parsonage garden on that quiet afternoon late in may when mr hammond closed the honeysuckle crown gate crossed the street and walked slowly into the churchyard down the sacred streets of the silent city of the dead and entered the enclosure where slept his white-robed household band the air was thick with perfume as if some strong daring south wind had blown wide the mystic doors of ashtart's huge laboratory and overturned the myriad alembics and deluged the world with her fragrant and subtle distillations honey burdened bees hummed their hymns to labour as they swung to and fro 
and numbers of psyche symbols golden butterflies floated dreamily in and around and over the tombs now and then poising on velvet wings as if waiting listening for the clarion voice of gabriel to rouse and reanimate the slumbering bodies beneath the gleaming slabs canary-coloured orioles flitted in and out of the trailing willows a redbird perched on the brow of a sculptured angel guarding a child's grave and poured his sad sweet monotonous notes on the spicy air two purple pigeons with rainbow necklaces cooed and fluttered up and down from the church belfry and close under the projecting roof of the granite vault a pair of meek brown wrens were building their nest and twittering softly one to another the pastor cut down the rank grass and fringy ferns the flaunting weeds and coreopsis that threatened to choke his more delicate flowers and stooping tied up the crimson pinks and wound the tendrils of the blue-veined clematis around its slender trellis and straightened the white petunias and the orange-tinted crocus which the last heavy shower had beaten to the ground the small grey vault was overrun with ivy whose dark polished leaves threatened to encroach on a plain slab of pure marble that stood very near it and as the minister pruned away the wreaths his eyes rested on the black letters in the centre of the slab murray hammond aged twenty one elsewhere the sunshine streamed warm and bright over the graves but here the rays were intercepted by the church and its cool shadow rested over vault and slab and flowers the old man was weary from stooping so long and now he took off his hat and passed his hand over his forehead and sighed as he leaned against the door of the vault where fine fairy fingered mosses were weaving their green arabesque immortelles in a mournfully measured yet tranquil tone he said aloud ah truly throughout all the years of my life i have never heard the promise of perfect love without seeing aloft amongst the stars fingers as of a man's hand writing the sacred legend ashes to ashes dust to dust age was bending his body toward the earth with which it was soon to mingle the ripe and perfect wheat nodded lower and lower day by day as the angel of the sickle delayed but his noble face wore that blessed and marvellous calm that unearthly peace which generally comes some hours after death when all traces of temporal passions and woes are lost in eternity's repose a low wailing symphony throbbed through the church where the organist was practising and then out of the windows and far away on the evening air rolled the solemn waves of that matchlessly mournful requiem which under prophetic shadows mozart began on earth and finished perhaps in heaven on one of those golden harps whose apocalyptic ringing smote st john's eager ears among the lonely rocks of aegean girdled patmos the sun had paused as if to listen on the wooded crest of a distant hill but as the requiem ended and the organ sobbed itself to rest he gathered up his burning rays and disappeared and the spotted butterflies like winged tulips flitted silently away and the evening breeze bowed the large yellow primroses and fluttered the flocks the red nasturtiums that climbed up at the foot of the slabs shuddered and shook their blood-coloured banners over the polished marble a holy hush fell upon all things save a towering poplar that leaned against the church and rustled its leaves ceaselessly and shivered and turned white as tradition averse it has done since that day when christ staggered along the via della rosa bearing his cross carved out of poplar wood leaning with his hands folded on the handle of the weeding hoe his grey beard sweeping over his bosom his bare silvered head bowed and his mild peaceful blue eyes resting on his son's tomb mr hammond stood listening to the music and when the strains ceased his thoughts travelled onward and upward till they crossed the sea of crystal before the throne and in imagination he heard the song of the four-and-twenty elders from this brief reverie some slight sound aroused him and lifting his eyes he saw a man clad in white linen garments wearing oxalis clusters in his coat standing on the opposite side of the monumental slab st elmo my poor suffering wanderer o oh, st elmo come to me once more before i die the old man's voice was husky and his arms trembled as he stretched them across the grave that intervened mr murray looked into the tender tearful pleading countenance and the sorrow 
that seized his own making his features writhe beggar's language he instinctively put out his arms then drew them back and hid his face in his hands saying in low broken almost inaudible tones i am too unworthy dripping with the blood of your children i dare not touch you the pastor tottered around the tomb and stood at mr murray's side and the next moment the old man's arms were clasped around the tall form and his white hair fell on his pupil's shoulder god be praised after twenty years separation i hold you once more to the heart that even in its hours of deepest sorrow has never ceased to love you st elmo he wept aloud and strained the prodigal convulsively to his breast after a moment mr murray's lips moved twitched and with a groan that shook his powerful frame from head to foot he asked will you ever ever forgive me god is my witness that i freely and fully forgave you many many years ago the dearest hope of my lonely life has been that i might tell you so and make you realize how ceaselessly my prayers and my love have followed you in all your dreary wanderings oh i thank god that at last at last you have come to me my dear dear boy my poor proud prodigal a magnificent jubilate swelled triumphantly through church and churchyard as if the organist up in the gallery knew what was happening at murray hammond's grave and when the thrilling music died away st elmo broke from the encircling arms and knelt with his face shrouded in his hands and pressed against the marble that covered his victim after a little while the pastor sat down on the edge of the slab and laid his shrunken fingers softly and caressingly upon the bowed head do not dwell upon a past that is fraught only with bitterness to you and from which you can draw no balm throw your painful memories behind you and turn resolutely to a future which may be rendered noble and useful and holy there is truth precious truth in george herbert's words for all may have if they dare choose a glorious life or grave and the years to come may by the grace of god more than cancel those that have gone by what have i to hope for in time of eternity oh none but almighty god can ever know the dreary blackness and wretchedness of my despairing soul the keen sleepless pain of my remorse my utter loathing of my accursed distorted nature and his pitying eyes see all and christ stretches out his hands to lift you up to himself and his own words of loving sympathy and pardon are spoken again to you come unto me all ye weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest throw all your galling load of memories down at the foot of the cross and the peace that passeth all understanding shall enter your sorrowing soul and abide there for ever st elmo only prayer could have sustained and soothed me since we parted that bright summer morning twenty long long years ago prayer took away the sting and sanctified my sorrows for the good of my soul and my dear dear boy it will extract the poison and the bitterness from yours that god answers prayer and comforts the afflicted among men i am a living attestation it is by his grace only that i am what i am erring and unworthy i humbly own but patient at least and fully resigned to his will the only remaining cause of disquiet passed away just now when i saw that you had come back to me st elmo do you ever pray for yourself for some weeks i have been trying to pray but my words seem a mockery they do not rise they fall back hissing upon my heart i have injured and insulted you i have cursed you and yours have robbed you of your peace of mind have murdered your children hush hush we will not disinter the dead my peace of mind you have to-day given back to me and the hope of your salvation is dearer to me than the remembered faces of my darlings sleeping here beside us oh st elmo i have prayed for you as i never prayed even for my own murray and i know i feel that all my wrestling before the throne of god has not been in vain sometimes my faith grew faint and as the years dragged on and i saw no melting of your haughty bearded spirit i almost lost hope but i did not thank god i did not i held on to the precious promise and prayed more frequently and blessed be his holy name at last just before i go hence the answer comes as i see you kneeling here at my murray's grave i know now that your soul is snatched as a brand from the burning oh bless my merciful god that in that day when we stand for final judgment and your precious soul is required at my son's hands the joyful cry of the recording angel shall be saved saved for ever and ever through the blood of the lamb 
overwhelmed with emotion the pastor dropped his white head on his bosom and once more silence fell over the darkening cemetery one by one the birds hushed their twitter and went to rest and only the soft cooing of the pigeons floated down now and then from the lofty belfry on the eastern horizon a thin fleecy scarf of clouds was silvered by the rising moon the west was a huge shrine of beryl whereon burned ruby flakes of vapour watched by a solitary vestal star and the sapphire arch overhead was beautiful and mellow as any that ever vaulted above the sculptured marbles of pisan campo santo mr murray rose and stood with his head uncovered and his eyes fixed on the nodding nasturtiums that glowed like blood spots mr hammond your magnanimity unmans me and if your words be true i feel in your presence like a leper and should lay my lips in the dust crying unclean unclean for all that i have inflicted on you i have neither apology nor defence to offer and i could much better have borne curses from you than words of sympathy and affection you amaze me for i hate and scorn myself so thoroughly that i marvel at the interest you still indulge for me i cannot understand how you can endure the sight of my features the sound of my voice oh if i could atone if i could give annie back to your arms there is no suffering no torture that i would not gladly embrace no penance of body or soul from which i would shrink my dear boy for such you still seem to me notwithstanding the lapse of time let my little darling rest with her god she went down early to her long home and though i missed her sweet laugh and her soft tender hands about my face in a felt a chill silence in my house where music once was she has been spared much suffering and many trials and i would not recall her if i could for after a few more days i shall gather her back to my bosom in that eternal land where the blighting dew of death never falls where i do and farewells are a sound unknown atone ah st elmo you can atone save your soul redeem your life and i shall die blessing your name look at me in my loneliness and infirmity i am childless you took my idols from me long long ago you left my heart desolate and now i have a right to turn to you to stretch out my feeble empty arms and say come be my child fill my son's place let me lean upon you in my old age as i once fondly dreamed i should lean on my own murray st elmo will you come will you give me your heart my son my son he put out his trembling hands and a yearning tenderness shone in his eyes as he raised them to the tall stern man before him mr murray bent eagerly forward and looked wonderingly at him do you can you mean it it appears so impossible and i have been so long sceptical of all nobility in my race will you indeed shelter murray's murderer in your generous loving heart i call my god to witness that it has been my dearest hope for dreary years that i might win your heart back before i die it is but a wreck a hideous ruin black with sins but such as i am my future my all i lay at your feet if there is any efficacy in bitter repentance and remorse if there is any mercy left in my maker's hands if there be saving power in human will i will atone i will atone the strong man trembled like a wave-lashed reed as he sank on one knee at the minister's feet and buried his face in his arms and spreading his palms over the drooped head mr hammond gently and solemnly blessed him for some time both were silent and then mr murray stretched out one arm over the slab and said brokenly kneeling here at murray's tomb a strange incomprehensible feeling creeps into my heart the fierce burning hate i have borne him seems to have passed away and something ah something mournfully like the old yearning toward him comes back as i look at his name o oh, idol of my youth hurled down and crushed by my own savage hands for the first time since i destroyed him since i saw his handsome face whitening in death i think of him kindly for the first time since that night i feel that that i can forgive him murray murray you wronged me you wrecked me but oh i could give you back the life i took in my madness how joyfully would i forgive you all my injuries his blood dyes my hands my heart my soul the blood of jesus will wash out those stains the law was fully satisfied when he hung on calvary there ample atonement was made for just such sins as yours and you have only to claim and plead his sufferings to secure your salvation st elmo bury your past here in murray's grave and give all your thoughts to the future half of your life has ebbed out and yet your life-work remains undone untouched you have no time to spend in looking over your unimproved years 
bury my past impossible even for one hour i tell you i am chained to it as the aloides were chained to the pillars of tartarus and the croaking fiend that will not let me sleep in memory memory of sins that that avenge your wrongs old man that goad me sometimes to the very verge of suicide do you know how how could you possibly know shall i tell you that only one thought has often stood between me and self-destruction it was not the fear of death no 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 it was not even the dread of facing an outraged god but it was the horrible fear of meeting murray not all eternity was wide enough to hold us both the hate i bore him made me shrink from a deed which i felt would instantly set us face to face once more in the land of souls ah a change has come over me now if i could see his face i might learn to forget that look it wore when last i gazed upon it time bears healing for some natures to mine it has brought only poison it is useless to bid me forget memory is earth's retribution for man's sins i have bought at a terrible price my conviction of the melancholy truth that he who touches the weapons of nemesis effectually slaughters his own peace of mind and challenges her maledictions from which there is no escape in my insanity i said vengeance is mine i will repay and in the hour when i daringly grasped the prerogative of god his curse smote me mr hammond friend of my happy youth guide of my innocent boyhood if you could know all the depths of my abasement you would pity me indeed my miserable heart is like the crater of some extinct volcano the flames of sin have burned out and left it rugged rent blackened and i do not think that say no more do not upbraid yourself so bitterly sir your words are kind and noble and full of christian charity they are well meant and i thank you but they cannot comfort me my desolation my utter wretchedness isolate me from the sympathy of my race whom i have despised and trampled so relentlessly yesterday i read a passage which depicts so accurately my dreary isolation that i have been unable to expel it i find it creeping even now to my lips o oh, misery and mourning i have felt yes i have felt like some deserted world that god hath done with and had cast aside to rock and stagger through the gulfs of space he never looking on it any more unfilled no use no pleasure not desired nor lighted on by angels in their flight from heaven to happier planets and the race that once hath dwelt on it withdrawn or dead could such a world have hoped that some blessed day god would remember her and fashion her anew yes my dear st elmo so surely as god reigns above us he will refashion it and make the light of his pardoning love and the refreshing dew of his grace fall upon it and the waste places shall bloom as jaron and the purpling vineyards shame and gendi and the lilies of peace shall lift up their stately heads and the voice of the turtle shall be heard in the land have faith grapple yourself by prayer to the feet of god and he will gird and lift up and guide you mr murray shook his head mournfully and the moonlight shining on his face showed it colourless haggard hopeless the pastor rose put on his hat and took st elmo's arm come home with me this spot is fraught with painful associations that open afresh all your wounds they walked on together until they reached the parsonage gate and as the minister raised the latch his companion gently disengaged the arm clasped to the old man's side not to-night after a few days i will try to come st elmo to-morrow is sunday and he paused and did not speak the request that looked out from his eyes it cost mr murray a severe struggle and he did not answer immediately when he spoke his voice was unsteady yes i know what you wish once i swore i would tear the church down scatter its dust to the winds leave not a stone to mark the site but i will come and hear you you preach for the first time since that sunny sabbath twenty years dead when your text was cast thy bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days sodden and bitter and worthless from the long tossing in the great deep of sin it drifts back at last to your feet and instead of stooping tenderly to gather up the useless fragments i wonder that you do not spurn the stranded ruin from you yes i will come thank god oh what a weight you have lifted from my heart st elmo my son there was a long lingering clasp of hands and the pastor went into his home with tears of joy on his furrowed face while his smiling lips whispered to his grateful soul in the morning sow thy seed and in the evening withhold not thy hand for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that or whether they both shall be alike good mr murray watched the stooping form until it disappeared and then went slowly back to the silent burying ground and sat down on the steps of the church hour after hour passed and still he sat there almost as motionless as one of the monuments while his eyes dwelt as if spellbound on the dark dull stain where annie hammond had rested in days long long past and remorse more powerful than erichtho evoked from the charnel house the sweet girlish features and fairy figure of the early dead 
his pale face was propped on his hand and there in the silent watches of the moonlighted midnight he held communion with god and his own darkened spirit what hast thou wrought for right and truth for god and man from the golden hours of bright-eyed youth to life's mid-span his almost satanic pride was laid low as the dead in their mouldering shrouds and all the giant strength of his perverted nature was gathered up and hurled in a new direction the dead sea passed moaned and swelled and bitter waves surged and broke over his heart but he silently buffeted them and the moon rode in mid-heaven when he rose and went around the church and knelt and prayed with his forehead pressed to the marble that covered murray hammond's last resting-place oh that the mist which veileth my to come would so dissolve and yield unto mine eyes a worthy path i'd count not wearisome long toil nor enterprise but strain to reach it i with wrestling stout is there such a path already made to fit the measure of my foot it shall atone for much if i at length may light on it and know it for mine own End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty eight on how grand and beautiful it is whenever i look at it i feel exactly as i did on easter sunday when i went to the cathedral to hear the music it is a solemn feeling as if i were in a holy place miss earl what makes me feel so felix stood in an art gallery and leaning on his crutches looked up at church's heart of the andes you are impressed by the solemnity and the holy repose of nature for here you look upon a pictured cathedral built not by mortal hands but by the architect of the universe felix does it not recall to your mind something of which we often speak the boy was silent for a few seconds and then his thin sallow face brightened yes indeed you mean that splendid description which you read to me from modern painters how fond you are of that passage and how very often you think of it let me see whether i can remember it slowly but accurately he repeated the eloquent tribute to mountain glory from the fourth volume of modern painters felix you know that a celebrated english poet keats has said a thing of beauty is a joy for ever and as i can never hope to express my ideas in half such beautiful language as mr ruskin uses it is an economy of trouble to quote his words some of his expressions are like certain songs which the more frequently we sing them the more valuable and eloquent they become and as we rarely learn a fine piece of music to be played once or twice and then thrown aside why should we not be allowed the same privilege with verbal melodies last week you asked me to explain to you what is meant by aerial perspective and if you will study the atmosphere in this great picture mr church will explain it much more clearly to you than i was able to do yes miss earl i see it now the eye could travel up and up and on and on and never get out of the sky and it seems to me those birds yonder would fly entirely away out of sight through that air in the picture but miss earl do you really believe that the chimborazo in south america is as grand as mr church's i do not because i have noticed that pictures are much handsomer than the real things they stand for mamma carried me last spring to see some paintings of scenes on the hudson river and when we went travelling in the summer i saw the very spot where the artist stood when he sketched the hills and the bend of the river and it was not half so pretty as the picture and yet i know god is the greatest painter is it the far-off look that everything wears when painted yes the far-off look as you call it is one cause of the effect you wish to understand and it has been rather more elegantly expressed by campbell in the line tis distance lends enchantment to the view i have seen this fact exemplified in a very singular manner at a house in georgia where i was once visiting from the front door i had a very fine prospect of or view of lofty hills and a dense forest and a pretty little town where the steeples of the churches glittered in the sunshine and i stood for some time admiring the landscape but presently when i turned to speak to the lady of the house i saw in the glass sidelights of the door a miniature reflection of the very same scene that was much more beautiful i was puzzled and could not comprehend how the mere fact of diminishing the size of the various objects by increasing the distance could enhance their loveliness and i asked myself whether 
all far-off things were handsomer than those close at hand in my perplexity i went as usual to mr ruskin wondering whether he had ever noticed the same thing and of course he had and as a noble passage about it in one of his books on architecture i will see if my memory appreciates it as it deserves are not all natural things it may be asked as lovely near as far away nay not so look at the clouds and watch the delicate sculpture of their alabaster sides and the rounded lustre of their magnificent rolling they are meant to be beheld far away they were shaped for this place high above your head approach them and they fuse into vague mists or whirl away in fierce fragments of thunderous vapours and here felix your question about chimborazo is answered look at the crest of the alps from the far-away plains over which its light is cast whence human souls have communion with it by their myriads the child looks up to it in the dawn and the husbandman in the burden and heat of the day and the old man in the going down of the sun and it is to them all as the celestial city on the world's horizon dyed with the depths of heaven and clothed with the calm of eternity there was it set for holy dominion by him who marked for the sun his journey and bade the moon know her going down it was built for its place in the far-off sky approach it and the glory of its aspect fades into blanched fearfulness its purple walls are rent into grisly rocks its silver fretwork saddened into wasting snow the storm brands of ages are on its breast the ashes of its own ruin lie solemnly on its white raiment felix in rambling about the fields you will frequently be reminded of this i have noticed that the meadow in the distance is always greener and more velvety and seems more thickly studded with flowers than the one i am crossing or the hillside far away has a golden gleam on its rocky slopes and the shadow spots are softer and cooler and more purple than those i am climbing and panting over and i have hurried on and after a little turning to look back low all the glory i saw beckoning me on has flown and settled over the meadow and the hillside that i have passed and the halo is behind perfect beauty in scenery is like the mirage that you read about yesterday it fades and flits out of your grasp as you travel toward it when we go home i will read you something which emerson has said concerning this same lovely ignis fatuus for i can remember only a few words what splendid distance what recesses of ineffable pomp and loveliness in the sunset but who can go where they are or lay his hand or plant his foot thereon all they fall from the round world for ever felix i suppose it is because we see all the imperfections and inequalities of objects close at hand but the fairy film of air like a silvery mist hides these when it is a distance and we are charmed with the heightened beauties which alone are visible edna's eyes went back to the painting and rested there and little hattie who had been gazing up at her governess in curious perplexity pulled her brother's sleeve and said bro felix do you understand all that i guess i don't for i know when i am hungry and it seems to me i always am why when i am hungry the closer i get to my dinner the nicer it looks and then there was that hateful spiteful old miss abby tomkins that mamma would have to teach you ugh i have watched her many a time coming up the street you know she never would ride in stages for fear of pickpockets and she always looked just as ugly as far off as i could see her as when she came close to me a hearty laugh cut short hattie's observation and coming forward sir roger percival put his hand on her head saying how often children tumble down the step from the sublime to the ridiculous and drag staid dignified folks after them miss earl i have been watching your little party for some time listening to your incipient art lecture you americans are queer people and when i go home i shall tell mr ruskin that i heard a little boy criticising the heart of the andes and quoting from modern painters felix as i wish to be accurate will you tell me your age the poor sensitive cripple imagined that he was being ridiculed and he only reddened and frowned and bit his thin lips edna laid her hand on his shoulder and answered for him just thirteen years old and though mr ruskin is a distinguished exception to the rule that prophets are not without honour save in their own country i think he is no reader who loves and admires his writing more than felix andrews here the boy raised his eyes and asked why is it that prophets have no honour among their own people is it because they too have to be seen from a great distance in order to seem grand i heard mamma say the other day that if some book written in america had only come from england everybody would be raving about it some other time felix we will talk of that problem hattie you look sleepy i think it will be lunch-time before we get home replied the yawning child 
sir roger took her by her shoulders and shook her gently saying come wake up little sweetheart how can you get sleepy or hungry with all these handsome pictures staring at you from the walls the good-natured child laughed but her brother who had an unconquerable aversion to sir roger's huge whiskers curled his lips and exclaimed scornfully hattie you ought to be ashamed of yourself hungry indeed you are almost as bad as that english lady who when her husband was admiring some beautiful lambs and called her attention to them answered yes lambs are beautiful boiled desirous of conciliating him sir roger replied when you and hattie come to see me in england i will show you the most beautiful lambs in the united kingdom and your sister shall have boiled lamb three times a day if she wishes it miss earl you are so fond of paintings that you would enjoy a european tour more than any lady whom i have met in this country i have seen miles of canvas in boston new york and philadelphia but very few good pictures and yet sir when on exhibition in europe this great work here before us received most extravagant praise from transatlantic critics who are very loath to accord merit to american artists if i am ever so fortunate as to be able to visit europe and cultivate and improve my taste i think i shall still be very proud of the names of alston west church bierstadt kensett and gifford she turned to quit the gallery and sir roger said i leave to-morrow for canada and may possibly sail for england without returning to new york will you allow me the pleasure of driving you to the park this afternoon two months ago you refused a similar request but since then i flatter myself we have become better friends thank you sir roger i presume the children can spare me and i will go with pleasure i will call at five o'clock he handed her and hattie into the coop tenderly assisted felix and saw them driven away presently felix laughed and exclaimed oh i hope miss morton will be in the park this evening it would be glorious fun to see her meet you and miss sir roger why felix oh because she meddles i heard uncle gray tell mamma that she was making desperate efforts to catch the englishman and that she turned up her nose tremendously at the idea of his visiting you when uncle gray told her how often he came to our house she bit her lips almost till the blood spouted sir roger drives very fine horses uncle says and miss morton hints outrageously for him to ask her to ride but she can't manage to get the invitation so she will be furious when she sees you this afternoon yonder is goopal's let us stop and have a look at those new engravings mamma told us about yesterday hattie you can curl up in your corner and go to sleep and dream of boiled lamb till we come back later in the day mrs andrews went up to edna's room and found her correcting an exercise at work as usual you are incorrigible any other woman would be so charmed with her conquest that her head would be quite turned by a certain pair of brown eyes that are considered irresistible come get ready for your drive it is almost five o'clock and you know foreigners are too polite too thoroughly well-bred not to be punctual no no miss earl not that hat on the peril of your life where is that new one that i ordered sent up to you two days ago it will match this delicate white shawl of mine which i brought up for you to wear and come no scruples if you please stand up and let me see whether its folds hang properly you should have heard madame de g when she put it around my shoulders for the first time juste ciel madame andres you are a greek statue miss earl put your hair back a little from the temple there now the veins show where are your gloves you look charmingly my dear only too pale too pale if you don't contrive to get up some colour people will swear that sir roger was airing the ghost of a pretty girl there is the bell just as i told you he is punctual five o'clock to a minute she stepped to the window and looked down at the equipage before the door what superb horses you will be the envy of the city there was something in the appearance and manner of sir roger which often reminded edna of gordon lee and during the spring he visited her so constantly sent her so frequently baskets of elegant flowers that he succeeded in overcoming her reticence and established himself on an exceedingly friendly footing in mrs andrews's house now as they drove along the avenue and entered the park their spirits rose and sir roger turned very often to look at the fair face of his companion which he found more and more attractive each day he saw too that under his earnest gaze the faint colour deepened until her cheeks glowed like sea-shells and when he spoke he bent his face much nearer to hers than was necessary to make her hear his words they talked of books flowers music mountain scenery and the green lanes of merry england edna was perfectly at ease and in a mood to enjoy everything they dashed on and the sunlight disappeared and the gas glittered all over the city before sir roger turned his horse's heads homeward when they reached mrs andrews's door he dismissed his carriage and spent the evening at eleven o'clock he rose to say good-bye miss earl i hope i shall have the pleasure of renewing our acquaintance at an early day 
if not in america in europe the brightest reminiscences i shall carry across the ocean are those that cluster about the hours i have spent with you if i should not return to new york will you allow me the privilege of hearing from you occasionally his clasp of the girl's hand was close but she withdrew it and her face flushed painfully as she answered will you excuse me sir roger when i tell you that i am so constantly occupied i have not time to write even to my old and dearest friends passing the door of felix's room on her way to her own apartment the boy called to her miss earl are you very tired oh no do you want anything my head aches and i can't go to sleep please read to me a little while he raised himself on his elbow and looked up fondly at her ah how very pretty you are to-night kiss me won't you she stooped and kissed the poor parched lips and as she opened a volume of the waverley novels he said did you see miss morton yes she was on horseback and we passed her twice glad of it she does not like you i guess she finds it as hard to get to sleep to-night as i do edna commenced reading and it was nearly an hour before felix's eyes closed and his fingers relaxed their grasp on hers softly she put the book back on the shelf extinguished the light and stole upstairs to her desk that night as sir roger tossed restlessly on his pillow thinking of her recalling all that she had said during the drive he would not have been either comforted or flattered by a knowledge of the fact that she was so entirely engrossed by her manuscript that she had no thought of him or his impending departure when the clock struck three she laid down her pen and the mournful expression that crept into her eyes told that memory was busy with the past years when she fell asleep she dreamed not of sir roger but of le bocage and its master of whom she would not permit herself to think in her waking hours the influence which mr manning exerted over edna increased as their acquaintance ripened and the admiring reverence with which she regarded the editor was exceedingly flattering to him with curious interest he watched the expansion of her mind and now and then warned her of some error into which she seemed inclined to plunge or wisely advised some new branch of research so firm was her confidence in his nature and dispassionate judgment that she yielded to his opinions a deferential homage such as she had scarcely paid even to mr hammond gradually and unconsciously she learned to lean upon his strong clear mind and to find in his society a quiet but very precious happiness the antagonism of their characters was doubtless one cause of the attraction which each found in the other and furnished the balance wheel which both required edna's intense and dreamy idealism demanded a check which the positivism of the editor supplied and his extensive and rigidly accurate information on almost all scientific topics constituted a valuable treasury of knowledge to which he never denied her access his faith in christianity was like his conviction of the truth of mathematics more an intellectual process and the careful deduction of logic than the result of some emotional impulse his religion like his dialectics was cold consistent irreproachable unanswerable never seeking a controversy on any subject he never shunned one and during its continuance his demeanour was invariably courteous but unyielding and even when severe he was rarely bitter very early in life his intellectual seemed to have swallowed up his emotional nature as aaron's rod did those of the magicians of pharaoh and only the absence of dogmatism and the habitual suavity of his manner atoned for his unbending obstinacy on all points edna's fervid and beautiful enthusiasm surged and chafed and broke over this man's stern flinty realism like the warm blue waters of the gulf stream that throw their silvery spray and foam against the glittering walls of sapphire icebergs sailing slowly southward her glowing imagery fell upon the bristling points of his close phalanx of arguments as gorgeous tropical garlands caught and impaled by bayonets until they faded merciless as an anatomical lecturer he would smilingly take up one of her metaphors and dissect it and over the pages of her manuscripts for maga his gravely spoken criticisms fell withering as hoar-frost they differed in all respects yet daily they felt the need of each other's society the frozen man of forty sunned himself in the genial presence of the lovely girl of nineteen and in the dawn of her literary career she felt a sense of security from his proffered guidance even as a wayward and ambitious child just learning to walk totters along with less apprehension when the strong steady hand it refuses to hold is yet near enough to catch and save from a serious fall while fearlessly attacking all heresy whether political scientific or ethical all latitudinarianism in manners and schialism in letters 
he commanded the confidence and esteem of all and became in great degree the centre around which the savants and literati of the city revolved through his influence edna made the acquaintance of some of the most eminent scholars and artists who formed this clique and she found that his friendship and recommendation was an open sesame to the charmed circle one saturday she sat with her bonnet on waiting for mr manning who had promised to accompany her on her first visit to greenwood and as she put on her gloves felix handed her a letter which his father had just brought up recognizing mrs murray's writing the governess read it immediately and while her eyes ran over the sheet an expression first of painful then of joyful surprise came into her countenance my dear child doubtless you will be amazed to hear that your quondam lover has utterly driven your image from his fickle heart and that he ignores your existence as completely as if you were buried twenty feet in the ruins of herculaneum last night gordon lee was married to gertrude powell and the happy pair attended by that despicable mother agnes powell will set out for europe early next week my dear it is growing fashionable to marry for spite i have seen two instances recently and know of a third which will take place ere long poor gordon will rue his rashness and before the year expires he will arrive at the conclusion that he is an unmitigated fool and has simply performed with great success an operation familiarly known as cutting off one's nose to spite one's face your rejection of his renewed offer piqued him beyond expression and when he returned from new york he was in exactly the most accommodating frame of mind which mrs powell could desire she immediately laid siege to him gertrude's undisguised preference for his society was extremely soothing to his vanity which you had so severely wounded and in fine the indefatigable manoeuvres of the wily mamma and the continual flattery of the girl who is really very pretty accomplished the result i once credited gordon with more sense than he has manifested but each year convinces me more firmly of the truth of my belief that no man is proof against the subtle and persistent flattery of a beautiful woman when he announced his engagement to me we were sitting in the library and i looked him full in the face and answered indeed engaged to miss powell i thought you swore that so long as edna earl remained unmarried you would never relinquish your suit he pointed to that lovely statuette of pallas that stands on the mantelpiece and said bitterly and the earl has no more heart than that marble athena whereupon i replied take care gordon i notice that of late you seem inclined to deal rather too freely in hyperbole edna's heart may resemble the rich veins of gold which in some minds run not near the surface but deep in the masses of quartz because you cannot obtain it you have no right to declare that it does not exist you will probably live to hear some more fortunate suitor shout eureka over the treasure he turned pale as the palace and put his hand over his face then i said gordon my young friend i have always been deeply interested in your happiness tell me frankly do you love this girl gertrude he seemed much embarrassed but finally made his confession mrs murray i believe i shall be fond of her after a while she is very lovely and deeply deeply attached to me vanity you see edna and i am grateful for her affection she will brighten my lonely home and at least i can be proud of her rare beauty but i never expect to love any woman as i loved edna earl i can pet gertrude i should have worshipped my first love my proud gifted peerless edna oh she will never realize all she threw away when she coldly dismissed me poor gordon well he is married but his bride might have found cause of disquiet in his restless abstracted manner on the evening of his wedding what do you suppose was st elmo's criticism on this matrimonial mismatch poor devil before a year rolls over his head he will feel like plunging into the atlantic with plymouth rock for a necklace lee deserves a better fate and i would rather see him tied to wild horses and dragged across the andes these peak marriages are terrible mistakes so my dear i trust you will duly repent of your cruelty to poor gordon as edna put the letter in her pocket she wondered whether gertrude really loved her husband or whether chagrin at mr murray's heartless desertion had not go to the girl to accept mr lee perhaps after all mr murray was correct in his estimate of her character when he said that she was a mere child and was capable of no very earnest affection i hope so i hope so edna sighed as she tried to assure herself of the probability that the newly married pair would become more attached as time passed and her thoughts returned to that paragraph in mrs murray's letter which seemed intentionally mysterious i know of a third instance which will take place ere long did she allude to her son and her niece edna could not believe this possible and shook her head at the suggestion but her lips grew cold and her fingers locked each other as in a clasp of steel 
when mr manning called and assisted her into the carriage he observed an unusual preoccupancy of mind but after a few desultory remarks she rallied gave him her undivided attention and seemed engrossed by his conversation it was a fine sunny day bright but cool with a fresh and stiffening west wind ripping the waters of the harbour the week had been one of unusual trial for felix was sick and even more than ordinarily fretful and exacting and weary of writing and of teaching so constantly the governess enjoyed the brief season of emancipation mr manning's long residence in the city had familiarized him with the beauties of greenwood and the history of many who slept dreamlessly in the costly mausoleums which they paused to examine and admire and when at last he directed the driver to return edna sank back in one corner of the carriage and said some morning i will come with the children and spend the entire day she closed her eyes and her thoughts travelled swiftly to that pure white obelisk standing in the shadow of lookout and melancholy memories brought a sigh to her lips and a slight cloud to the face that for two hours past had been singularly bright and animated the silence had lasted some minutes when mr manning who was gazing abstractedly out of the window turned to his companion and said you look pale and badly to-day i have not felt as strong as usual and it is a great treat to get away from the schoolroom and out into the open air which is bracing and delightful i believe i have enjoyed this outing more than any i have taken since i came north and you must allow me to tell you how earnestly i thank you for your considerate remembrance of me miss earl what i am about to say will perhaps seem premature and will doubtless surprise you but i beg you to believe that it is the result of mature deliberation he paused and looked earnestly at her you certainly have not decided to give up the editorship of maga as you spoke of doing last winter it would not survive your desertion six months my allusion was to yourself not to the magazine which i presume i shall edit as long as i live miss earl this state of affairs cannot continue you have no regard for your health which is suffering materially and you are destroying yourself you must let me take care of you and save you from the ceaseless toil in which you are rapidly wearing out your life to teach as you do all day and then sit up nearly all night to write would exhaust a constitution of steel or brass you are probably not aware of the great change which has taken place in your appearance during the last three months hitherto circumstances may have left you no alternative but one is now offered you my property is sufficient to render you comfortable i have already purchased a pleasant home to which i shall remove next week and i want you to share it with me to share my future all that i have you have known me scarcely a year but you are not a stranger to my character or position and i think that you repose implicit confidence in me notwithstanding the unfortunate disparity in our years i believe we are becoming mutually dependent on each other and in your society i find a charm such as no other human being possesses though i have no right to expect that a girl of your age can derive equal pleasure from the companionship of a man old enough to be her father i am not demonstrative but my feelings are warm and deep and however incredulous you may be i assure you that you are the first the only woman i have ever asked to be my wife i have known many who were handsome and intellectual whose society i have really enjoyed but not one until i met you whom i would have married to you alone am i willing to entrust the education of my little lila she was but six months old when we were wrecked off barnegat and in attempting to save his wife my brother was lost with the child in my arms i clung to a spar and finally swam ashore and since then regarding her as a sacred treasure committed to my guardianship i have faithfully endeavoured to supply her father's place there is a singular magnetism about you and earl which makes me wish to see your face always at my hearthstone and for the first time in my life i want to say to the world this woman wears my name and belongs to me for ever you are inordinately ambitious i can lift you to a position that will fully satisfy you and place you above the necessity of daily labour a position of happiness and ease where your genius can properly develop itself can you consent to be douglas manning's wife there was no more tremor in his voice than in the measured beat of a bass drum and in his granite face not a feature moved not a muscle twitched not a nerve quivered so entirely unexpected was this proposal that edna could not utter a word the idea that he could ever wish to marry anybody seemed incredible and that he should need her society appeared utterly absurd for an instant she wondered if she had fallen asleep in the soft luxurious corner of the carriage and dreamed it all completely bewildered she sat looking wonderingly at him miss earl you do not seem to comprehend me and yet my words are certainly very explicit 
once more i ask you can you put your hand in mine and be my wife he laid one hand on hers and with the other pushed back his glasses withdrawing her hands she covered her face with them and answered almost inaudibly let me think for you astonish me take a day or a week if necessary for consideration and then give me your answer mr manning leaned back in the carriage folded his hands and looked quietly out of the window and for a half-hour silence reigned brief but sharp was the struggle in edna's heart probably no woman's literary vanity and ambition has ever been more fully gratified than was hers by this most unexpected offer of marriage from one whom she had been taught to regard as the noblest ornament of the profession she had selected thinking of the hour when she sat alone shedding tears of mortification and bitter disappointment over his curt letter rejecting her manuscript she glanced at the stately form beside her the mysteriously calm commanding face the large white finely moulded hands waiting to clasp hers for all time and her triumph seemed complete to rule the destiny of that strong man whose intellect was so influential in the world of letters was a conquest of which until this hour she had never dreamed and the blacksmith's darling was after all a mere woman and the honour dazzled her to one of her peculiar temperament wealth offered no temptation but douglas manning had climbed to a grand eminence and looking up at it she knew that any woman might well be proud to share it he filled her ideal he came fully up to her lofty moral and mental standard she knew that his superior she could never hope to meet and her confidence in his integrity of character was boundless she felt that his society had become necessary to her peace of mind for only in his presence was it possible to forget her past either she must marry him or live single and work and die alone to a girl of nineteen the latter alternative seems more appalling than to a woman of thirty whose eyes have grown strong in the grey cold sunless light of confirmed old maidenhood even as the vision of those who live in dim caverns requires not the lamps needed by newcomers fresh from the dazzling outer world edna was weary of battling with precious memories of that reckless fascinating cynic whom without trusting she had learned to love and she thought that perhaps if she were the wife of mr manning whom without loving she fully trusted it would help her to forget st elmo she did not deceive herself she knew that despite her struggles and stern interdicts she loved him as she could never hope to love any one else impatiently she said to herself mr murray is as old as mr manning and in the estimation of the public is his inferior oh why can not my weak wayward heart follow my strong clear-eyed judgment i would give ten years of my life to love mr manning as i love she compared a swarthy electrical face scowling and often repulsively harsh with one cloudless and noble over which brooded a solemn and perpetual peace and she almost groaned aloud in her chagrin and self-contempt as she thought surely if ever a woman was infatuated possessed by an evil spirit i certainly am in attempting to institute a parallel between the two men one seemed serene majestic and pure as the vast snow-dome of orifa glittering in the chill light of midsummer midnight suns the other fiery thunderous destructive as isalco one moment crowned with flames and lava lashed the next wrapped in gloom and dust and ashes while she sat there wrestling as she had never done before even on that day of trial in the church memory as if leagued with satan brought up the image of mr murray as he stood pleading for himself for his future she heard once more his thrilling passionate cry oh my darling my darling come to me and pressing her face to the lining of the carriage to stifle a groan she seemed to feel again the close clasp of his arms the throbbing of his heart against her cheek the warm tender lingering pressure of his lips on hers 
when they had crossed the ferry and were rattling over the streets of new york edna took her hands from her eyes and there was a rigid paleness in her face and a mournful hollowness in her voice as she said almost sorrowfully no mr manning we do not love each other and i can never be your wife it is useless for me to assure you that i am flattered by your preference that i am inexpressibly proud of the distinction you have generously offered to confer upon me sir you cannot doubt that i do most fully and gratefully appreciate this honour which i had neither the right to expect nor the presumption to dream of my reverence and admiration are i confess almost boundless but i find not one atom of love and an examination of my feelings satisfies me that i could never yield you that homage of heart that devoted affection which god demands that every wife should pay her husband you have quite as little love for me we enjoy each other's society because our pursuits are similar our tastes congenial our aspirations identical in pleasant and profitable companionship we can certainly indulge as heretofore and it would greatly pain me to be deprived of it in future but this can be ours without the sinful mockery of a marriage for such i hold a loveless union i feel that i must have your esteem and your society but your love i neither desire nor ever expect to possess for the sentiments you cherish for me are precisely similar to those which i entertain toward you mr manning we shall always be firm friends but nothing more an expression of surprise and disappointment drifted across but did not settle on the editor's quiet countenance turning to her he answered with grave gentleness judge your own heart edna and accept my verdict with reverence to mine do you suppose that after living single all these years i would ultimately marry a woman for whom i had no affection you spoke last week of the mirror of john galeazzo visconti which showed his beloved correggia her own image and though i am a proud and reticent man i beg you to believe that could you look into my heart you would find it such a mirror permit me to ask whether you intend to accept the love which i have reason to believe mr murray has offered you mr manning i never expect to marry any one for i know i shall never meet your superior and yet i cannot accept your most flattering offer you fill all my requirements of noble christian manhood but after to-day this subject must not be alluded to are you not too hasty will you not take more time for reflection is your decision mature and final yes mr manning final unchangeable but do not throw me from you i am very very lonely and you surely will not forsake me there were tears in her eyes as she looked up pleadingly in his face and the editor sighed and paused a moment before he replied edna if under any circumstances you feel that i can aid or advise you i shall be exceedingly glad to render all the assistance in my power rest assured i shall not forsake you as long as we both shall live call upon me without hesitation and i will respond as readily and promptly as to the claims of my little lila in my heart you are associated with her you must not tax yourself so unremittingly or you will soon ruin your constitution there is a weariness in your face and a languor in your manner mournfully prophetic of failing health either give up your situation as governess or abandon your writing i certainly recommend the former as i cannot spare you from maga here the carriage stopped at mrs andrews's door and as he handed her out mr manning said and my friend promise me that you will not write to-night thank you mr manning i promise she did not go to her desk but felix was restless feverish querulous and it was after midnight when she laid her head on her pillow the milkmen in their noisy carts were clattering along the streets next morning before her heavy eyelids closed and she fell into a brief troubled slumber over which flitted a fata morgana of dreams where the central figure was always that tall one whom she had seen last standing at the railroad station with a rein 
dripping over him end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of st elmo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter twenty nine let thy abundant blessing rest upon it o almighty god else indeed my labour will be in vain paul planted apollo's watered but thou only can give the increase it is finished look down in mercy and sanctify it and accept it the night was almost spent when edna laid down her pen and raised her clasped hands over the manuscript which she had just completed for many weary months she had toiled to render it worthy of its noble theme had spared neither time nor severe trains of thought by day and by night she had searched and pondered she had prayed fervently and ceaselessly and worked arduously unflaggingly to accomplish this darling hope of her heart to embody successfully this ambitious dream and at last the book was finished the manuscript was a mental tapestry into which she had woven exquisite shades of thought and curious and quaint devices and rich glowing imagery that necked the groundwork with purple and amber and gold but would the design be duly understood and appreciated by the great busy bustling world for whose amusement and improvement she had laboured so assiduously at the spinning wheels of fancy the loom of thought would her fellow-creatures accept it in the earnest loving spirit in which it had been manufactured would they hang this goblin of her brain along the walls of memory and turn to it tenderly reading reverently its ciphers and its illuminations or would it be rent and ridiculed and trampled under foot this book was a shrine to which her purest thoughts her holiest aspirations travelled like pilgrims offering the best of which her nature was capable would those for whom she had patiently chiselled and built it guard and prize and keep it or smite and overturn and defile it looking down at the mass of manuscript now ready for the printer a sad tender yearning expression filled the author's eyes and her little white hands passed caressingly over its closely written pages as a mother's soft fingers might lovingly stroke the face of a child about to be thrust out into a hurrying crowd of cold indifferent strangers who perhaps would rudely jeer at and browbeat her darling for several days past edna had worked hard to complete the book and now at last she could fold her tired hands and rest her weary brain but outraged nature suddenly swore vengeance and her overworked nerves rose in fierce rebellion refusing to be calm she had so long anticipated this hour that its arrival was greeted by emotions beyond her control as she contemplated the possible future of that pile of manuscript her heart bounded madly and then once more a fearful agony seized her and darkness and a sense of suffocation came upon her rising she strained her eyes and groped her way toward the window but ere she reached it fell and lost all consciousness the sound of the fall the crash of a china vase which her hand had swept from the table echoed startlingly through the silent house and aroused some of its inmates mrs andrews ran upstairs and into felix's room saw that he was sleeping soundly and then she hastened up another flight of steps to the apartment occupied by the governess the gas burned dazzlingly over the table where rested the roll of manuscript and on the floor near the window lay edna 
ringing the bell furiously to summon her husband and the servants mrs andrews knelt raised the girl's head and rubbing her cold hands tried to rouse her the heart beat faintly and seemed to stop now and then and the white rigid face was as ghastly as if the dread kiss of samuel had indeed been pressed upon her still lips finding all her restoratives ineffectual mrs andrews sent her husband for the family physician and with the assistance of the servants laid the girl on her bed when the doctor arrived and questioned her she could furnish no clue to the cause of the attack save by pointing to the table where pen and paper showed that the sufferer had been at work edna opened her eyes at last and looked around at the group of anxious faces but in a moment the spasm of pain returned twice she muttered something and putting his ear close to her mouth the doctor heard her whispering to herself never mind it is done at last now i can rest an hour elapsed before the paroxysms entirely subsided and then with her ivory-like hands clasped and thrown up over her head the governess slept heavily dreamlessly for two days she remained in her own apartment and on the morning of the third came down to the schoolroom with a slow weary step and a bloodless face and a feeling of hopeless helplessness she dispatched her manuscript to the publisher to whom she had resolved to offer it and leaning far back in her chair took up felix's greek grammar since the days of dionysius thrax it had probably never appeared so tedious so intolerably tiresome as she found it now and she felt relieved almost grateful when mrs andrews sent for her to come to the library where dr howell was waiting to see her seating himself beside her the physician examined her countenance and pulse and put his ear close to her heart miss earl have you had many such attacks as the one whose effects have not yet passed away this is the second time i have suffered so severely though very frequently i find a disagreeable fluttering about my heart which is not very painful what mode of treatment have you been following none sir i have never consulted a physician huh is it possible he looked at her with the keen incisive eye of his profession and pressed his ear once more to her heart listening to the irregular and rapid pulsations miss earl are you an orphan yes sir have you any living relatives none that i ever heard of did any of your family die suddenly yes i have been told that my mother died while apparently as well as usual and engaged in spinning and my grandfather i found dead sitting in his rocking-chair smoking his pipe dr howell cleared his throat sighed and was silent he saw a strange startled expression leap into the large shadowy eyes and the mouth quivered the wan face grew whiter and the thin fingers grasped each other but she said nothing and they sat looking at one another the physician had come like daniel to the banquet of life and solved for the belshazzar of youth the hideous riddle scrawled on the walls dr howe can you do nothing for me her voice had sunk to a whisper and she leaned eagerly forward to catch his answer miss earl do you know what is meant by hypertrophy of the heart yes yes i know she shivered slightly whether you inherited your disease i am not prepared to say but certainly in your case there are some grounds for the belief presently she said abstractedly but grandpa lived to be an old man the doctor's eyes fell upon the mosaic floor of the library and then she knew that he could give her no hope when at last he looked up again he saw that she had dropped her face in her palms and he was awed by the death-like repose of her figure the calm fortitude she evinced miss earl i never deceive my patients it is useless to dose you with medicine and drag you into semi-insensibility you must have rest and quiet rest for mind as well as body there must be no more teaching or writing you are overworked and incessant mental labour has hastened the approach of a disease which under other circumstances might have encroached very slowly and imperceptibly if latent which is barely possible it has contributed to a fearfully rapid development 
refrain from study avoid all excitement exercise moderately but regularly in the open air and above all things do not tax your brain if you carefully observe these directions you may live to be as old as your grandfather heart diseases baffle prophecy and i make no predictions he rose and took his hat from the table miss earl i have read your writings with great pleasure and watched your brightening career with more interest than i ever felt in any other female author and god knows it is exceedingly painful for me to tear away the veil from your eyes from the first time you were pointed out to me in church i saw that in your countenance which distressed and alarmed me for its marble pallor whispered that your days were numbered frequently i have been tempted to come and expostulate with you but i knew it would be useless you have no reader who would more earnestly deplore the loss of your writings but for your own sake i beg you to throw away your pen and rest she raised her head and a faint smile crept feebly across her face rest rest if my time is so short i cannot afford to rest there is so much to do so much that i have planned and hoped to accomplish i am only beginning to learn how to handle my tools my life work is as yet barely begun when my long rest overtakes me i must not be found idly sitting with folded hands since i was thirteen years old i have never once rested and now i am afraid i never shall i would rather die working than live a drone but my dear miss earl those who love you have claims upon you i am alone in this world i have no family to love me and my work is to me what i suppose dear relatives must be to other women for six years i have been studying to fit myself for usefulness i have lived within four books and though i have a few noble and kind friends do you suppose i ever forget that i am kinless it is a mournful thing to know that you are utterly isolated among millions of human beings that not a drop of your blood flows in any other veins my god only has a claim upon me dr howell i thank you for your candour it is best that i should know the truth and i am glad that instead of treating me like a child you have frankly told me all more than once i have had a singular feeling a shadowy presentiment that i should not live to be an old woman but i thought it the relic of childish superstition and i did not imagine that that i might be called away at any instant i did not suspect that just as i had arranged my workshop and sharpened all my tools and measured off my work that my morning sun would set suddenly in the glowing east and the long cold night fall upon me wherein no man can work her voice faltered and the physician turned away and looked out of the window i am not afraid of death nor am i so wrapped up in the mere happiness which this world gives no no but i love my work ah i want to live long enough to finish something grand and noble something that will live when the hands that fashioned it have crumbled back to dust something that will follow me across and beyond the dark silent valley something that cannot be hushed and straightened and bandaged and screwed down under my coffin lid oh something that will echo in eternity that grandpa and i can hear sounding down the ages making music for the people when i go to my final rest and please god i shall i will o oh, doctor i have a feeling here which assures me that i shall be spared till i finish my darling scheme you know glanville said and poe quoted man doth not yield himself to the angels nor unto death utterly save only through the weakness of his feeble will mine is strong invincible it will sustain me for a longer period than you seem to believe the end is not yet doctor do not tell people what you have told me i do not want to be watched and pitied like a doomed victim who walks about the scaffold with a rope already around his neck let the secret rest between you and me he looked wonderingly at the electric white face and something in its chill radiance reminded him of the borealis light that waves its ghostly banners over a cold midnight sky god grant that i may be in error concerning your disease and that three score years and ten may be allotted you to embody the airy dreams you love so well i repeat if you wish to prolong your days give yourself more rest i can do you little good 
still if at any time you fancy that i can aid or relieve you do not hesitate to send for me i shall come to see you as a friend who reads and loves all that has yet fallen from your pen god help and bless you child as he left the room she locked the door and walked slowly back to the low mantelpiece resting her arms on the black marble she laid her head down upon them and ambition and death stared face to face and held grim parley over the coveted prey taking the probable measure of her remaining days edna fearlessly fronted the future and pondered the possibility of crowding into two years the work which he had designed for twenty to tell the girl to rest was a mockery the tides of thought ebbed and flowed as ceaselessly as those of ocean and work had become a necessity of her existence she was far far beyond the cool quiet palms of rest far out on the burning sands and the bar shaitan rippled and glittered and beckoned and she panted and pressed on one book was finished but before she had completed it the form and features of another struggled in her busy brain and she longed to put them on paper the design of the second book appeared to her partial eyes almost perfect and the first seemed insignificant in comparison trains of thought that had charmed her making her heart throb and her temples flush and metaphors that glowed as she wrote them down ah how tame and trite all look now in the brighter light of a newer revelation the attained the achieved tarnished in her grasp all behind was done all beyond clothed with a dazzling glory that lured her on once the fondest hopes of her heart had been to finish the book now in the publisher's hands but ere it could be printed other characters other aims other scenes usurped her attention if she could only live long enough to incarnate the new ideal moreover she knew that memory would spring up and renew its almost intolerable torture the moment that she gave herself to aimless reveries and she felt that her sole hope of peace of mind her only rest was in earnest and unceasing labour subtle associations merciless as the chains of bonivar bound her to a past which she was earnestly striving to forget and she continually paced as far off as her shackles would permit sternly refusing to sit down meekly at the foot of the stake she worked late at night until her body was exhausted because she dreaded to lie awake tossing helplessly on her pillow haunted by precious recollections of days gone by for ever her name was known in the world of letters her reputation was already enviable extravagant expectations were entertained concerning her future and to maintain her hold on public esteem to climb higher had become necessary for her happiness through mr manning's influence and friendship she was daily making the acquaintance of leading men in literature and their letters and conversation stimulated her to renewed exertion yet she had never stooped to conciliate popular prejudices had never written a line which her conscience did not dictate and her religious convictions sanction had bravely attacked some of the pet vices and shameless follies of society and had never penned a page without a prayer for guidance from on high now in her path rose god's reaper swinging his shining sickle threatening to cut off and lay low her budding laurel wreath while she stood silent and motionless in the quiet library the woman's soul was wrestling with god for permission to toil a little while longer on earth to do some good for her race and to assist in saving a darkened soul almost as dear to her as her own she never knew how long that struggle for life lasted but when the prayer ended and she lifted her face the shadows and the sorrowful dread had passed away and the old calm the old sweet patient smile reigned over pale worn features early in july felix's feeble health forced his mother to abandon her projected tour to the white mountains and in accordance with dr howell's advice mr andrews removed his family to a seaside summer place which he had owned for some years but rarely occupied as his wife preferred 
newport saratoga and the hants the house at the willows was large and airy the ceilings were high windows wide and a broad piazza stretching across the front was shaded by two aged and enormous willows that stood on either side of the steps and gave a name to the place the fresh matting on the floors the light cane sofa and chairs the white muslin curtains and newly painted green blinds imparted an appearance of delicious coolness and repose to the rooms and while not one bright-hued painting was visible the walls were hung with soft grey misty engravings of landseer's pictures framed in carved ebony and rosewood and oak the gilded splendour of the fifth avenue house was left behind here simplicity and quiet comfort held sway even the china wore no glitter but was enamelled with green wreaths of vine leaves and the vases held only plumy ferns fresh and dewy low salt meadow lands extended east and west waving fields of corn stretched northward and the slight knoll on which the building stood sloped smoothly down to the ever moaning foam fretted bosom of the blue atlantic to the governess and her pupils the change from new york heat and bustle to seaside rest was welcome and delightful and during the long july days when the strong ocean breeze tossed aside the willow boughs and swept through the rusting blinds and lifted the hair on edna's hot temples she felt as if she had indeed taken a new lease on life for several weeks her book had been announced as in press and her publishers printed most flattering circulars which heightened expectation and paved the way for its favourable reception save the first chapter rejected by mr manning long before no one had seen the manuscript and while the reading public was on the qui vive the author was rapidly maturing the plot of a second work finally the book was bound editors copies winged their way throughout the country the curious eagerly supplied themselves with the latest publication and edna's destiny as an author hung in the balance it was with strange emotions that she handled the copy sent to her for it seemed indeed a part of herself she knew that her own heart was throbbing in its pages and wondered whether the great world pulses would beat in unison instead of a preface she had quoted on the title page those pithy lines in aurora lee my critic belfair wants a book entirely different which will sell and live a striking book yet not a startling book the public blames originalities you must not pump spring water unawares upon a gracious public full of nerves good things not subtle new yet orthodox as easy reading as the dog-eared page that's fingered by said public fifty years since first taught spelling by its grandmother and yet a revelation in some sort that's hard my critic belfair now as edna nestled her fingers among the pages of her book a tear fell and moistened them and the unvoiced language of her soul was grandpa do you keep close enough to me to read my book oh do you like it are you satisfied are you proud of your poor little pearl the days were tediously long while she waited in suspense for the result of the weighing in editors sanctums for the awful verdict of the critical sanhedrim a week dragged itself away and the severity of the decree might have entitled it to one of those slips of blue paper upon which frederick the great required his courts to inscribe their sentences of death edna learned the full import of the words he that writes or makes a feast more certainly invites his judges than his friends there is not a guest but will find something wanting or ill-dressed newspapers pronounced the book a failure some sneered in a gentlemanly manner employing polite phraseology others coarsely caricatured it many were insulted by its incomprehensible erudition a few growled at its shallowness to-day there was a hint at plagiarism to-morrow an outright wholesale theft was asserted now she was a pedant and then a skylist reviews poured in upon her thick and fast all found grievous faults but no two reviewers settled on the same error what one seemed disposed to consider almost laudable 
the other denounced violently one eminently shrewd lynx-eyed editor discovered that two of her characters were stolen from a book which edna had never seen and another equally ingenious and penetrating found her entire plot in a work of which she had never heard while a third shocked at her pedantry indignantly assured her readers that they had been imposed upon that the learning was all picked up from encyclopedias whereat the young author could not help laughing heartily and wondered why if her learning had been so easily gleaned her irate and insulted critics did not follow her example the book was for many days snubbed buffeted browbeaten and the care fully woven tapestry was torn into shreds and trampled upon and it seemed that the patiently sculptured shrine was overturned and despised and desecrated edna was astonished she knew that her work was not perfect but she was equally sure that it was not contemptible she was surprised rather than mortified and was convinced from the universal howling that she had wounded more people than she dreamed were vulnerable she felt that the impetuosity and savageness of the attacks must necessitate a recoil and though it was difficult to be patient under such circumstances she waited quietly undismayed by the clamour meantime the book sold rapidly the publishers could scarcely supply the demand and at last mr manning's magazine appeared and the yelping pack of dandy dinmont's pets old mustard and little mustard old pepper and little pepper young mustard and young pepper stood silent and listened to the roar of the lion the review of edna's work was headed by that calm retort of job to his self-complacent censors no doubt but ye are the people and wisdom shall die with you and it contained a withering rebuke to those who had so flippantly essayed to crush the young writer mr manning handled the book with the stern impartiality which gave such value to his criticisms treating it as if it had been written by an utter stranger he analyzed it thoroughly and while pointing out some serious errors which had escaped all eyes but his he bestowed upon a few passages praise which no other american writer had ever received from him and predicted that they would live when those who attempted to ridicule them were utterly forgotten in their graves the young author was told that she had not succeeded in her grand aim because the subject was too vast for the limits of a novel and her acquaintance with the mythologies of the world was not sufficiently extensive or intimate but she was encouraged to select other themes more in accordance with the spirit of the age in which she lived and the assurance was given to her that her writings were destined to exert a powerful influence on her race some faults of style were gravely reprimanded some beauties most cordially eulogized and held up for the admiration of the world edna had as little literary conceit as personal vanity she saw and acknowledged the errors pointed out by mr manning and resolved to avoid them in future she felt that some objections urged against her book were valid but knew that she was honest and earnest in her work and could not justly be accused of trifling gratefully and joyfully she accepted mr manning's verdict and turned her undivided attention upon her new manuscript while the critics snarled the mass of readers warmly approved and many who did not fully appreciate all her arguments and illustrations were at least clear-eyed enough to perceive that it was their misfortune not her fault gradually the book took firm hold on the affections of the people and a few editors came boldly to the rescue and ably championed it during these days of trial edna could not avoid observing one humiliating fact that saddened without embittering her nature she found that instead of sympathizing with her she received no mercy from authors who as a class outherited herod in their denunciations and left her little room to doubt that envies a sharper spur than pay and unprovoked twill court the fray no author ever spared a brother wits are game cocks to one another End of chapter 29
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. st elmo by augusta jane evans chapter thirty miss earl you promised that as soon as i finished the antiquary you would read me a description of the spot which sir walter scott selected for the scene of his story we have read the last chapter now please remember your promise felix in your hunger for books you remind me of the accounts given of cormorants the antiquary ought to satisfy you for the present and furnish food for thought that would last at least till to-morrow still if you exact an immediate fulfilment of my promise i am quite ready to comply edna took from her work-basket a new and handsomely illustrated volume and read bertram's graphic description of auchmithy and the coast of forfarshire finding that her pupils were deeply interested in the fisher folk she read on and on and when she began the pathetic story of the widow at preston pans hattie's eyes widened with wonder and felix's were dim with tears we can't then that we micked look across the sea but our the waters would never blink the een that made sunshine around our hearse o'er the waters would never come the voices that were mayer delightful than the music of the simmer winds when the leaves gang dancing till they sang my story sir is done i hae nae mare te tell sufficient and suffice it to say that there was great grief at the pans rachel weeping for her weans and wouldna be comforted the windows were darkened and the air was heavy with sighing and sabin the governess closed the book laid it back in her basket and raising the lid of the piano she sang that sad wailing lyric of kingsley's the three fishers it was one of those rare and royal afternoons late in august when summer conscious that her reign is well nigh ended gathers all her gorgeous drapery and proudly robes the world in regal pomp and short-lived splendour pearly cloud islets with silver strands clustered in the calm blue of the upper air soft salmon-hued cumulus masses sailed solemnly along the eastern horizon atmospheric ships freighted in the tropics with crystal showers for thirsty fields and parched meadows with snow crowns for icelandic mountain brows and shrouds of sleep for mouldering masts tossed high and helpless on desolate arctic cliffs restless gulls flashed their spotless wings as they circled and dipped in the shining waves and in the magic light of evening the swelling canvas of a distant sloop glittered like plate glass smitten with sunshine a strong steady southern breeze curled and crested the beautiful bounding billows over which a fishing smack danced like a gilded bubble and as the aged willows bowed their heads it whispered messages from citron palm and orange groves gleaming far far away under the white fire of the southern crown strange tidings these winged winds waft over sea and land and to-day listening to low tones that travelled to her from lerbocage edna looked out over the ever-changing wrinkled face of the ocean and fell into a reverie silence reigned in the sitting-room hattie fitted a new tarlatan dress on her doll and felix was dreaming of preston pans the breeze swept over the cluster of tuscan jasmine and the tall snowy flocks nodding in the green vase on the table and shook the muslin curtains till light and shadow chased each other like waves over the noble longi engraving of raphael's vision of ezekiel which hung just above the piano after a while felix took his chin from the window-sill and his eyes from the sparkling tossing water and his gaze sought the beloved countenance of his governess the mouth with steady sweetness set and eyes conveying unaware the distant hint of some regret that harboured there her dress was of white mull with lace gathered around the neck and wristbands 
a delicate fringy fern leaf was caught by the cameo that pinned the lace collar and around the heavy coil of hair at the back of her head hattie had twined a spray of scarlet tacoma save the faint red on her thin flexible lips her face was as stainless as that of the hebrew mary in a carved ivory descent from the cross which hung over the mantelpiece as the boy watched her he thought the beautiful eyes were larger and deeper and burned more brilliantly than ever before and the violet shadows beneath them seemed to widen day by day telling of hard study and continued vigils pale and peaceful patiently sad without a trace of bitterness or harshness her countenance might have served as a model for some which airy sheffer dimly saw in his rapt musings over wilhelm meister oh yonder comes mamma and uncle gray no that is not my uncle gray who can it be it is sir roger hattie ran out to meet her mother who had been to new york and felix frowned took up his crutches and put on his hat edna turned and went to her own room and in a few moments hattie brought her a package of letters and a message from mrs andrews desiring her to come back to the sitting-room glancing over the directions the governess saw that all the letters were from strangers except one from mrs murray which she eagerly opened the contents were melancholy and unexpected mr hammond had been very ill for weeks was not now in immediate danger but was confined to his room and the physicians thought that he would never be well again he had requested mrs murray to write and beg edna to come to him and remain in his house mrs powell was in europe with gertrude and gordon and the old man was alone in his home mrs murray and her son having taken care of him thus far at the bottom of the page mr hammond has scrawled almost illegibly my dear child i need you come to me at once mrs murray had added a postscript to tell her that if she would telegraph them upon what day she could arrange to start mr murray would come to new york for her edna put the letter out of sight and girded herself for a desperate battle with her famishing heart which bounded wildly at the tempting joy spread almost within reach the yearning to go back to the dear old parsonage to the revered teacher to cheer and brighten his declining days and above all to see mr murray's face to hear his voice once more oh the temptation was strong indeed and the cost of resistance bitter beyond precedent having heard incidentally of the reconciliation that had taken place she knew why mr hammond so earnestly desired her presence in a house where mr murray now spent much of his time she knew all the arguments all the pleadings to which she must listen and she dared not trust her heart enter not into temptation was the warning which she uttered again and again to her own soul and though she feared the pastor would be pained she felt that he would not consider her ungrateful knew that his warm tender heart would understand hers though she had always studiously endeavoured to expel mr murray from her thoughts there came hours when his image conquered when the longing the intense wish to see him was overmastering when she felt that she would give ten years of her life for one long look into his face or for a picture of him now when she had only to say come and he would be with her she sternly denied her starving heart and instead of bread gave it stones and serpents she took her pen to answer the letter but a pang which she had learned to understand told her that she was not now strong enough and swallowing some medicine which dr howell had prescribed she snatched up a crimson scarf and went down to the beach the serenity of her countenance had broken up in a fearful tempest and her face writhed as she hurried along to overtake felix just now she dreaded to be alone and yet the only companionship she could endure was that of the feeble cripple whom she had learned to love as woman can love only when all her early idols are in the dust wait for me felix the boy stopped turned and limped back to meet her for there was a strange pleading intonation in her mournfully sweet voice what is the matter miss earl you look troubled i only want to walk with you for i feel lonely this evening miss earl have you seen sir roger percival no no why should i see him felix my darling my little brother do not call me miss earl any longer call me edna ah child i am utterly alone i must have somebody to love me my heart turns to you she passed her arm around the boy's shoulders and leaned against him 
while he rested on his crutches and looked up at her with fond pride edna i have wanted to call you so since the day i first saw you you know very well that i love you better than everything else in the world if there is any good in me i shall have to thank you for it if ever i am useful it will be your work i am wicked still but i never look at you without trying to be a better boy you do not need me you who are so great and gifted whose writings everybody reads and admires whose name is already famous oh you cannot need any one and least of all a poor little helpless cripple who can only worship you and love the sound of your voice better than all the music that ever was played if i thought that you miss earl whose book all the world is talking about if i thought you really cared for me oh edna edna i believe my heart would be too big for my poor little body felix we need each other do you suppose i would have followed you out here if i did not prefer your society to that of others something has happened since you sang the three fishes and sat looking out of the window an hour ago your face has changed what is it edna can you can't you trust me yes i received a letter which troubles me it announces the feeble health of a dear and noble friend who writes begging me to come to him and nurse and remain with him as long as he lives you need not start and shiver so i am not going i shall not leave you but it distresses me to know that he has asked an impossible thing now you can understand why i did not wish to be alone she leaned her cheek down on the boy's head and both stood silent looking over the wide heaving waste of immemorial waters a glowing orange sky overarched an orange ocean which slowly became in turn ruby and rose and violet and pearly gray powdered with a few dim stars as the rising waves broke along the beach the stiffening breeze bent the spray till it streamed like silvery plumes and the low musical murmur swelled to a monotonous moan that seemed to come over the darkening waters like wails of the lost from some far far isles of the sea awed by the mysterious solemnity which ever broods over the ocean felix slowly repeated that dirge of tennyson's break 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 and when he commenced the last verse edna's voice low and quivering joined his out of the eastern sea up through gauzy cloud bars rose the moon round radiant almost full shaking off the mists burnishing the waves with a ghostly lustre the wind rose and fluttered edna's scarlet scarf like a pirate's pennon and the low moan became a deep sullen ominous mutter there will be a gale before daylight it is brewing down yonder at the southwest the wind has veered since we came out there did you notice what a savage snort there was in that last gust felix pointed to the distant water-line where now and then a bluish flash of lightning showed the teeth of the storm raging far away under southern constellations extinguishing for a time the golden flame of canopus yes you must go in felix i ought not to have kept you out so long reluctantly she turned from the beach and they had proceeded but a few yards in the direction of the house when they met mrs andrews and her guest felix my son too late too late for you come in with me miss earl as you are so fond of the beach i hope you will show sir roger all its beauties i commit him to your care she went toward the house with her boy and as sir roger took edna's hand and bent forward looking eagerly into her face she saw a pained and startled expression cross his own miss earl did you receive a letter from me written immediately after the perusal of your book yes sir roger and your cordial congratulations and flattering opinion were i assure you exceedingly gratifying especially as you were among the first who found anything in it to praise you have no idea with what intense interest i have watched its reception at the hands of the press and i think the shallow flippant criticisms were almost as nauseous to me as they must have been to you your book has had a fierce struggle with these self-consecrated red-handed high priests of the literary yama but its success is now established and i bring you news of its advent in england where it has been republished you can well afford to exclaim with drayton we that calumnious critic may eschew that blasteth all things with his poisoned breath detracting what laboriously we do only with that which he but idly saith the numerous assaults made upon you reminded me constantly of the remarks of blackwood a year or two since formerly critics were as scarce and formidable and consequently as well known as mastiffs in a country parish but now no luckless traveller can show his face in a village without finding a whole pack yelping at his heels fortunately miss earl though they show their teeth and are evidently anxious to mangle they are not strong enough to do much harm have you answered any of these attacks 
no sir had i ever commenced filling the sieve of the deniades i should have time for nothing else if you will not regard me as exceedingly presumptuous and utterly ridiculous by the comparison i will add that with reference to unfavourable criticism i have followed the illustrious example of buffon who said when critics opened their batteries je n'ai jamais répondu à aucune critique et je garderai le même silence sur celle-ci but my dear miss earl i see that you have been accused of plagiarizing have you not refuted this statement again i find buffon's words rising to answer for me as they did for himself under similar circumstances il vaut mieux laisser ses mauvaises gens dans l'incertitude moreover sir i have no right to complain for it is necessary in well-regulated municipalities to have inspectors of all other commodities why not of books also i do not object to the rigid balancing i wish to pass for no more than i weigh but i do feel inclined to protest sometimes when i see myself denounced simply because the scales are too small to hold what is ambitiously piled upon them and my book is either thrown out pettishly or whittled and scraped down to fit the scales the storm sir roger was very severe at first nay it is not yet ended but i hope i believe i shall weather it safely if my literary bark had proved unworthy and sprung a leak and foundered it would only have shown that it did not deserve to live that it was better it should go down alone and early than when attempting to pilot others on the rough unknown sea of letters i cannot agree with you in thinking that critics are more abundant now than formerly more books are written and consequently more are tabooed but the history of literature proves that from the days of congreve critics to plays for the same end resort that surgeons wait on trials in a court for innocents condemned they've no respect provided they've a body to dissect after all it cannot be denied that some of the best portions of byron's and pope's writings were scourged out of them by the scorpion thongs of adverse criticism in the virulence of the zenian sturm waged by schiller and goethe against the army of critics who assaulted them attest the fact that even appreciative germany sometimes nods in her critical counsels certainly i have had my share of scourging for my critics have most religiously observed the warning of spare the rod and spoil the child and henceforth if my writings are not model well-behaved puritanical literary children my censors must be exonerated from all blame and i will give testimony in favour of the zeal and punctuality of these self-elected officials of the public whipping post the canons have not varied one iota for ages if authors merely reflect the ordinary normal aspect of society without melodramatic exaggeration or ludicrous caricature they are voted trite humdrum commonplace and live no longer than their contemporaries if they venture a step in advance and attempt to lead to lift up the masses or to elevate the standard of thought and extend its range they are scoffed at as pedants and die unhonoured prophets and just as the tomb is sealed above them people peer more closely into their books and whisper there is something here after all great men have been among us the next generation chants paeans and casts chaplets on the graves and so the world rings with the names of ghosts and fame pours generous libations to appease the manes of genius slaughtered on the altar of criticism once schiller said against public stupidity the gods themselves are powerless since then that same public lifted him to the pedestal of a demigod now all germany proudly claims him and who shall tell us where sleep his long forgotten critics such has been the history of the race since homer groped through fine-clad chios and poor dante was hunted from city to city if the great hierarchs of literature are sometimes stabbed while ministering at the shrine what, what can we humble acolytes expect but to be scourged entirely out of the temple we all get our dues at last for yonder among the stars astria laughs at man's valuations and shakes her infallible balance and reweighs us she had crossed her arms on the low stone wall that enclosed the lawn and bending forward the moon shone full on her face and her eyes and her thoughts went out to sea her companion stood watching her countenance and some strange expression there recalled to his mind that vivid description and then she raised her head and upward cast wild looks from homeless eyes whose liquid light gleamed out between the folds of blue black hair as gleam twin lakes between the purple peaks of deep parnassus at the mournful moon after a short silence sir roger said miss earl i can find no triumph written on your features and i doubt whether you realize how very proud your friends are of your success 
as yet sir it is not assured my next book will determine my status in literature and i have too much to accomplish i have achieved too little a two pause and look back and pat my own shoulder and cry eo triumph i am not so indifferent as you seem to imagine praise gratifies and censure pains me but i value both as mere gauges of my work indexing the amount of good i may or may not hope to effect i wish to be popular that is natural and surely pardonable but i desire it not as an end but as a means to an end usefulness to my fellow-creatures and whether crowned or crownless when i fall it matters not so as god's work is done i love my race i honour my race i believe that human nature sublimated by christianity is capable of attaining nobler heights than pagan philosophers and infidel seers ever dreamed of and because my heart yearns toward my fellow-creatures i want to clasp one hand in the warm throbbing palm of sinful humanity and with the other hold up the lamp that god gave me to carry through this world and so struggle onward heavenward with this generation of men and women i claim no clear uriel vision now and then i stumble and grope but at least i try to keep my little lamp trimmed and i am not so blind as some who reel and stagger in the marem of crime and fashionable vice as a pilgrim toiling through a world of sinful temptation and the night of time where the stars are often shrouded i cry to those beyond and above me hold how your lights that i may see my way and to those behind and below me brothers sisters come on come up while these steeps of human life are hard enough to climb when each shares his light and divides his neighbour's grievous burden god help us all to help one another mecca pilgrims stop in the valley of muna to stone the devil sometimes i fear that in the muna of life we only stone each other and martyr stephen last week i read a lecture on architecture and since then i find myself repeating one of the passages and therefore lastly and chiefly you must love the creatures to whom you minister you are fellow-men for if you do not love them not only will you be little interested in the passing events of life but in all your gazing at humanity you will be apt to be struck only by outside form and not by expression it is only kindness and tenderness which will ever enable you to see what beauty there is in the dark eyes that are sunk with weeping and in the paleness of those fixed faces which the earth's adversity has compassed about till they shine in their patience like dying watch-fires through twilight in some sort i think we are all mechanics moral architects designing as apprentices on the sands of time that which as master builders we shall surely erect on the jasper pavements of eternity so let us all heed the noble words she seemed talking rather to herself or to the surging sea where her eyes rested than to sir roger and as he noticed the passionless pallor of her face he sighed and put his hands on hers come walk with me on the beach and let me tell you why i came back to new york instead of sailing from canada as i once intended a half hour elapsed and mrs andrews who was sitting alone on the piazza saw the governess coming slowly up the walk as she ascended the steps the lady of the house exclaimed where is sir roger he is gone well my dear pardon me for anticipating you but as i happen to know all about the affair accept my congratulations you are the luckiest woman in america mrs andrews put her arm around edna's waist but something in the countenance astonished and disappointed her mrs andrews sir roger sails to-morrow for england he desired me to beg that you would excuse him for not coming to bid you good-bye sails to-morrow when does he return to america probably never edna earl you are an idiot you may have any amount of genius but certainly not one grain of common sense i have no patience with you i have set my heart on seeing you his wife but unfortunately for me i could not set my heart on him i am very sorry i wish we had never met for indeed i like sir roger but it is useless to discuss what is past and irremediable where are the children asleep i suppose after all show me a gifted woman a genius and i will show you a fool mrs andrews bit her lip and walked off and edna went upstairs to felix's room the boy was sitting by the open window watching grey clouds trailing across the moon chequering the face of the mighty deep now with shadow now with sheen so absorbed was he in his communing with the mysterious spirit of the sea that he did not notice the entrance of the governess until he felt her hand on his shoulder ah have you come at last edna i was wishing for you a little while ago for as i sat looking over the waves a pretty thought came into my mind and i want to tell you about it last week you remember we were reading about antony and cleopatra and just now while i was watching a large star yonder making a shining track across the sea a ragged hungry-looking cloud crept up and nibbled at the edge of the star and swallowed it and i call the cloud cleopatra swallowing her pearl 
edna looked wonderingly into the boy's bright eyes and drew his head to her shoulder my dear felix are you sure you never heard that same thought read or quoted it is beautiful but this is not the first time i have heard it think my dear little boy try to remember where you saw it written indeed edna i never saw it anywhere i am sure i never heard it either for it seemed quite new when it bounced into my head just now who else ever thought of it mr stanyan big an english poet whose writings are comparatively unknown in this country his works i have never seen but i read a review of them in an english book which contained many ex extracts and that pretty metaphor which you used just now was among them is that review in our library no i am sure it is not but you may have seen the lines quoted somewhere else edna i am very certain i never heard it before do you recollect how it is written in the englishman's poem if you can repeat it i shall know instantly because my memory is very good i think i can give you one stanza for i read it when i was in great sorrow and it made an impression upon me the clouds like grim black faces come and go one tall tree stretches up against the sky it lets the rain through like a trembling hand pressing thin fingers on a watery eye the moon came but shrank back like a young girl who has burst in upon funereal sadness one star came cleopatra like the night swallowed this one pearl in a fit of madness well felix you are a truthful boy and i can trust you i never heard the poetry before and i tell you edna the idea is just as much mine as it is mr biggs's i believe you such coincidences are rare and people are very loath to admit the possibility but that they do occasionally occur i have no doubt perhaps some day when you write a noble poem and become a shining light in literature you may tell this circumstance to the world and bid it beware how it idly throws the charge of plagiarism against the set teeth of earnest honest workers and i look at my twisted feet sometimes and i feel thankful that it is my body not my mind that is deformed if i am ever able to tell the world anything it will be how much i owe you for i trace all holy thoughts and pretty ideas to you and your music and your writings they sat there a while in silence watching heavy masses of cloud darken the sea and sky and then felix lifted his face from edna's shoulder and asked timidly did you send sir roger away he goes to europe to-morrow i believe poor sir roger i'm sorry for him i told mamma you never thought of him that you loved nothing but books and flowers and music how do you know that i have watched you and when he was with you i never saw that great shining light in your eyes or that strange moving of your lower lips that always shows me when you are really glad as you were that sunday when the music was so grand or that rainy morning when we saw the pictures of the two marys at the sepulchre i almost hated poor sir roger because i was afraid he might take you to england and then what would have become of me oh the world seems so different so beautiful so peaceful as long as i have you with me everybody praises you and is proud of you but nobody loves you as i do he took her hand passed it over his cheek and forehead and kissed it tenderly felix do you feel at all sleepy not at all tell me something more about the animalcula that caused the phosphorescence yonder making the top of each wave look like a fringe of fire it is true that they are little round things that look like jelly so small that it takes one hundred and seventy all in a row to make an inch and that a wine-glass can hold millions of them i do not feel well enough to-night to talk about animalcula i am afraid i shall have one of those terrible attacks i had last winter felix please don't go to bed for a while at least and if you hear me call come to me quickly i must write a letter before i sleep sit here will you till i come back for the first time in her life she shrank from the thought of suffering alone and felt the need of a human presence edna let me call mamma i saw this afternoon that you were not well no it may pass off and i want nobody about me but you only a narrow passage divided her room from his and leaving the door open she sat down before her desk to answer mr hammond's appeal as the night wore on the wind became a gale the fitful bluish glare of the lightning showed fearful ranks of ravenous waves scowling over each other's shoulders a roar as of universal thunder shook the shore and in the coral columned cathedral of the great deep wrathful ocean played a wild and weird fugue felix waited patiently listening amid the dead diapason of wind and wave for the voice of his governess but no sound came from the opposite room and at last alarmed by the ominous silence he took up his crutches and crossed the passage the muslin curtains blown from their riven fastenings streamed like signals of distress on the breath of the tempest and the lamplight flickered and leaped to the top of its glassy chimney on the desk lay two letters addressed respectively to mr hammond and mrs murray and beside them were scattered half a dozen notes from unknown correspondents asking for the autograph and photograph of the young author edna knelt on the floor hiding her face in the arms which were crossed on the lid of the desk the cripple came close to her 
and hesitated a moment then touched her lightly edna are you ill or are you only praying she lifted her head instantly and the blanched weary face reminded the boy of a picture of gethsemane which having once seen he could never recall without a shudder forgive me felix i forgot that you were waiting forgot that i asked you to sit up she rose took the thin little form in her arms and whispered i am sorry i kept you up so long the pain has passed away i think the danger is over now go back to your room and go to sleep as soon as possible good night my darling they kissed each other and separated but the fury of the tempest forbade all idea of sleep and thinking of the fisher folk exposed to its wrath governess and pupil committed them to him who calmed the galilean gale the sea was all a-boiling seething froth and god almighty's guns were going off and the land trembled End of chapter thirty 